Hello, Candy Matson. I understand you've been hired to find out who knocked off Donna Dunham. Abrupt and right to the point. That's my business, old man who talks like a ghost. Take care of your health, little lady. Donna Dunham is dead. Let her stay like that. You take care of your cues and I'll show my peas, understood? Not quite. Listen to this. <laughs> oh, goody, goody. Bullets now delivered by phone. Thanks for the slug. I'll have it identified later. Maybe you'll be identified later. Remember what I said, Candy Matson. Forget about Donna Dunham. <laughs> My name is Candy Matson. I like money, lots of it. That's why I became a private eye. And, too, you meet such interesting people. Mostly dead. But getting back to the cash angle, that's why I took on the Donna Dunham case. I knew it was full of dynamite. But a girl has to eat now and then, maintain a penthouse on Telegraph Hill, and keep the moths out of a few mink coats, doesn't she? Sure. And a shot fired into your room from across the street at three in the morning is just one of those occupational hazards. So I took the job and the 500 and went to work. Like to hear how the whole thing started? Yeah, leave us proceed to Act One. <laughs> I'd had a hard day at the office, sleeping all day, and I needed a bit of a tonic to pick me up. So the natural thing to do was to ground loop into the marigold room and see what could be done. As I sank down onto one of the padded stools, the dispenser approached. Uh, make it a martini, my good man, very dry. So dry it comes out like a blotter. Well, look, lady, nothing would give me more pleasure, but I can't serve you here unless you have an escort. What? Oh, I, I'm, I'm waiting for someone. That's what they all say. But he'll be here very soon. I know, I know. It never fails. Why, you low-minded crock. For two cents, I I'd see, not go... I your... arrived just in time. Save your two cents, my dear. Huh? You heard what the lady said? A martini. Uh, make it two. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, sure. I, I thought it was just another one of those... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, two martinis. Well, saved from a fate worse than death. Miss Matson. Who are you? A natural question. And I'd like a natural answer. Roberts is my name. Warren Roberts. Oh. I own a few steamships hither and yon about the world. Oh, yes, I know. I took a trip on one of your scows once. The food was a nightmare's nightmare. How do you think I came to be a millionaire? Ah, uh -huh. I see your point. How did you know my name and what do you want? I have a business proposition to make to you, Miss Matson. You're sure it's business, Mr. Roberts? Strictly business, Miss Matson. Call me Candy. You tell me the details and I'll tell you what it'll cost you. Fair enough. But don't think. You can always make it back on your food. Well, I can hardly tell you here. Uh, suppose we drop over to my place. But I want that martini. My man will make us a batch over there. Oh, the things I do to make a living... Okay, let's go. Hey, uh, how about these drinks? Uh, here you are, my man, and save the martinis for some poor wayward soul who hasn't the wherewithal to make the purchase. Oh, good evening, Mr. Roberts. I, I didn't know you were expecting company. Uh, so soon after... Take Miss Matson's things, Montgomery, and bring us some martinis. Uh, they're all made, sir. Good. Let's go into the drawing room, shall we? Mm -hmm. Modest little mousetrap, isn't it? And I'll bet it's had a good path beaten to its door, too. <laughs> Quite a sense of humor you have, Candy. <laughs> well, it helps now and then. Here, sit down here. That's it. I, uh, I can't quite see you. It's like being behind a retaining wall. Oh, well, I'll just listen. What's the topic of conversation? A young lady named... Donna Dunham. Aha, uh -huh, the female element. What is your connection? Much strictly that of a patron. Oh? 
Miss Dunham was a hat check girl over at the Scarlet Dawn. I heard her sing one night. I decided right then and there that I was going to sponsor her career. Was? Yes. Donna Dunham was murdered early this morning. By you? What? Are you out of your head? Yes, when I think of the fee I'm going to get from you. I uh, beg your pardon, sir. The martinis. What? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, put them down there, Montgomery. Here, yes, sir. Very good, Montgomery. I won't need anything else tonight. Thank you, sir. Good night, miss. Uh, good night. Uh, d- don't sleep too tight. May I? Mm, you certainly may. I've been waiting far too long for one of these. There you are. <clears throat> Well, as a sponsor, you didn't pick a protege with great lasting qualities, did you? No, I didn't. She was so young, so very lovely. Will you take the case, Miss Matson? What do I have to go on? Oh, very little. Well, my suspicions point to a musician who worked at the Scarlet Dawn. He seemed to resent very strongly my stepping into the picture. Were they going to get it? Off and on. Until I started to back Donna's career. A very interesting triangle. What do the police have to say? The police, Miss Matson, have not yet been notified. What? I went over there this morning and I discovered the body lying on the floor. I became confused. I, I locked the door and called the Scarlet Dawn. I told the manager that Miss Dunham was quite ill and wouldn't be able to appear tonight. Extremely ill, I'd say. Well, this is fine. You realize you're in trouble, don't you? Yes, I do. And that if I take this case, I'm sticking my neck out, too? Exactly. My uh, fee is 500. That's a fair price. In advance. Well, I'll make out a check immediately. Oh. Won't you have another martini? I, uh, I don't think so. You know, you are very beautiful. Ah, thank you. But I already have a sponsor. And your lips are very, very kissable. The best you can buy from Max Factor. Are you sure you don't want another martini? Look, Roberts, let's get this straight. You're in the middle of a jackpot. Make that check out right now so I can join you. Then it's up to me to spring the both of us. In the meantime, get that glint out of your eye. The one that's wired for wolf calls. Understood? Very well. I'll get started right away. Where does the late Miss Dunham live? Just on the edge of Chinatown, 27B Gresham Alley. It's the only three-flat house on the block. I'll find it. And you, you just stick right here and don't poke your face out of the door. Now, the, uh, check, if you will. Now, listen, you, if you think you're going to get... Well, send me back to the last line in the chorus, if it isn't old Hawkshaw himself. Yeah, that's right. Hiya, Candy. Now, how you ever got to be a police detective, I'll never know. I heard you trailing me for the last two blocks. Maybe I wanted you to hear me. What are you doing over in Chinatown, Candy? I like tomato chow yuck. Uh-huh. Something up? Not with you around, baby. Look, Candy, just a little word of caution. We're laying for you. Oh. The chief isn't very happy about you busting up that Newton case last month. Somebody had to. The score was still tied in the 27th inning. Stop gagging, Candy. What are you doing around here? You don't like tomato chow yuck that much. Well, maybe that oriental music sends me. By the way, where's the Scarlet Dawn, Mallard? Huh? Uh, right down there on the corner. Come on. I'll buy you a double Mickey. Uh, no, thanks. I just had one. And listen, Candy, take a tip. Don't interfere with the work of the police. Don't worry about me, Mary. And you take a tip, too. Next time you trail somebody, get yourself a pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> Yes, miss. You like a table? 
No, thanks. Uh, no. Something I can do? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes, I'm... I'm a friend of Donna Dunham. She wanted me to come over and tell you that she's feeling better. She'll be back at work tomorrow night. Well, that's good. Uh, business at the hot check stand, no good without her. Yeah. Yes, yes she's a great girl. By the way, I, I, I don't see her boyfriend tonight. Boyfriend? You know, the, the fellow who plays in the band. Oh, Donny Andrini. No, he got night off. Oh, too bad. She wanted me to tell him, too. Yep, too bad. Oh, maybe you'll find him at the Lotus Hotel. He lived there. Oh, sure. The Lotus. Yes, I'll check there, and thank you very much. Rembrandt Watson speaking. Yes, I know. Now, look. Photographs taken at reasonable prices. I know, Rembrandt. Family I, groups I... and portraits especially also... Uh... Rembrandt, this is I, Candy Matson. Fine colored pictures are... What? Candy Matson? That's right. By all the furies of Zeus. Why did you have to call just now? I was wooing the muse that only Bacchus can create. Probing the infinitesimal heights a soul can reach from the tear of the grape. And you have to call and spoil it all. Look, Rembrandt, uncross your eyes and listen to me. I shall listen, my lily, but undoubtedly I won't like it. What skullduggery are you up to now? I'm knee-deep in something that smells as high as the Oakland mud flat. A towering comparison. What is it? I can't tell you now, but I want you to do me a favor. Get your finest camera and go over to 27B Gresham Alley. Get inside and take all the pictures you can at the place. Won't I be intruding? No. There's a very attractive young lady there. Oh, delightful. She's dead. How do? I dislike intensely one-sided conversation. All right. What do I do then? Go back to your place and get me some prints as fast as you can. I go, but not willingly. Only for you would I forsake the mood I have achieved through prodigious application. Bully for you, laddie buck. I'll see you at your place in about an hour. <laughs> Are, are you the night clerk? I ain't sitting bull. Yes, we have no rooms. Uh, I'm not here for a room. Oh? Well, uh, maybe there's something I can do for you. Yes. Uh, could you tell me if Mr. Danny Andrini is in? No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen him all day. Uh, y yes, I know. Th there's a reason. We had to take him to the hospital this morning. What? Yes. He's, he's under observation for appendicitis. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So, I was wondering if you'd let me have his key. Huh? He wants me to bring in his portable radio. Oh, well, does he have one? Why, sir, did you ever know a musician who didn't own a portable radio? <laughs> I know, come to think of it. I... Yeah, yeah, here's the key. It's uh, room 418. Thank you. You're oh. very kind. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. All right, Candy Matson, start making like a private eye. Letters. Letters. Yes, over here. Promising. A whole pile of. Well, let's try this one. Dear Danny, I don't know how to start this, but your accusations last night need some sort of answering. I'm not in love with Warren Roberts and never will be. You just proven to be a very kind and gracious friend. You must realize that I have placed my singing career above everything else, and I want to... Well, leave us confront the issue, can you? Oh, hello, you. Hello. I was wondering if I could be of any assistance. Oh, no, it it seems Mr. Andrini was out of his head. Oh. I, I mean, he doesn't seem to have a portable radio. Oh. I'll, uh, I'll just be on my way. Oh, now, what's the rush? You don't have to leave right away. 
Wouldn't you like a drink or something? No, not right now. I, I am pressed for time. Oh. I tell you what, though. Huh? I'll be back later. How's that? Sure. Fine. When? Let's make it next Whitsuntide, huh? Goodbye. <laughs> On my soul, I'd like to have the popcorn concession here tonight. Come in, come in. Rembrandt, you're a double-crosser. I, a double-crosser? Yes. My dear, you're mistaken. Oh? The only time I double-crossed was out in the country. I passed over a bridge, then I had to double-cross back. Oh, no. I found I'd left my knapsack with some rare vintage in it on the other side. What are you doing here? You haven't had time to get the pictures I wanted. That's just the point. To elucidate, I arrived at 27B Gresham Alley and found it to be a most loathsome location. That's beside the point. What happened? I couldn't get in. Oh, Rembrandt, I, I, I've done you a grave injustice. Of course you couldn't get in. Warren Roberts has the key. Who's this minion Roberts? I'll tell you later. We've got to work fast. Mallard sniffed something in the wrong key and the police will be in on the deal before long. Mallard, the gumshoe? That's right. I've just got to get pictures of the layout so I can study them. In my own fumbling fashion, Candy, my love, I have given birth to an idea. Even from you, Rembrandt, I'll take it. I'm grabbing at straws. Straws. Very effective with tall, cool pollen. Never mind now. What's your idea? Let us hie ourselves to a locksmith. Present ourselves as man and wife, and a peasant will make us a key. Voila! Entree to the Madurese apartment. No, Rembrandt, that'll never work. Oh, wait a minute. Three flats to the house. I used to live in just that kind of a house out on Fulton Street when I was a kid. A nauseating thought. Rembrandt, those flats are identical. If we can get into the flat above, we can get what we want. I think I fathom your reasoning, Candy. In other words, the living room is just the same. That's right. The dining room, likewise. Check. And the same goes for the bedroom, the kitchen, and even the, uh... That's right, even in there. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go slumming in Gresham Alley. Go ahead, Rembrandt. Ring the bell. Always I must do the labor. Oh, poo. Uh, well, I hope we don't disturb the dead in the... Middle flat. You won't. From what I hear, she was done in sort of permanently. Oh, I fear there's no one at home. Come on, Candy. Let's return and see what Bacchus has to offer. No, wait. I thought I heard something. There, you see? Got all your flashbulbs? As they say in the old country, have I lost my marbles? Open the door. Beauty before age, my dear. Thank you, Randy. Hmm. Kind of dark in here. What a peculiar aroma. Definitely smacks of the far east. Yes. Something you folks wanted? Chalk up, Candy. It's your cue. Why, uh, yes. May we come up? What do you want? Well, we're with a magazine. The Ha House Lovely. We want to take a few photographs of your place. At this hour? The working press is never shackled by the hands on a clock, sir. Sounds phony to me, but come on up. What do you want to take pictures of this beat-up joint for? Well, you, you see, it, it's comparison. The old and the new. We've already taken pictures of a flat similar to this, only it's been remodeled. This is... Well, this is perfect for the contest. Mm. Uh, I guess it's all right. Go ahead. Uh, start with the hall, Rembrandt. Roger, my pretty. Let's see. This should be just about right. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, the bedroom. That should be off the hall here. Oh, yes. Uh, shoot from the door, Rembrandt. Can you get the entire room? Mm, not quite, but most of it. That'll do. Just a moment. Ah. Uh, there we are. You cats work fast. Uh, what was that? I said you work fast. Uh, yes. Now, in the bathroom, do you have a tub or a shower? Why, uh, 
Why don't you see for yourself? No. On second thought, I, I think that's about all we need. But Candy, you said that we Come could... along, Rembrandt. And uh, thank you very much. Well, Mr. that's Rembrandt. okay. And don't slam the door. The lady downstairs is sound asleep. Rembrandt, I think I've got this thing licked. Are you referring to this case or my desire to return to the arms of Bacchus? That I could never lick. I'm talking about the case. But I need help, Rembrandt. I am here. No. That's not enough. I need the big, strong arm of the law. Oh, no. Candy, you traitor. I hate to admit it, but I need somebody like Mallard. My being paid? Hmm? Oh, no. It's the wicked genie. Yikes, it's a gumshoe. Yeah. In person. Mallard, how did you get here? I took your advice and bought some tennis shoes. All right, Spill, what goes on? Been following you around till I'm punchy. Start talking, Candy. Okay, so you heard me. I do need your help, Mallard. Badly. There was a young girl murdered yesterday at 27B Gresham Alley. Is that the place you just came from? That's right. Why don't we ever hear of these things? Oh, I get exclusive rights. Anyway, I think I have the whole deal figured out. You can have full credit, Mallard, but you've got to take my advice. It hurts, but go ahead. Now, go back to 27C, Gresham Alley. That's the top flat. Mm -hmm. You'll find a character there named Danny Andrini. Uh, Take him. Then get out to 5711 Pacific Street as fast as you can. Uh, all right, I'll do it. But, Candy, so help me, if this is a foul-up on you, the new look with stripes is going to be very fashionable. She knows what she's doing, Mallard. When you get back to Gresham Alley, just tell Mr. Andrini that you're from House Lovely. He'll adore you. This is it, Rembrandt. I just hope my man Montgomery hasn't retired as yet. What are we doing out here on Pacific, Candy? This is out of our league. All of a sudden, I've become socially conscious. Come on, Montgomery, enter the door. Ah, right on cue. I beg your pardon. Did you ring? Uh, no, Montgomery. We, we crossed the moat and used a battering ram. I'm sorry, young lady. Mr. Roberts doesn't wish to be disturbed. Look, Montgomery, remember me? I was here earlier this evening. Mr. Roberts and I had a martini together. Martinis? Well, it was worth a safari out here after all. Uh-uh. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, miss. I didn't recognize you at first. Yes, do come in, won't you? And the light dawned. If you'll just wait in the drawing room, miss, I'll inform Mr. Roberts of your presence. Thank you very much, Montgomery. I used to know a chap like that in the British Army. By continual groveling and studied abjectedness, he worked his way up to the rank of a private. <laughs> Thanks, Rembrandt. That's the first laugh I've had tonight. What's the pitch, Candy? I don't get it. You will in a minute. You hear the patter of little feet. Miss Matson, what's the idea? I thought you were going to check with me by phone. Mr. Roberts, this thing is bigger than either of us. I just couldn't wait. <clears throat> uh, is there a martini in the house? I'll have Montgomery serve in just a moment. I don't think there will be time, Mr. Roberts. Well, where is she? Upstairs. You really loved her, didn't you? Madly. That just about describes it, madly. And while you were, uh, shall we say, sponsoring her career, you thought she was playing around with Danny Andrini as well. Yes, she was. You're wrong, Robert. I have a letter from Donna Dunham to Danny Andrini. In effect, she told him to blow, skedaddle, vamoose. What? That's right. So it seems we have a slight piece of mistaken murder on our hands, doesn't it? Yes. On one hand. On the other, I have two in mind that will be deliberate. You asked for it, Miss Matson. Too bad you had to bring your friend along. I wouldn't if I were you, Robert. A writer has a pistol. I thought you said he served martinis. This isn't exactly a social moment. I know how you privatize work, your lone wolves. You confide in no one. 
So with a pull of the finger, I erase all evidence. Just like this. He's dead. Oh, I'm really grateful to you, but where on earth did you come from? Like I say, Candy, you just can't beat these tennis shoes. Well, that fills everything up except for one thing. Where do we go now for the martinis? And that's how it happens. My phone rings and I'm into the darndest message you ever heard of. Sure, Roberts killed her. He was jealous. And I knew I was on the right track when Rembrandt said the apartment above Donna Dunham's smelled like the Far East. It was tobacco odor, the same Turkish aroma I had smelled in Robert's home out on Pacific Street. Danny Andrews? Well, he was waiting for Roberts to return. He was going to kill him. He knew that Roberts had rented the flat above Dunham for the sponsoring purposes. Donna was a nice kid. She was just caught in the middle, flat. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Do you have a little unsolved murder in your home? Got some blackmail you want to unload? Are you the victim of some vulgar extortionist? I know a girl you should meet. She may not be the greatest private eye in the world, so what if it does cost you three or four hundred dollars? She sure is sweet. She's Candy Matson. Like to meet her? Hello. Candy Matson. Well, I wasn't sure when I looked in the mirror this morning. Had a rough night, eh? Oh, there have been rougher ones. Look, voice, before you get caught with my receiver down, who are you and what do you want? As to who I am, you'll find out very shortly. What I want is you. How romantic and over the phone yet. Let me finish. What I want is you to lay off that cable car business. Oh, that. Well, I'm afraid I can't. You see, I was sitting beside him when they discovered his transfer had been punched sort of permanently. That's how things happen with me. I get into the craziest routines. You see, I used to be a model. I've been told I have the proper displacement for such a career. But I found there wasn't enough money in it. A girl has to maintain a nice apartment on Telegraph Hill, keep enough clothes to highlight the uh, displacement I mentioned, and also eat, doesn't she? Sure. So I turn private eye. You meet a better class of people, mostly named Rigger or Mortis. Now take this cable car deal. It's positively fantastic. But after all, this is radio, isn't it? Like to hear how the whole thing happened? Leave us trip along to Act One. I wanted to get downtown that morning, but I couldn't take the F car on Stockton. They were ripping up about 87 streets, which is par for the course. So I walked down Telegraph Hill and up to Mason. That's where the Bay and Powell cable car stops. All aboard! Come on, Lana, show that shapely ankle. We gotta make the Fairmont by Whitsuntide. The car was loaded, and so was the character next to me. I tried to budge into the seat between him and a fisherman's wharf dowager, but I couldn't quite make it. I'd forgotten my shoehorn. Say, pardon me, but would you mind reading your Wall Street Journal over that away a bit? I'd like to sit in here. Oh, if you insist. A knight of old. He budged his hips a quarter of an inch, and I slipped in, ready for my rocket ride over the hill and down into town. The trip, as usual, was uneventful. Three smashed fenders and several choice words I'd never heard before, but I wrote them down. By the time our prairie schooner reached the turntable at Market Street, the crowd on the car had thinned out. But uh, 
Buster was still beside me, his head buried in common and preferred. Mark it straight. I started to get down. Hey, lady, take your boyfriend with you. We're heading back up the hill. Boyfriend? I'll sue. He looks like the advance man for Lewis and Clark. How do you like that? He fell asleep over his stocks and bonds. I looked again. Hipsy wasn't asleep. <laughs> Hipsy was stone cold dead on market. <laughs> What a twist. I, who always went on the prowl for a whodunit, get one literally tossed into my lap. He just hadn't gone out of this world serene-like. Oh, no. There was a steady slurp, slurp of blood trickling down his vest just north by northeast of the equator. After a half-hour wait full of questioning by homicide leg men, I knew my morning shopping tour was rained out. And after all, I was only going to buy an emerald clip to match the glint in my eye. Well, that would have to wait. I knew the next step. I grabbed a cab home. I wasn't long in waiting. Right on cue. And if it was the right cue, it would be Lieutenant Ray Mallard from headquarters, daintily pressing his cuticles against my apartment buzzer. I was right. What? I've been expecting you. Come on in, Mallard. You've been expecting me. Why, Candy? Naive little rover boy, you. Have a drink? No, no, I'm not in the mood. Uh, just make it a double... Sit down, Mallard. Let's be civilized. Take off your hat. It is off. Oh? <laughs> Candy, for once I'm puzzled. You're just saying that. Yeah, because it's true. I've checked and rechecked. No matter how many loose ends I tie together, I still get no connection between you and Dwight Ellsworth. Dwight Whosworth? Ellsworth. Your extremely limp traveling companion on the cable this morning? Mallard, I can give you an angle on that. Yeah? Yeah. The angle being that I didn't know him from Adam. Level? Straight. Oh, look, honeypot, this mediocre dialogue is getting us nowhere. What did you haul your size 11s in here for? Oh, frankly, I don't know. Uh, here, fill it up, will you? Well, you're not just going around in circles, Mallard. You're going around in doubles. Yeah, yeah. Like I've said before, Candy, you've got a pretty view from here. Oh? Wait till I turn around. I mean from your window. Look at that ship down there, just docking. Hmm? Where? Down there. There's oh. romance for you. Probably just in from the Far East. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. You know, it is sort of romantic. Don't you think it'd be fun to jump on a tramp like that and whisk off to the South Seas? Mm hmm? On a honeymoon? No. That's what I thought. South Seas. Mallard. Don't call me Mallard. Why not? We're just playing for ducks, aren't we? Oh, very crisp. Playing for ducks. No, Candy, we aren't. Not in this case. We got a dead man in our hands, Rudy Toot Toot, shot right through the heart. And you were sitting next to him. Sure, sure. Go on, now get out of here. What? You heard me. Lift your hindquarters and get back to headquarters. Candy, I don't like that look. You've got something on your mind. Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't recognize it if I told you about it. Uh, one word of warning. Don't dabble. You're in deep enough. Got it? Got it. Here's your hat. Grab it. So long, Mallard. See you around a jailhouse sometime. <laughs> I fool fum. Twas then I smelled a big fat fee. That great, big, kind of attractive mallard. He missed the boat. Oh, he saw it, but he missed it. It was that ship he saw docking. That was the first time I came out of the dark since my Tunerville ride down the hill in the morning. I needed help. So I called an old friend of mine, if you can call that help. Rembrandt Watson was his name. He was a photographer and other things. He spent most of his life in the dark room dabbling with bottles. His negatives and prints were sharp. His thought processes, not quite. But he'd given me assistance in the past, so I called him. Rembrandt Watson speaking. Photography, portraits, and camera work. Yes, Rembrandt, I know. Also oh. available for gardening, janitorial service, and babysitting. Rembrandt, it's candy. Especially at the over 21. Who? Candy? Now you're tuned in. Oh, dare you, baggage. I was experimenting with a new type of formula. Ninety proof for a hundred. A hundred. And candy, it works beautifully. There's a delightful little pixie in a pink ballet skirt in my living room. Well, leave her there and get over here immediately to my place. Take a cab. I'll pay for I'd it. I'd much rather have a handsome carriage with a brace of chestnuts. You've got them in your head. Now just do as I say and get over here. <laughs> Float in, Rembrandt. Gadfrix. 
Where's the man to take me cloak, gloves, and topper? You're wearing a sport coat and slacks, and you know I have no man. And therein lies your basic trouble, my dear. You have no man. Now, Rembrandt. Every man should have a woman. Every woman should have a man. It's the incontrovertible law of the universe. Candy, you should have a man. You? Sure. I'm no longer a man. I'm Sprite, transcending the world Well, and... stop transcending a moment and come down to Earth. We've got a job to do. How poetic. How idyllic. We've got a job to do. Uh, for money? Eventually. Oh, one of those... Very well, my dear. Bring me up to date. Well, I, I don't really know if I can or not. Good. And I shall leave and return to me formula. Oh, no. What I mean is the whole story is so fantastic you'd never believe it. I might. Try me, Candy. Well, I get on a cable car and sit next to a character reading the Wall Street Journal. A strange coupling. A cable car and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. And when we get to the end of the line, my friend next to me is dead. Probably the ride down the hill frightened him to death. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He looked like a used punch board. He had a neat little bullet hole through his heart. Candy, my little ballerina friend in the pink skirt is more believable than what you just told me. I told you it was fantastic, but none of how it happened. Now, sooner or later, Mallard is going to come out of his fog. And when he does, I'm going to be out of a fee. A fee that so far doesn't exist, my pretty. It will, if my hunch is right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Go down to the Chronicle and get all the back files you can on Southern Island Steamship Company. The Chronicle? A pleasure. I have a few questionable companions there who indulge in formulas. Stay away from those companions and just do as I ask. Very well, my dove. I go, but entirely against my will. And where will you be? Around town, Rembrandt. I've got to do some legwork. Let me assure you, Candy. You have just the right equipment for it, too. What a joint. I'll bet they mount slit gullets on the walls instead of deer heads. Well, come on, Candy. Get your tools out and screw up your courage. Yeah, miss, what'll it be? Uh, nothing right at the moment except information. Information, water, both free. What do you want to know? Well, I'm, I'm looking for the purser off the of Dwight Sonia. I hear he does his shore duty in here. Uh, that's right. Name Campbell. That head on the table over there belongs to him. Mm, thanks. Hello, sailor. Hey, Campbell. Wake up. Mm. Oh, leave me alone. Come on, snap out of it. Uh, who are you? What do you want? My name is Candy Matson. I want to ask a question. No, I'm only drinking. Go away. Not until I find out what I want to know. Dwight Ellsworth was murdered this morning. What? I thought that would bring you to. Uh, well, that's the nicest news I've heard since VJ Day. What do you want to know? Where did his brother live? That stooge. He's got about as much spine as a water eel. Never mind. I want to find him. He seems to keep his whereabouts as secret as an atomic stockpile. Uh, the whole family ought to be knocked off. Uh, he lives out in Seacliff, 25 Dashell Road. Good. A bartender, buy my friend a little reward. And one for yourself, too. <laughs> Well, so far, so good. Oh, how did I know about Campbell the purser? Well, you see, I have quite a few friends, most of whom my pal Mallard doesn't approve. So I grabbed the cab and navigated the driver out towards Seacliff. It was so foggy I couldn't see the meter. But I paid him anyway, gave him a neutral tip and dismissed him. There it was, 25 Dashell Road. An austere-looking cabana. One that dared you to ring the front doorbell. I dared. I had the awful feeling I should have been around at the side door delivering hand laundry. Good evening. Well, except for the fog, yes. Uh, is Mr. Ellsworth in? Yes, he is. But I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. There has been a death in the family. I know. That's why I'm here. Come in, please. Thank you. Walk this way, please. Oh, I'm afraid I, I couldn't. Even if I live to be a hundred. Mind your tongue, young lady. You're in the house of an Ellsworth. Oh, hoity-toity. The old babe had delusions of grandeur. 
Well, no need to get uppity with me. I've mingled with royalty. I once played a bit part in a Rita Hayworth picture. But this old gal was really something. She couldn't have been more than 45, yet looked like something out of the Barretts of Wimpole Street. She ushered me into a large ceiling living room, and there on the divan was my boy. His head lowered into his hands and quite obviously touched. Quite obviously. Roger, this young lady is here to see you. I don't believe you mentioned your name. Uh, Candy Matson. Uh, Matson, You in shipping, too? Mm, of a sort. Oh, uh, this is my wife, Miss Matson. You'll pardon me if I don't seem hospitable, but my brother was murdered this morning. I know. I was sitting next to him when it happened. You were? Don't talk to her, Roger. I don't trust her. This whole thing is a threat of some kind. No, it's not a threat. It's a business proposition. I'll come right to the point. You see, I'm a private detective. Oh, one of those persons. Put your nose back down, Mrs. Ellsworth. I want to get the show on the road. Yes, I'm a private detective, and I'm in a spot, too. The police think I'm connected with the case in some way, so I'm here for a double purpose. I'm listening, Miss Madison. Roger, I forbid you to speak with this, this woman. Too late, Mrs. Ellsworth. Now, this is it. I'm in this business to make money. Give me a check now for $300, and I'll find out who killed your brother. And I'll also clear myself. Roger, I'm warning you. Naturally, you want to see the killer of your brother brought to justice, don't you, Mr. Ellsworth? Don't you? I... Yes. Yes. Here, I'll make a check out right now. Thank you. Just make it out to Candy Matson. Payable today. The lovely collection of guns you have, Mr. Ellsworth. You hunt much? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. My wife and I are quite fond of shooting. Uh, she's an excellent shot. Ah, there you are. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you sometime tomorrow. Mr. Reed didn't say a word. She just stood there against the fireplace and shot sparks through me. After I waved the check in the air a few times to dry the ink, she showed me to the door. Very clever, aren't you? Taking advantage of a weak-willed man. I wonder who made him that way. Don't cash that check. I mean it. Don't cash that check. Mrs. Ellsworth, $300. I need the money, badly. I need some new rolls for my player piano. I buzzed back downtown. I wanted to cash that check in a hurry. I knew of only one person who would give me the crisp green at that hour of the night. Uncle Charlie, the honest miller who ran the chase room. Uncle Charlie, in the strict sense of the word, was a gentleman. So with a tender little pat on my cheek, he cashed the check and I went up Telegraph Hill and home. All of a sudden, my eyes did a couple of inverted loops. All my lights were on. Who's in here? All right, speak up. Oh, Candy, the light of my oh. life. Come join our party. Oh, Rembrandt, you gave me a scare. You don't scare easy what? either, Candy. Got something on your mind? And Mallard. Well, how ducky, a midnight soiree. What goes on here? Well, that chicken you had in the icebox is delicious. Was delicious. Looks like you've done everything but eat the bones. Your vintage is superb, too, Candy. Have a little formula? No. Now, now come on, what gives? That's my line, Candy. What gives? You're in on something, and I want to know about it. Oh, Mallard, believe me, it, it's nothing. I, I'm, I'm just trying to parley a couple of hunches. Tall hunches. Look at all those clippings on the South Sea Island Steamship Company. What are they for? I meant to tell you, Candy, I had remarkable success down at the Chronicle. There's everything you want on that steamship line. Now, oh, Rembrandt, did you have to tell the whole world? Candy, you chide me unnecessarily. I merely had the clippings on the table when Hawkshaw here walks in on me. Okay, Candy, take it from there. I can't tell you yet, Mallard. Nothing makes sense yet. I, I've got about four loose ends that need tying off. I'd only put two men to following you. I'd save myself a lot of grief. Two days, that's all, Mallard. Just give me two days. I think I'll have it for you. All right. But don't forget, the boys down at Kearney Street headquarters don't love you the way I do. Two days. No more or less. I gotta go. Thanks for the foul, chicken. Ah, very gay. Here, Rembrandt, here's $50 for you. Fifty? My word. What's all this talk about a recession? Go on and take it. Go someplace and stabilize the economy. <laughs> I whipped through the old newspaper clipping. It was all there. Fire at sea on Ellsworth's ship. 
two seamen lost off Ellsworth's ship near Honolulu. South Sea Island line ship loses rudder in storm. On and on it went over a period of three years. I threw the papers back on the table. Helped myself to some of Rembrandt's formula. Turned down the lights and went out on the porch. The day was dark except for an occasional path of light from a passing freighter. I sat down to think and think. Then... Click, click, just like that. Two little tumblers in my mind fell into place. Only one thing to do, and that was to do it the hard way. The next morning, just as the ferry building siren was announcing 8 o'clock to downtown San Francisco, I got Rembrandt on the phone. Candy, what on earth are you calling me for at this hour? Can't help it. There's work to be done. I did my work last night so extremely well that I'm just going to bed now. Sorry, you'll just have to delay your sack time. Meet me at the corner of Mason and Union in ten minutes. Right where the cable car stops. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to take a cable car ride. What? One of those bouncing, jerky little contraptions? Not the way I feel this morning. Oh, yes, you are. Union and Mason in ten minutes. All right, Rembrandt, get on. This is the silliest thing you've ever done, Candy. Maybe. We'll see. Dwight Ellsworth was already on the car when I got on here, and alive. How could you tell? He mumbled something when I asked him to move over. Sounds logical, although I once remember stumbling into a corpse who mumbled for hours after it had been liquidated. Mm, Rembrandt was in one of his rambling moods, so I let him alone. The car pulled over Mason Street, down Washington, and then swung on to Powell and up the hill. Now I watched the buildings and apartments carefully. There was a little red brick building, now a big apartment house a woman's residence club, and so on. Then over the hill, more apartments, and the possibilities petered out at Bush. Well, only one thing to do. Canvas all those blocks between Washington and Bush. Okay, Rembrandt, off the car. The strangest corpse I ever did see. Uh, what'd you say, Candy? Off the car, come on. Now what? I just want to get to bed. Well, not for a long time, Boy Blue. Now, here's the pitch. You take this building, and I'll take the next. We'll alternate as we go along. Ask if a tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria ever lived around here. Oh, Candy. I know it sounds wild, but it's got to be done. A horse with a tall face and dressed something like... Oh, Rembrandt, look at me. Get that smoke out of your brain. A tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria. You got it? Got it. Okay, get going. It was slow and tiresome. And the answers I got. A tall gal dressed like Queen Victoria. Oh, sister. That was about par. Nope, nobody like that ever lived here. Are you positive? A dame who fits that description? Yeah, I'm positive. The morning wore on and so did we. We were over on the other side of California Street now, so we stopped and had a bite to eat. I had pickles with mine and Rembrandt had olives on toothpicks in a glass. And again, we picked up the hunt. My heart was suddenly making with a rumba. There, just on the other side of clay, in front of a three-story red brick house, was a police squad car. There was a little knot of people gathered around. Daintily lifting my crinoline, I did a Mel Patton down the block and up the front steps. I didn't have any trouble finding the room. The door was wide open, and there was a body on the floor. Four representatives of the law were buzzing back and forth. One of the buzzees was Mallard. Well... My little ambassador of violence. Why is it you're always around the extremely dead, Candy? I've got no time to brandy the ad libs, Mallard. Who is it? I don't know yet. No identification. Let me see. (laughs) Ah, a pen pal, maybe. I was right. I knew it. Knew it? Knew what? You're right. He was a pen pal. He wrote me a check last night for $300. His name is Roger Ellsworth. Very interesting. Must be open season on Ellsworth. Okay, Candy, time you filled in in the blanks. Start. Wait a minute. I want to look at the window over here. Mm hmm. Mallard, there are a couple of younger Ellsworths living around town here. I'm sure you'd like to see them stay healthy. Yeah? Get out to 25 Dasher Road and pick up an old crone also named Ellsworth. Five will get you 20. She's the one you're after. Uh, all right. But you get back to your place and stay put, understand? I want to have a more illuminating chat with you. 
Oh, Mallard, I'm, I'm just like putty in your hands. The moon was coming up over Diablo and spraying a path of silver on the bay. Still no Mallard. I wondered what could be wrong. Well, this was it. This was the showdown. Have you seen a tall face with a horsey woman? Oh, Rembrandt. Candy, I'm so mad at you, I could... Oh, what's the use? Now what's the matter? What's the matter, she says. I've been roving all over Powell Street, ringing doorbells. Where did you go, you traitor? Oh, Rembrandt, I'm sorry. In, in the excitement, I forgot all about you. What excitement? There's been another murder. In a moment, there's going to be another. I'm looking right at you, Candy. Oh, cool off. Have some formula and stop snorting steam. <gasps> what was that? Your window, Candy. It just shattered. What? Oh, wait a minute. That window didn't shatter by itself. Quick, get the lights, Rembrandt. Now duck down here. What sort of a silly game are we playing now? This isn't a game, believe me. Candy! Candy, are you all right? Yikes, it's the gumshoe. Yes, I'm all right. Where are you, Mallard? Over here. Two houses over. We've got your girlfriend trapped on the roof next to you. Don't move and stay covered. Okay. All right, Mrs. Ellsworth. Are you coming down peacefully or do we have to play cops and robbers? I'm not coming down until I get that candy match. She did it. She forced me to kill my own brother-in-law. Have it your own way. Okay, loosen her up a bit, boys. Better than the Fourth of July. Keep your head down, Rembrandt. Oh, is that what was up? Ready to come down, Mrs. Ellsworth? No, I'm not. That hateful woman. She's ruined my whole life. All my plans. Just because of her snooping and prying. She's going to die, I tell you. It was a miracle, Candy. You must have moved slightly just as she shot at you. Oh, well, it was too close, I can tell you. She's dead? Oh, decidedly. I think she was dead before she hit the ground. That one shot got her. We went out to her house, and she was just driving off when we got there. We trailed her up to North Beach, lost her for a block, and then spotted her car at the top of the hill here. We arrived just as she was getting on the roof next door. Okay, now you tell me your little dream. Well, it was that ship docking that set my wheels going around. The name Ellsworth started burning in back somewhere. Mm -hmm. You saw the clippings we dug up. Yeah. The South Sea Island steamship lines were slowly being sabotaged. I did some checking, and I, I found that the insurance companies weren't going to renew. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't tie that in sooner. Oh, it's just that you have too many things on your mind, Ma Mallard, dear. <laughs> I went out to the place on Dashiell Road, and when I left, I was pretty sure the old girl had knocked off her brother-in-law. Why? Well, for several reasons. One, she was a venomous old witch. Two, you've never seen such a collection of guns in all your life. And her husband admitted she was a darn good shot. I also saw one little pot gun that was very interesting. It had a silencer on it. Uh-huh. That was the one she used on you tonight. And also the one she used on Dwight Ellsworth from the window of that apartment where you found her husband. How do you know? Go back there. You'll see a nice little bullet hole in the curtain with burned powder all around it. Now, don't tell me that... Yes, I'm telling you that she rented that place knowing that her brother-in-law always went downtown on a certain cable car. She waited that morning until we were riding by, and she plugged him. I have now heard everything. And the reason? Dwight Ellsworth, rather than fighting the insurance companies, had decided to sell his steamship line. But the old gal thought she'd beat him to the punch by knocking him off. The steamship company would then fall into her husband's hands. Yeah. What about her husband? Well, after he gave me the check and I left, they evidently had a fearful row and she spilled the beans. Somehow she lured him down to that place on Powell and gave him some lead poisoning, too. And that's all there is to it. Candy, I wish you'd have told me all these things earlier. We might have been able to save the life of Roger Ellsworth. No, it wouldn't do any good. Because if she hadn't killed him, I was going to. What? Mm-hmm. While I was waiting for you to get here, the phone rang. It was Uncle Charlie, the honest miller. That no good Roger Ellsworth. His check bounced like a brand new golf ball. <laughs> What's so funny, Mallard? Listen in again to the further adventures of Candy Matson. 
girl sucker. Well, that's the way it goes. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. In this case, nobody did. Except Rembrandt. He'd stocked his dark room with $50 worth of formula. And not the kind you use on negatives, either. Let's see. Murder on a cable car. Dwight and Roger Ellsworth done in as well as the old gal. One check that bounced. It really does sound fantastic, doesn't it? But I told you this was radio, didn't I? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I did come out ahead at that. On the way out, Mallard leaned on and kissed me. The first time it ever happened. You know, at times, it, it's kind of fun to be in the arms of the law. Listen again next week at the same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Helen Cleave, Jack K. Hill, and Harry Bechtel, Jack Thomas as Rembrandt, and Henry Leff as Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> Got an old corpse kicking around you want identified? Know of any good murders you want solved? We've got just the girl for you. Her name is Candy Matson. Mighty cute, too. She fills out a size 12 suit to just the right proportions. Soft blonde hair, two sparkling blue eyes, and all in all, she looks as though she might have stepped right off a Varga calendar. And what's more, she's a private eye. You scoff? You ridicule? I'll let you see for yourselves. Listen. She's talking on the phone right now. Hello, Candy Matson. Hello, Miss Matson. I'm afraid you don't know me. That makes it even. You don't know me. Let's go from there. I've read about you in the papers, Miss Matson. You handle confidential cases. That's right. However, there's a little matter of a fee involved. Yes, yes, I know. I can pay. That's item number one. Now to item number two. What's the confidential case? I can't possibly tell you on the phone, Miss Matson. I said it was confidential. Mm, okay. Where do you want to talk? I am the proprietor of a restaurant, the Charlemagne in North Beach. Oh, yeah. I ate there once. Oh, that's nice. No, it wasn't. I didn't like the food. Oh. However, I'll overlook it. Do you want to talk in about an hour? That will be fine, Miss Matson. Good. And your name would be... Martinello. Carlo Martinello. Okay, Mr. Martinello. And uh, have some ink in your pen. It costs money just to talk. <laughs> I probably sounded rough and commercial, but you have to be in this racket. Most people look in a private eye as a musician. They invite you to a party and expect you to bring your harp for free. But uh uh-uh. I learned the hard way a long time ago. So now they pay in advance and take their chances later. That's the way it was with this Martinello. I was at home in my penthouse on Telegraph Hill out on the porch taking a sun bath. And the phone rings and it's this Carlo character. That part was all right because I can always use new customers. But what made me mad was the fact that I had to stop listening to the 49ers belt the bejabers out of the Cleveland Browns at Kezar Stadium. But I followed through and uncovered a couple of very done-in bodies along the way. Do you like the grotesque in your whodunits? Then follow me and we'll tiptoe lightly through the tibbets, the ponds, and the baccalonies. Because part of the story unfolds at the opera house. Reluctantly, I dressed into something Charlemagne-ish turned off the 49ers Cleveland game and went down to talk to Martinello. His place was typical, located on Powell Street, a garish neon sign, and as you walked in, the air place was air-conditioned by Eau de Garlic. Yes, miss. You wish a table? I wish a table, yes. With the right party, I'm looking for the owner. I am the owner. I am Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson. Walk this way, please. If I could walk that way, I'd revive Vaudeville. Pardon? Uh, where is your office? Right over here. Allow me. After you, signorina. Thank you, senor. Here, sit down, please. Thanks. 
Now, Martinello, what's on your mind? Always, all my life, I have run a very nice, respectable place. Mm -hmm. Until this morning. What's with this morning? I go down to the basement. My icebox is down there. That is where I keep all my meat. So, you wanted some ground round. Oh, no, no. I... Perhaps I'd better show you. Please, you will come with me. Martinello led the way out of his office and down a flight of stairs. A cold blast hit my face. A musty aroma smothered my nostrils, and if I had had a phobia about darkness, I'd have ducked out then. But I followed the guy, and we ended up in front of a refrigerator about the size of an inquisition chamber. He opened the door, and it was the usual restaurant icebox. Choice legs of lamb hanging from hooks, potential fillets, and thick New York cuts. The box was cold, and I started to shiver. Not from the refrigeration, though, because over in the corner was a man. He looked like something out of a long-lost Arctic expedition. He had a long, flowing mustache, every bristle of which was coated with ice. He was quite frozen and quite dead. I slammed the door shut and reeled out. The sight had staggered my thought processes. Martinello reached over by a salami slicing table and turned on a Mazda, a weak affair that cast dim shadows about the damp basement. Is that your little surprise? Yes, Mr. Matson. That is what I was greeted with this morning. Have you notified the police? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? As I told you, I have run a very respectable place. And, too, that is why I am hiring you. You can get in trouble, you know. Yes, yes, that is why you must help me. Please, please, Miss Madsen, say you will help me. I will pay you anything you say. <sighs> I stick my neck out in the strangest places. Now it's a refrigerator. Okay, Martinello, $2,000. What? Make up your mind. Either I freeze your assets or the police find your frozen friend. Yes. All right. Come. I give you the money now. Now we're getting somewhere. What about him? Oh, he'll keep. He's on ice. Well, this was one for the books. Refrigeration the ugly way. I had to ask a few questions if I was to get anywhere, such as like, do you know the guy? No. Had you ever seen him before? No. Who was the last one to close the icebox last night? I was. Does it lock from the inside? Unfortunately, yes. I was getting places like Wiley was with Hauser. It was inevitable. I had to take my courage in my hand and go down and look at that thing again. There it was. A male Mona Lisa etched in ice. This time I looked closer. I had to. And as I did, I realized I wasn't going to get any identification because this guy was a study in crimson. Underneath all that coating of ice, he was dressed in a devil's costume. I slammed the door once again and went upstairs. There I gave Martinello strict orders not to do a thing. Usually in cases like this, you have to wait for a break. They come along like a forcing hand in poker. So I went home to do some thinking. As I arrived, there was an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Hello, Dove. I'd almost given up. Rembrandt, how did you get in? Your door was open, dear. I took the liberty of coming in. Oh, sure, that's okay. How are things, Candy? All right, I guess. I'm kind of bush, though. I feel about as devaluated as a British pound. You look wonderful, Dove. What's wrong? I've got a deal, but I don't know where to start. Anything I can help you with? No, thanks, Rembrandt. If I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. I've never doubted you in the past, dear. I know. Well, I was just called in by a minestrone merchant in North Beach. The guy is stuck with a corpse. That's about par for the course. The deceased had been sealed in the icebox overnight. I've never seen one like that before. That's the way it is, dear. Many are called, but few are frozen. Oh, get out of here. But, Dove, I just got here. I know, but I've got to change and get down to see Mallard. I'll wait for you, Candy. I haven't seen the gumshoe since before me vacation. All right. I'll be with you in a few moments. I did a fast change, and Rembrandt and I climbed into my car, and we dropped off Telegraph Hill on Don Kearney Street. The Hall of Justice, where Mallard hangs his star, is only a few blocks away, so we made it in about five minutes. Inspector Ray Mallard, homicide, San Francisco police. A lovable, shaggy dog type of character. Very keen with the crime, but dumb with the dame. 
me, for instance. If I want him to say yes, he says no, and vice versa. Well, my ever-loving candy. What's new in the private eye business? Very little. How's the legitimate flatfoot racket? Oh, we're holding our arches up. Well, and Rembrandt, I haven't seen you since Pup was a Hector. Please, Inspector, you're metting your mixapause. Who writes this dialogue? I'm pretty weak, I know. What's on your mind, Candy? A character named Carlo Martinello. Have you got anything on him? <laughs> What's so funny, Mallory? <laughs> nothing, except I eat lunch there about every day of the week. Well, answer my question. Well, there's nothing on Martinello. Arrested a couple of times during Prohibition. He was dabbling in grappa a lot under the table. Have you got a case against the guy, Detective Matson? Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. Why do you want to check on the guy, Candy? No reason. Just thought I'd ask. Uh-huh. Well, Martinello's okay. Just trying to make a living. Only thing I don't like, he loves to sing to his customers. <laughs> That'd be enough to bankrupt him right there. Anything else I can do? No, that takes care of everything. I tell you what, I'm through in about an hour. I'll take you up to Martinello's for dinner. You can see for yourself. No, 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 that, that, that's all right. Okay, Candy, give. Why, Mallet, dear, what on earth do you mean? You know something about something. I want in. Mallard, and, and I want you to believe this. I mean it sincerely. If I knew something, you'd be the last to know about it. He's got something there. Come now, believe us a while. I hate to do things like that to Mallard. He's been of great help to me in the past. More than once, he's saved my life. But on a deal like this, you have to play it close. After all, a girl has to make a living. For the first time in a long time, I was completely baffled as to where to start. Something had to be done about that cadaver in the icebox, but what? While I was beetling my eyebrows, Rembrandt invited me up to his place for tea. He lives on California Street, just down away from old St. Mary's and only a bail bond broker's reach from the Hall of Justice. So I accepted. You do forgive the looks of the place, Candy, dear. I had a meeting my philatelist group last night. Philatelist? The stamp collectors, dear. Well, I know what they are, but I didn't think they could make such a mess. You don't know philatelists. Mm. Sit down, though. Make yourself comfortable. I shan't be a moment. That's all right. And Candy, dear, why the wrinkles? I've got cause for wrinkles. This chap in the icebox, Rembrandt, there's something I didn't tell you. He was dressed in a devil's costume. There, there, dear. Your tea will ready in just a minute. You'll feel better. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. What are you going to do, Candy? I don't know. I can't leave him in that refrigerator forever. We'll get him out, dear. I hate to think of a corpse catching pneumonia. Oh, excuse me, Candy. Help yourself to the tea. Mm -hmm. How do you do, Rembrandt Watson Enterprises? <laughs> Quiet, darling. Who? Oh, hello, Templeton. How are all your steamships? Oh, that's good. What? Could I use do what? To the opera? Of course I could. Why do I'll pick them up at your office. Thank you, Templeton. Goodbye. Candy, dear, do you like the opera? I can take it or leave it. Why? It suddenly develops that I have two tickets tomorrow night for Tales of Hoffman. Oh, Rembrandt, I don't think I come, can... Come, come, Candy. It'll do you good. You've been working too hard. You need a little relaxation. Tales of Hoffman, hmm? Okay. Who's the pal who gave them to you? An old friend of mine, Templeton Woodruff. He runs a steamship to Java and other places Ezio Pinza sings about. I finished the tea and left. Right then, the only opera I could think of was the one going on in an icebox at Martinello's. I've always tried to play straight with Ray Mallard, so I decided to tell Martinello my plan. Miss Mudson, I don't think it's such a good idea. Good evening, to... Carlo. I want to talk to you. That's what I mean. There's a gentleman here who... Oh, you've got a gentleman. That's fine. Three more and you've got a crowd. What I want to talk to you about is you this. You don't understand. The gentleman I'm talking about is from the police. The police? Yeah. Oh. Hello, Candy. Mallard. How about some scallopini? Well, up jumped the... Hello, Mallard, dear. I had an idea you'd like dinner here tonight. Uh, do you know my boy, Carlo? Yes, yes, we've met. How do you do? How do you do? The signorina wish something to eat? No. No, thanks. I want to talk to you, though, Mallard. Sure. Come on into my booth. We'll share some salami. No, no, thanks. I want to see you downstairs. I don't think the food's as good down there. I agree, but it isn't the food. I'm talking about murder. Once again, I headed down into the catacombs of the Charlemagne. 
This time the act was a double. Mallard was right behind me. Then I looked around. We were a trio. Martinello was right behind Mallard. This is it. This is what? This is an icebox. Inside, you'll find a body dressed in a devil's costume. Okay, Carlo, let's humor the lady. Open the thing, will you? I... Yes. I'll open it. <laughs> Lovely view of the beef. It's gone. The body's gone. Okay, Martinello, start talking and make some sense while you're doing it. Please, Miss Matson. I don't know anything. I haven't been down here all day. Get rid of those arched eyebrows, Martinello. You know something. What is it? Wait a minute, Candy. I'll do the questioning. In the first place, Carlo, was there or was there not a body in here? I... Well... Sure there was. He can't deny it. Here's a check for $2,000 signed by Martinello himself. Well, Carlo? Yes. There was a body, all right. Who was it? Friend of yours? No, Inspector. I never saw him before. Why did you call Miss Matson? Why didn't you come to see me about it? Well, you know, Inspector, the police... Uh, just because you were once arrested for bootlegging, Carlo, there's no reason to be afraid of the police. Uh, well, I'll put a couple of my men on the job and see what we can turn up. What? Is that all you're going to do, Mallard? No. Right now, I'm going back upstairs and have some of Carlo's scallopini. Mallard, are you out of your head? Look, Candy, in order to have a murder case, you've got to have a body. Obviously, we're fresh out. And until your pal with the devil's costume turns up, I intend to live my typical everyday life. Don't forget the mushrooms, Carlo. There are times when I get so mad at Mallard, I want to scream. I didn't, though. I only scrammed. I hung on to the 2,000, however. I felt I deserved it just for getting my curiosity aroused, and it was aroused plenty. Corpses don't get up and walk out of ice boxes by themselves. But after all, Mallard had a point. There was nothing to be done without a body. So I went home and waded into a stack of dirty dishes that had been piling up. Then I fixed dinner and started a new stack of dirty dishes. Got a book and ducked into bed. In the morning, I had an idea. After breakfast, I went down to the corner of Broadway and Columbus. That's where North Beach does a neat blend with Chinatown. On the corner was a Joe who sold newspapers. I'd known him for some time, and he seemed to like me. Hiya, Butch. Well, hello there, lady. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Who won the football game yesterday? Yeah, funny thing. I got all the news right inside here for seven cents. Mm, I get your point. Give me a chronicle, will you? Sure. Here. Thanks. Who do you like in the feature at Bay Meadows? A goat named Candy. What What did you say? There's a pig named Candy running in the seventh. Take it or leave it. What a tip. I don't get it. Well, what's really on your mind, lady? Here, here's a 20. You can play it on Candy all for yourself. Well. Do you know a gent named Martinello Butch? Mm. He owns the Charlemagne down the block. Sure. What about him? That's what I'm asking you. What about him? Oh, he's all right. A little screwy, but he keeps his nose clean. Is that all? Yeah. Should there be more? I don't know. Thanks, Butch. I hope candy pays off. I was getting nowhere, that was for sure, and the rest of the day went the same way. Dead ends, blind alleys. I checked as many loose ends as I possibly could, but I was still stuck in a quandary. But the crusher claimed late in the afternoon when I got a copy of the late paper and read where candy came in at Bay Meadows and paid thirty-two twenty. And I hadn't had sense enough to get aboard. When I got home, the phone was ringing. Hello, Candy Matson. Oh, you're Candy Matson. I should play a fanfare. Oh, hello, Rembrandt, dear. How are you? Like an October morning. Every single one of me paws is breathing great, huge gulps of air. What? I just had a facial dove. Most invigorating. Uh what on earth for? I loved your old pores just the way they were. Candy, you've forgotten. I have? Forgotten what, Rembrandt? We're going to the opera tonight. Oh, Ducky, I'm sorry. I had forgotten. I'm afraid I'll have to renege. Now, Candy, you promised. And I don't care what you're involved in. It'll do you good. But, Rembrandt, I'm working on it. Perhaps you're right. Okay, I'll get ready. Wonderful, dear. Pick me up about a quarter of eight, will you? Pick you up a quarter of eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and another thing, Lamb. We may have to do some entertaining afterward. Uh, do bring some cash, will you? Mm -hmm. That's the girl. 
को That Rembrandt always stony broke. I guess photography isn't what it's cracked up to be. I didn't mind though. He's been a friend to me on more than one occasion. Well, if I was going to the opera, I had to start thinking in operatic terms. I fished around in the closet and came up with something that would have done any woman's heart good. One of those strapless affairs that you can't stop breathing in for one moment, otherwise the opera is no longer the main attraction. I powdered, perfumed, pouted and rouge and took off after Rembrandt. But just as I started to leave. Just a moment. Well, get a load of the Duchess. Mm-hmm. It won't be Halloween for another couple of weeks yet. Oh, very funny. Come on in, Miller. What are you decked out for, Candy? Something you wouldn't understand. I'm going to the opera. Oh, I love the opera. Any horse opera with Tex Acuff in it. That's what I thought. What's on your mind, Mallard? I've got to pick up Rembrandt in ten minutes. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop and tell you the news. News about what? We found El Diablo. The guy in the ice box? Yeah, Martinello identified him. He was floating in the water off Aquatic Park. Any lead on him? The best. He was Salavini, the second baritone with the opera company. That's all, Candy. I hope you enjoy the performance tonight. <laughs> A baritone with the opera company. Well, that explained the costume, but it didn't explain a lot of other things. I walked down the stairs with Mallard. He got in his squad car, flicked on the flashing red light, and with a burst of his siren, rolled down the street. I'd have to speak to Mallard about that. All the neighbors had their heads out of their windows as I climbed into my car and followed. What an exit! I picked up Rembrandt and we drove up to the Civic Center. I found a place to park. A minor miracle. The last time I went to the opera, I had to drive almost to Palo Alto and come back by train. Rembrandt's friend must have been very influential. We had seats in the Diamond Horseshoe. They were presenting tales of Hoffman, and a friend of mine, Dorothy Warrenchild, was singing the role of Antonia. It was a fine performance, and after the last curtain, I took Rembrandt. We went backstage to see Dorothy. <laughs> This is her dressing room, Rembrandt. Yes? Hello, Dorothy. This is Candy Metz, and I have a friend with me. Oh, do come in, please, Candy. Candy, how are you? Couldn't be better. Dorothy, may I present Mr. Watson? Rembrandt, this is Miss Warren Chose. Delighted. You're in magnificent voice tonight, dear, dear. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? I've only a moment. We're rehearsing some of the scenes in Faust tonight. Rehearsing after a full evening's performance? It has to be done, Candy. Our baritone disappeared. We've had to replace him with a new man. Yes, yes, I know. By the way, Dorothy, I heard you on your Standard Hour broadcast a few weeks ago. It was a wonderful performance. I'm glad you liked it, Candy. I always look forward to those. What are your plans, Dorothy? Well, the season closes here, and then we open in Los Angeles. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. That's all right. Oh, Candy, I'd like to introduce Rolf Herbert. This is Miss Matson and Mr. Watson. Nice to know you, do. Mr. Herbert is our new baritone. Oh, yes. That's why we're rehearsing tonight. I uh, won't take any more of your time, Dorothy. I just thought we'd save a few moments of rehearsal if I told you that I don't uh, move in that last scene. I sing upstage. That will leave you free to take as much stage as you like. Fine, Rolf. That will save time. Thanks. Oh, not at all. I'm glad to have met you, Miss Matson. Mr. Watson. Nice to have met you, you, sir. Yeah, see you on stage, Dorothy. Eh? Yes, Rolf. Rolf has a wonderful voice, and he's a good actor, too. You know, I think he'll be even better than Salavini. I've seen him before. Oh, yes, he's been in pictures and on the concert stage, and in opera, too. But he's, he's never really had a good break. This might be it. Uh-oh, that's it, Candy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave. Certainly, Dorothy. Say, why don't you stand in the wings? You can watch the rehearsal if you'd like. Oh, I'd love it. Come on, then. Follow me. All right, the places, everyone. Places. This is all right, Candy. You can stay right here. Thanks, Dorothy. Glad to have met you, Mr. Watson. Also, as we used to say in the theater, go out there and kill him. <laughs> See you later. Where is Miss Warrenshaw? Ah, there you are. Herbert, where's Herbert? I saw him just a moment ago in the dressing room. Well, it's late. We've got to keep moving. Please, somebody find Herbert. Ah! 
from way up in the heights of the stage, the opera house was pierced with a blood-curdling scream. That was no ordinary scream. It was the scream of death. You wait here, Rembrandt. Keep your eyes open. I'm going up to have a look. That scream wasn't in the score of Faust. I punched the button for the backstage elevator. It's a good thing they work fast and are speedy. Once inside, I pressed the button for the fourth gallery. I got out. This was the top of the opera house. The place was loaded with old sets, props, paper mache alligators, gold goblets. Then, over on the other side of the catwalk, I saw it. The body of a man all crumpled and distorted. I hit the catwalk and ran over. It was a hundred feet above the stage, and as I looked down, I could see a score of strained faces looking up through the darkness. I got on the other side and bent over the body. It was that of Rolf Herbert. Candy, down here. I think your man just ducked down underneath the stage. Again, I did a Mel Patton. The elevator shot me down to the stage level, and there was Rembrandt, wild-eyed. He came down the elevator on the other side, Candy. Then he cut across the stage and down those steps. Come on, Rembrandt, follow me. I may need help. We ran down the steps and into the bowels of the stage. It looked like a nightmare, a myriad of cross beams of steel for the rising stages. We cleared those and went around by the chorus dressing room. There was only one out. I remembered it. A door over in the corner, very seldom used, but it was open. It led into a long tunnel with giant steam pipes running overhead and to the right. This went underground over to the veterans' building. Down by your feet, there's a stream of water flowing in a trough. It's the old Hayes Valley Creek. Our killer decidedly knew his opera house. As we entered the tunnel, I could see him up ahead running like crazy, so we took off after him. We made the other side, and it breaks into a big engine room. As we came into the opening, I looked around. The engineer was lying on the floor out like a light blood spurting from his scalp. Then I glanced up. There was another door. This led into the veterans' building itself and an avenue of escape onto Van Ness. I ran up. Then as we got into the long corridor, I saw Martinello breaking for the door. Stop! Stop, Martinello! Stop! You think I am a fool? I do if you don't stop. Try and get me. Okay, pal. You ask for it. It was the first time I had ever shot a man. It didn't feel good. But he lived, and later the doctors of law gave him a little pill. The cyanide kind they dropped inside the gas chamber at San Quentin. Martinello paid his debt. Details? Sure, I'll fill him in now. Martinello loved to sing. Ray Mallard had told me that. For years, Carlo had been hanging around the opera house, hoping to step into a role. This season, a director had jokingly told him that if he ran out of baritones, he'd let Carlo take over. Carlo took him seriously. He lured Salavini down to his restaurant on a fake emergency call, costume and all, and did him in. But then he became frightened. That's when he called me. It was worth $2,000 to have me hush things up. But I don't operate like that. He had a hunch I was going to tip off Mallard. That's when he removed the body from the icebox and dumped him into the bay. Carlo had also been at the performance of Tales of Hoffman. That's when he learned that they'd wrestled up Rolf Herbert to sing in place of Salovini. By this time, Martinello was obsessed with the idea of singing in the opera house and wouldn't stop at anything. Right after Herbert left Warren Schold's dressing room, he managed to get Herbert into the elevator and up to the fourth gallery behind the stage. That scream was produced by a six-inch stiletto through Herbert's heart from the hands of Martinello. And that's when our chase began. I hope I never see that tunnel under the opera house again. That Mallard and his sentiments. It was he who gave me that gun just a week before, for my birthday. He said I needed protection. Well, darn it, I do. But I can't get Mallard to believe me. Instead, he just gives me guns. <laughs> Listen again at this same time next week. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209.
heard tonight were Harry Bechtel as Ralph Herbert, Jerry Walter as Carlo Martinello, Henry Leff plays the role of Inspector Mallard, and Jack Thomas is Rembrandt. Dorothy Warren Schold, star of the Standard Hour and the San Francisco Opera Company, was heard as herself. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. With the exception of Miss Warren Schold, any resemblance to actual people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. Candy Matson comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Candy? Candy, over here. What? Why, Myra Fisher, what are you doing here in a department store with your work clothes on? I work here, dear. I'm a wage slave. Well, I must say on you, it looks good. What do you slave at? I'm head of advertising and promotion. Well, quite a spot, hey, girl? No, it was until this morning. Oh? Now my neck is in the fire. What'd you do? Forget to proofread one of your ads? Nothing so trivial, dear, believe me. But am I glad to have bumped into you? Maybe you'll change your mind when I tell you I've been shoplifting. No, I'm serious, Candy. Uh, could you spare a moment and come on up to my office? Why, sure. And wipe that frown from off your brow. It's wrinkling your makeup. Well, yours would wrinkle, too, if you had a missing Santa Claus helper on your hands. Well, well, now, there's a situation. And it almost broke Candy Matson's heart when someone told her there was no Santa Claus's helper, one Jack Frost. Listen, here she is now to tell you about it. That's right, what the man said. I ran into a deal where we had a missing Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. The gent with the icicles was supposed to talk to the tiny tots at the Brownstone, one of San Francisco's larger and classier department stores. I'd gone down there that afternoon shopping. I wanted a bow tie for my old pal Inspector Ray Mallard of the San Francisco Police Department. A bow tie that lit up and spelled Cossack when you pressed the button on the battery. That was when I bumped into this gal, Myra Fisher. We went up to her office on the sixth floor and she sat me down. Cigaretted me, too. You think I'm fooling about this Jack Frost thing, don't you, Candy? Well, now, look, dear, we all have our little peccadilloes. Yours just merely happens to be a missing Jack Frost. You'll get over it. I refrain from hurling this ashtray at you, Candy, only because of our long acquaintance. Good. Now listen to me. We've had a Santa Claus helper here for almost a month, and a darn good one. The kids were crazy about him. This morning, he didn't show. You don't suppose Jackie boy got in the mood and caught the Christmas spirit, do you? The kind that comes in pints? No, he wasn't that sort of Joe. Well, your answer's simple. Hire a new one. They're hired through an agency. I called the one we do business with, and they're fresh out of Jack Frost. And I've got to get one, Candy. Otherwise, I come down ten notches in the opinion of the brass. I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Myra, but what can I do? Well, you get around, you know people. Find me somebody, anybody, who'll take over the job of being Jack Frost. <sighs> well, okay. I'll do the best I can, Myra. Candy, you're a dear. Yeah, one of Santa's dears. Okay, I'll try and find you a Jack Frost, Myra, but don't hold it against me if he turns out to look more like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> I went home and looked up the Webster definition of soft. It said soft, easily yielding to pressure. That was me, Candy Matson, girl dope. Here I had all my Christmas shopping to do, and I agreed to find a substitute for Jack Frost. I had no idea where to start. So I changed into something red and green for a stop and go, also for Christmas, and went over to see my friendly advisor, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt is a photographer, and excellent, too, now that he doesn't have the sherry shivers or the pork palsies. He lives on California Street, just kitten rompers from old St. Mary's, with a statue of Sun Yat Sen for company in a park next door. Candy doll, how delightful. Do come in, won't you? Thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, Pat, you're acquainted with my friend Diogenes Murphy, aren't you? Oh, yes. Hello again, Mr. Murphy. Well, good afternoon, lad. You look prettier than you did the last time I saw you. Uh-oh, here comes the blarney. Uh, 
Young lady, Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman, never says a word he doesn't mean. Now, how do you think I managed to sell so many used cars at me place out on Venice Avenue? Because you're an honest Irishman. <laughs> oh, bo- bo- bo, you're so right, lad. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, if you need a good car, I can get you one at a very reasonable... Diogenes? Oh, sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> I didn't mean to barge in on you like this, Rembrandt. Oh, don't be ridiculous, dear. No, don't be. Think nothing of it, lad. I'm on my way now. Uh, Rembrandt and I were only discussing the situation of the world. And to what conclusion did you come? Uh, it stinks. <laughs> The bottom of the afternoon to the boss here. <laughs> oh, he's quite a boy. Yes, I'm very fond of Diogenes. What brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. <laughs> yes. Now, getting on with our conversation, what brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. Maybe the needle's bad. Shall we try again? I know how you feel. I reacted the same way myself. I'll give you the pocket-sized edition. The brownstone department store is without a Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. He didn't show up for work this morning. I said I'd find him a new one. Well, that's very sweet of you, Dove. Very dumb of me, Dove. I know of only one character who even remotely looks like Jack Frost. I met him up in Alaska when I was traveling with the USO. Won't do you much good down here with it. No, that's why I came to see you, Rembrandt. Don't you keep a, a cross file on models you've used in photography? As a matter of fact, I do. Here in this little book. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Men, thin, extremely. I have just one, Pietro Tarantello. Would you care for a Sicilian Jack Frost? In Sicily, yes. Hey, what's that? Where? On that chair next to you. Oh, that's the afternoon paper, dear. Diogenes left it, I imagine. Yes, but on the front page. Here's the whole story about the missing Jack Frost on the front page. Ooh, what he got in his Christmas stocking. A slug through the head. That's no way to treat Jack Frost. And here's a picture of the guy without his false icicles. What the ham... Looks like he stepped right out of an 1890 Shakespearean play. I hate to say this, Rembrandt, but he resembles you. I take back what I said. Rembrandt. Divorce yourself from that tone of voice, Candy. I don't like it. Rembrandt, I've got an idea. You usually do. You like little children. Can't stand them. You like to talk to people. I abhor conversation. You like to be charming. Lost me charm. Gay. Lost me gay. With the help of a few icicles, Ducky, you're going to be Jack Frost. <laughs> Rembrandt fought, he argued, he paced the floor, he had the vapors, he fainted. I brought him to. I won the argument. I got my friend Myra Fisher on the phone and informed her that one R. Watson would assume the role of Jolly Jack Frost on the morrow. She was delighted. I couldn't say the same for Rembrandt. Then I went home. I was greeted by a sound very much like that of a phone ringing. Using my keen instincts, I figured it was the phone. It was. Hello, Candy Matson. Uh, how do you do, Miss Matson? Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Allowed? Uh, my name is Burke, Prentice Burke. I'm the first assistant vice president of the Brownstone. Brownstone? Oh, yes, that's a store of some kind, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, now, the reason for my call. Uh, there has been, uh, shall I say, a rather unfortunate occurrence in our store today. Mm, so I read. I need the help of a professional sleuth. Uh, you were highly recommended by the head of our advertising department, Miss Myra Fisher. Aha, uh-huh. the thick plotten. I beg your pardon. Oh, no need to. You didn't do anything. Okay, care to talk to me now, Mr. Burke? Oh, I'd much rather have you come down to my office, Miss Batson. Uh, this matter is uh, of an extremely confidential nature. I'm your girl, then. Figuratively speaking. How long will you be there? Uh, as long as necessary. Uh, that's up to you. Very well. I'll be there in half an hour if I can find a place to park. <laughs> I only had time for a fast change, so I made it from Andescray to Taboo. I sniffed at it and felt I was on the right scent. Then I climbed in my car, drove down Kearney Street, waved a crisp single under the nose of a hotel doorman and had my car taken care of. Then into the brownstone and up to Mr. Prentice Burke's office. I flipped a hip past the girl's secretary and walked on in. Burke was waiting for me. That was obvious. I could tell by the expression on his face. It was worried look number 12B. How do you do, Mr. Burke? I'm Candy Matson. Uh, oh, uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Now, our subject is what? Uh, a man named Jordan. That's on another network. I beg your pardon? Oh, that's all right. Uh, now, about this Jordan. Uh, yes, uh, Ralph Jordan, to be exact. Well, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought you wanted to talk about Jack Frost. Uh, that's just it. He was Jack Frost. Oh, me and my big mouth. He was working here up until yesterday afternoon. And maybe you read about it. He was found shot today. Yes, yes, I read about it. That's the reason I've called you. Why didn't you have your own store detectives take over, Mr. Burke? Uh, no, no. Uh, that would never do. 
I want no one in the store to know what's going on. Ah, intrigue. Uh, quite possibly. I have reason to suspect that Jordan was killed by someone in our employ. I want to find out who that someone was before the police do and get it splashed all over the front pages. Publicity, can't you say? Uh, well, business has been off for uh, a whole year, and any bad breaks in the press would hurt us that much more. Maybe you've got a point there, I don't know. I know I have. Okay, I'll take the job. You say you have a suspicion. What is it? Well, nothing tangible. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, that's a big help. Well, I'll mush around and see what I can pick up. I'll bill you tomorrow for my first day's work. It's much easier to sustain a friendship on a daily basis. I left Burke looking as though someone had just called his store a bazaar. It was closing time, so I hefted my way through the crush and retrieved my car from the doorman. The Hall of Justice is right on my way home, so I decided to drop in on my old pal Mallard, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A nice guy to serve coffee to on Sunday mornings if you could ever lasso him. I never could get strong enough rope. Sandy, what brings you around here? I hate to have my Christmas ruined so early. What about that Jack Frost character? Oh, yeah. Poor guy got it good. Where'd you find him? In his apartment over on 17th. He lived near Seal Stadium. Why so interested, Candy? Rembrandt's a dead ringer for the guy. I still don't get that. The gal who's head of advertising for the Brownstone was going out of her head for another Jack Frost. I talked Rembrandt into taking the job. Huh? <laughs> Does sound funny, doesn't it? Bring me up to date, Mallory. Did you get any dope on the killing? Nothing but a forty-five slug out of the guy's wall. Ballistics is checking it now. Nothing else? If I did, I should tell you. No. No, I guess not. This goes beyond just a normal curiosity, Candy. What are you drilling for? Oh, it's only that I'm worried about Rembrandt. I got him the job. I'm responsible. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Ask a silly question, Mallard, and you get a silly answer. Okay, let's forget it. How's about dinner tonight? I've fought this thing long enough. Okay. Uh, Candy. Uh, yes, Mallard? We've known each other a good long time, haven't we? That's right. Ever since the fair on Treasure Island. We've had our little quarrels, little misunderstandings. Oh, but they never seem to last long, though, do they? No. That's why I feel I have every right to ask you a question. Wait, yes, I'd say you do, Mallard. Maybe I'll ask you tonight. No, 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 go ahead. Now's as good a time as any. Perhaps it is, Candy. You get around a lot. You meet people. Do you know where I can get a couple of tickets to the Rose Bowl game? My brain lit up like a Roman candle. I stormed for the door, turned back, stood there, my jaw waggling helplessly. Then I stuck my tongue out at Mallard and left. It was the only thing I could think of doing. Oh, he can make me so mad. But inside half an hour after I got home, I, I started to laugh. <laughs> Felt much better. Just as I was puttering around getting ready, the apartment buzzer buzzed. That Mallard, much too early. But I was wrong. It wasn't Mallard. Well, Myra, what a surprise. Do come in, won't you? No, thanks, Candy. A friend of mine's waiting in his car outside. He's driving me home. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't stay for a moment? So, my dear, I just dropped by to leave this. Merely a little token of thanks for getting me off the hook. Oh, Myra, th there wasn't any need to do that. Just a few pair of old stockings, dear. Getting me my new Jack Frost means more than you know. Here, please take them, oh. along with my very deepest thanks. Oh, thanks so much. A girl can always use them. Are you all set with my friend, Mr. Watson? Oh, yes. He came in this afternoon and filled out his withholding tax and so on. It's very nice. I think you'll find him very efficient, Myra. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, pardon me. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, Mallard. <sighs> Silly of me. I must have jumped a foot. Oh, that's all right. He frightens me, too. Myra, I'd like to have you meet Inspector Mallard. Inspector, Miss Fisher. How do you do? Oh, fine, thank you. Now that I've caught my breath. Do forgive me, Candy, but I must rush. See you soon, I hope. Tomorrow, Myra, I'll be down to see how my lad's doing as Jack Frost. Thanks for the stocking. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? No, I'm not. Here's my coat right here. What's our hurry? Come on, let's go. I'm starved. I thought we could have a cocktail here before we left. You thought wrong. Two tickets to the Rose Bowl. From now on, you earn your cocktails, Mallard. Oh, 
We went downstairs, and as I locked the front door, a car was just driving off. It was Myra, and she waved. And driving, if these tired old eyes hadn't deceived me, was Mr. Prentice Burke, vice president of the Brownstone. Well. Oh, well. Mallard and I climbed into our car and drove out to the cliff house. It was that kind of an evening. We had dinner, and after, I suggested we walk a bit. The night was crisp and clear, and the evening star was hanging out above the dark waters of the Pacific like an iridescent Japanese lantern. We cut across a little road above Sutro Baths, where an old car barn had once stood, and worked our way over the cliffs and stood high above Land's End. It was exhilarating. Penny for your thoughts, Candy. Inflation is still here. All right, I get two pennies. Well, I was just thinking, Mallard, dear, when you see a star in the sky, soft water below, feel Christmas in the air, how can there be violence in the world? An age-old question, pal. One I can't answer. I'm too small. Hey, you're cold. I'd better put my arm around you. Mallard, no. What's the matter? The headlights from that automobile are shining right down on us, and we... Mallard. Sandy, what's wrong? Got your flashlight with you? Sure. Also, my gun and my handcuffs. Anything else we need? A mortar, maybe? The lights from that car. They shone on something. Down there, under that tree. Oh, Candy, just for once, can't you stop digging up a mystery? Be human? I am being human. Come on, Mallard. I want to see what's under that tree. We scrambled around through the brush, slipped into some sliding sand, and rode the crest down to the tree. It wasn't easy to get around some of those brambles, but get there I fully intended doing because what I saw was red, bright red. You, you okay, Candy? Nothing that a, a new pair of nylons won't fix. Shoot the flashlight over the, this way a bit, Mallard. Uh-huh. There, that's it. Now, do you think I'm dreaming things up? Uh, what is it? Wait till I hold it up. Wow. Well. Looks like some kind of a costume. Right. And look, if those aren't bloodstains, I'm a Labrador retriever. No, you're a candy matson. Those are bloodstains. How was your boy dressed when you found him? Torn slacks, sweater, shoes, no socks. This was most likely his costume, then. Yeah. Don't move around too much, Candy. I want to have a good look at the ground. Hey, what are you doing down there? Who's that? The police. Now, get up here and don't try any tricks. That's all right, officer. This is Inspector Mallard. Homicide. Oh, sorry, Inspector. That's all right. Stay right where you are. We'll be right up. Now, this is a break, Candy. I want you to drive me to a phone. I'll leave the officer here to guard the place. You can go home. I've got work to do here, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. (laughs) For once, we had dinner before you had a chance to break the date. This baby was hard to reconstruct. Was the guy knocked off out there at Land's End, or was he bumped off at his apartment, the killer driving way out to the beach and hiding the costume? Only time would tell. I went home, climbed into bed, and logged about eight hours, enough to give me fuel for the next day. In the morning, I went down to the brownstone. The shoppers were already swarming through the place. I spotted a floor walker and strolled over to him. Pardon me, sir. I I said, pardon me, sir. I'm very busy, young lady. Make it as brief as possible. You do work here, don't you? Of course. You are the floor walker assigned to this section? That is correct. Come to the point, please. Of all the... Well, I have a good mind to report you. As you wish. As I said, I'm very busy. Now, what is it you wanted to know? The words are like gall in my mouth now, but where do I find Jack Frost? Right over there, in the back, two aisles over. Thank you. Not at all. Very much. All the high-handed characters, people like that make me steam. I was getting up a full head of dander, but it simmered out before I had a chance to boil over. Because as I rounded a corner, I saw Frosty Boy, or Rembrandt, if you choose, up on his platform with the cutest little blonde kid sitting in his lap. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. A great big boy. Hello there, son. Hello, Jack Frost. What is your name? Topper. Topper. My, what a fine name. How old are you, Topper? Five and a half. Five and a half. Well, you must go to school, Topper. Which one? Garfield. Garfield. That's a good school. 
Now tell me, uh, what would you like to have me tell Santa Claus to bring you for Christmas, Topper? An electric train and a baseball bat. And I like to be in the seals for Lefty Old Duel. Well, I'll see what I can do to arrange that, Topper. I'll tell Santa Claus. Bye now. Goodbye, and thank you, and Merry Christmas. I hope you can make the boy's wish come true. Old Duel could use him. Candy, I'm so glad you're here, Doug. Duck around into the back room for a moment. I've got to talk to you. Aren't you working, Frosty Boy? I got ten minutes off every hour. I'll take the break now. Right around there, Candy. Okay. I'll see you in a moment. What's the matter, Rembrandt? Even under those icicles, you look warm under the collar. Here, look at this. Every now and then, one of these moppets toddles up to me with a Christmas letter in its hand. A little red-headed girl handed me this about half an hour ago. I've been shaking ever since. Let me see. Dear Jack Frost, a word to the wise is sufficient. When you take your lunch hour, keep on going. Don't come back. Otherwise, you'll meet the same fate as your predecessor. Hmm. Just about what I expected. Candy, you mean to say that you're deliberately using me as a sacrificial lamb? By no means, Ducky. Go ahead, take your lunch. Then do as the note says. Keep on going. As a matter of fact, why don't you take off now? I'll meet you at your place in about an hour. That's the best news I've heard since Nelson's victory at Trafalgar. I whipped upstairs, reported to Prentice Burke, got my first day's check, and on my way out told his secretary she'd better get Burke some smelling salt. Then I went back down on the floor again. Sure enough, there was my boy, the floor walker. I wanted to have a few more words with him. Oh, you again. If you don't mind. I was just up to see Miss Myra Fisher. She wasn't in. Have you seen her down here? No, and what's more, I won't see her all day. She phoned saying she was feeling ill. Most inconsiderate, I must say, during the holiday rush. Yes, I must say. Uh, Could you give me her address? She's a friend of mine. I've got to see her. Her address? Well, yes. Write it down here on one of my cards for you. Myra Fisher, 227F, Union Street. There. Thank you. You're so kind. I had all the ammunition I wanted. A check signed by Burke and a card written by the floor walker. His name was Simon Liggett. With that, I ducked into a phone booth and called Mallard. I'm aside. Mallard speaking. Good boy. This is Candy. What did you find out at Land's End last night? A couple of very juicy footprints. They give us nothing. Did you make any casts of them? Why, sure. Mind if I borrow a couple of them for a few hours, Mallard? Well, I don't see how it'll hurt. Sure, okay. Thanks, Mallard, dear. I'll be by in a moment. And, uh... I want to borrow you, too. I stopped by the Hall of Justice, got the cast of the footprints, shoved Mallard into the car, and then picked up Rembrandt. The thing was only a hunch, but my hunches have paid off, so I never ignore them. First, we went out to an address on Fifth Avenue near Clement. We got in the back door and went to work. Nothing made sense there. So we drove over to Reseda Way in the marina. Again, we got in and did some sleuthing. This time, we hit the jackpot. A pair of shoes in the closet matched the cast we had brought with us. Rembrandt, go out in the kitchen and, and see if this place has any ketchup. I'm not hungry, Dub, but oh, look. What are you up to, Candy? We've got enough to swing a case here. I'm working for a voluntary confession, Mallard. Tell me, what was the position that the, the Jack Frost was in when you found him dead? In a chair, like that one. His head slumped down on his chest. Good. Here's the concept, though. When are you putting it on? You. What? Without the burner relish, Ducky. Sit down there, will you, Ember? Now, just go limp and let your head hang down. That's it. Now for a little seasoning. Oh, Candy, you're smearing me with this sticky stuff. And all for the sake of art. Hold still. There. How does he look, Mallard? Why, all the... Candy, it looks like the same guy, the real thing. Good. Now, Rembrandt, you just sit like that. Don't move. Mallard, you duck into that closet over there, and I'll hide in here. We've got a good view of the front door from both places, okay? Okay. There are times, Candy, when I admit I admire your genius. Genius, genius. Come on, let's hide. The 
golden shafts of sun splashing in through the window from the ocean slowly turned pink, then purple, and into twilight. The minutes ticked on. Once. <coughs> bless you, but quiet, though, Rembrandt. You'll mess up your ketchup. Five minutes. Ten. Then we heard muffled footsteps coming down the hall and a key inserted in the lock of the apartment door. old fool I killed. No, no. Okay, buddy, oh. that'll be about enough. What? Oh, no. You... Get him, Mallard. He's ducking. I'll get him. Oh, no. oh. Nice tackle, Mallard. All right, Mac. You're going to remain peaceful or do I have to give you a little tap? No, no. I'll be quiet. You got me. I did it. I did it to the both of them. I killed them. I killed them. I killed both of them. Both of them? them? Yeah. Look behind the sofa. The sofa, the girl, the Jack Frost, the sofa. The sofa. Wait a minute, Mallard. I, I had to do it. I couldn't. Oh, but then they were going to do it. Oh, Mallard. It. More trouble, Candy. I killed both of them. I'm glad I killed yes. An old I friend of mine. Was my, the late Myra Fisher. I had to do it. The whole thing was jealousy. Not the jealousy of a man for a woman, but the jealousy of a man for a job. Simon Liggett had been with the Brownstone for almost 20 years. He'd worked himself up from the stock boy to a place where he'd been promised the job of head of advertising and promotion. He almost got it. Except at the last moment, Prentice Burke gave the position to Myra Fisher. That had only been two weeks before. He knew that Myra was on a probationary term, so he did everything he could to undermine her. Little things like changing ad copy, sending out false stories to newspapers. He figured that if he could keep the store without a Santa Claus helper, he'd break Myra's back and get the job by the first of the year. He paid a visit to the first Jack Frost and tried to bribe him into quitting, but the guy would have none of it. There was a struggle. Liggett lost his head and whipped out a gun and shot him. He was still in his costume, so Liggett stripped him, put some old clothes on him, drove out to Land's End and ditched his costume. Then he felt sure there would be no Jack Frost the next day. But that's when Myra met me and I talked Rembrandt into taking over. By this time, Liggett was in a frenzy and would stop at nothing. He trailed Myra and Burke to Myra's home, killed her, took her body over to his place, and ditched it behind the sofa. The next morning, he wrote a note to Rembrandt and gave it to one of the little girls waiting in line to see him. Fear and envy were taking their toll on the poor guy's mind. I wanted to compare the handwriting, so I had Burke write me a check and Liggett write Myra's address on a card. Also, we had the footprint cast. Between the two, everything pointed toward Liggett. That's when I staged my little parlor charade with Rembrandt playing the part of a corpse. The sight, with Rembrandt's resemblance to the dead Jack Frost, would shatter anybody into a confession. But Christmas, in spite of everything, is a lovely time of year. And there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> Three of them for me, as a matter of fact. Mr. Prentice Burke, who sent me a very nice check for my efforts. Rembrandt Watson, who, out of sheer love for the job, went back to playing Jack Frost for all the kids at the Brownstone. And last but not least, Inspector Ray Mallard. He gave me a Christmas sock right on my mouth, just where any well-placed Christmas sock should go. Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial Candy Matson and a Merry Christmas to you all. Yukon 28209. <laughs> Tonight were Helen Klebe as Myra Fisher, Lou Tobin as Prentice Burke, and John Grover as Simon Liggett. Jack Thomas plays the role of Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is heard as Inspector Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy, and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, with the exception of the part of Topper, which was played by himself. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. 
The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. <laughs> Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. This is the start of a mystery. Our main character is a San Francisco girl detective, Candy Matson. There are others in the show, too. An Inspector Mallard, a gent who calls himself Rembrandt Watson, a cowboy, a dude ranch owner, and a gal the casting agency assured us was a dowager, slightly boozy. There are a few other voices along the way, too. I think that has all the makings of a good mystery show, don't you? Well, let's go on from here and find out. So, here's Candy Matson. <laughs> Like the man just said, this is the start of a mystery. Christmas had me completely tuckered out. No one had invited me to the Rose Bowl game or the East-West at Kizar, so I decided to make like a bear and hibernate over New Year's. It worked out perfectly because, as my old friend Rembrandt Watson put it, You wish to reach 1950 in some remote spot? Is that the idea, Doug? That's the idea, Ducky. I have the perfect place for you. A dude ranch, reasonable, just on the other side of Sonoma, in the Valley of the Moon. Valley of the Moon. New Year's Eve in the Valley of the Moon. Rembrandt, that sends me. Good. Maybe it can send us both. I have a commission to take some pictures up there for a brochure they're putting out. I have to be there tomorrow afternoon. Yes? I see you're nibbling at the bait. I shall be blunt. Why don't you drive me up? You've won your point. I'll pick you up tomorrow at what time? Let us be spectacular and say high noon. High noon. And uh, do bring some cash, will you, girl? I'm a little short. I thought you were going up there on a commission. Yes, I am but they have some simply divine one-arm devices. And? And there goes my commission. Naturally, a girl has to look right to welcome in the New Year. That gave me the perfect excuse to squander a few hard-earned dollars and cents on some lovely clothes that didn't make sense but cost dollars. The afternoon was aging gracefully, a little gray here and a wrinkle or two there. So I stopped for a parfait, very dry and no olives. With that mission accomplished, I headed back over Kearney Street. And as I wheeled past Portsmouth Square in the Hall of Justice, I realized I hadn't seen my chum Mallard in quite some time. Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A very smart cop who can smell a clue a mile away. But when it comes to me, he very conveniently carries his own fog around. Well, candy, my little cupcake. Mallard, dear... You called me your little cupcake. Sure, it's still the Christmas season. Let's be charitable, I always say. What do you always say? In a situation like this, nothing. I just exude a stream of steam from the top of my head. Very cute. What brings you around our boarding house? You, darn it. I thought you might like to know I'm going away for a week. What did they get you on? Petty theft? Yeah, and they got me as I tried to make my getaway on a tricycle. <laughs> But for your information, Inspector, I'm, I'm spending my New Year's Eve up in the Valley of the Moon. Oh, want to get away from it all, huh? That's right. You in particular. In that case, may I get your midwinter vacation off to a flying start? You can try. How? I'm not working tonight. How's about a movie? You've got yourself a date. What's playing? Tex, Tex A. Cup. Cup. <laughs> That's what I thought. Where's Tex and his faithful horse Mustard playing this time? Oh, at the plaza. Mm. And the pictures of Pip, too. I bet. I read all about it. Yeah. Hot lead over Laredo. Uh, uh, look, here's the ad in the paper. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Uh, uh, Show me. That, that. Yeah. A searing epic of the West's wild grandeur. Men as rugged as the mountains. Oui. A singing saga of scorching bullets, strumming guitars, and supple senoritas. Uh -uh. And starring the champ of the cowboys, Tex, Tex Acuff. Acuff. Oh, what more can one ask in a motion picture? Popcorn. Oh, we'll have that, too. <laughs> I went home, did some packing for the trip the next day, fixed something to eat, and then changed into my spurs that jingle jangle for Tex Aka. Mallard arrived, we took off. We got to the early show, so we managed to get some good seats. Of course, he wasn't kidding about the popcorn. He got a great big bag of that. 
We fumbled our way down the darkened aisle and found a place to sit. The movie was almost oh, over. Oh, Tex, the whole thing looks like a gosh dang frame up to me. They must have snuck off with them head of cattle and old ring the in you. Yep, I reckon. Here, Candy. Right. These seats are okay. Oh. They must have gone oh. that way, all right. Sure. Oh, 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 sorry, lady. So am I, Pete. What happened to Tex? Last time I seen her, she was leaving. Sit, you're okay. Oh, uh, have some popcorn. Mm, no, no. I wonder no, where the sheriff is. He said he was going to be riding by directly. Oh, probably. Oh, it's true. Uh-uh. What? Going by I popcorn. said sure I'm is good popcorn. Oh, uh, sure you don't want some? What? I said, are you sure you don't want some popcorn? I keep saying no. No, thank you. I don't want any popcorn, my dear. If you'll pardon me, I'm going home and catch this on television. I like seeing not with Tess missing this way. I understand your feeling all about it. After hot lead over Laredo, I suffered through six reels of a bouncy college picture. Freshmen looked like holdovers from the early days of the war. Then a newsreel, then a cartoon, then the trailer, then again Tex Aka. So we got out about midnight, and I drove Mallard back to the Hall of Justice. As he got out of the car... Oh, well. Oh, now that's what I call sharp dialogue. On leaving the lady, all he can say is, oh, well. Oh, nothing personal, Candy. <laughs> now he laughed at me. Well, I was just thinking, uh, you're going up to the Valley of the Moon for a rest. Is that the idea? Well, yes. That and trying to get away from Tex Acuff. Uh, I know you too well, Candy. You're not going to have any rest. Uh, look at the headline on that paper in the newsstand there. Man missing in Sonoma mystery. And Sonoma can have it. Mellor, dear, if I so much as step inside the Sonoma city limits, you can come and lead me away quietly. You know something? I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Mallard waved goodbye and went inside. I didn't like the way he said that. But I had other things to think about, such as getting home and getting some sleep. So I did. And in the morning, I drove over to California Street, picked up Rembrandt. We headed out across the Golden Gate Bridge up toward Sonoma. The Valley of the Moon wasn't too far. A couple of hours of leisurely driving with time out for readjustment. And you're there. Then another eight miles north and east, and there was the Dude Ranch. This is it, dear. What do you think of it? Perfect. Just perfect. Why, Rembrandt, dear, it's a real ranch. Of course, dear, but going concern. They only take in guests as a sideline. Oh, here comes a man. I imagine that's Mr. Lawrence, the owner. Oh, well, I'll shut off the motor. Good morning. How do you do, sir? Would you be Mr. Lawrence, for chance? Yes, and you? Watson. Rembrandt Watson. I'm here to take some pictures for you as we discuss via the Dell system. Oh, yes, Watson. Right on time. That's good. Oh, Candy, may I present Mr. Lawrence? Owner of the double L, uh, Miss Matson. How do you do? Miss Matson was wondering if she could get accommodations for about a week, Mr. Lawrence. What? Now, wait a minute, Watson. I'm paying you a substantial fee for this job, and I won't get stuck with non paying guests. Oh, I think you're laboring under a misapprehension. Hold it, Rembrandt. Look, Mr. Lawrence, I'm here as a commercial guest. I'm not asking for any favors. And I doubt if I'd stay here now if you got down on your bended knuckles. Oh, now, wait a second. I didn't mean it just that way. I, I apologize. It's only that, uh, well, I've had some tough luck with people lately who seem to be only too intent on beating me out of their bills. Uh, please, Miss Matson, excuse me. I, I just jumped to conclusions, that's all. I think you set a new record for the jump. Oh, forget it, Dove. Do. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have room for me, Mr. Lawrence? Why, yes, yes, of course. A delightful cabin just in back of the ranch house. Not being prepared, it'll take about an hour to get it in shape. Will that be all right? Yes, sure. We can eat in the meantime. Fine. I'll get one of the boys to fetch your luggage. Oh, you can park over there under the old stables. Oh, no garage? Well, again, I have to apologize, Miss Matson. The garage is overloaded now. We have a sheriff's posse up here. The owner of the ranch next to mine disappeared yesterday afternoon. The sheriff is searching the entire vicinity around here. <laughs> Dove, are you all right? <laughs> well, speak to me, girl. What is it? I'm all right. I just happened to think of something Mallard once said last night. <laughs> I pushed my assembled horsepower into the stables where they belonged, and Rembrandt took me by the arm and steered me into the ranch house. It was a beautiful place, a tall cathedral-like living room with a crackling fireplace about the size of Dante's Inferno at one end. 
Off to this one side of the fireplace was a cozy little bar. The sun was just going over the yard arm, so I figured an old-fashioned would be quite in order. Old-fashioned was right. Behind the bar was the personification of an old-fashioned cowboy. Real shafts, a leathery face, and little squint wrinkles around his eyes. Well, howdy, Tick. It seems like as if I done saw you in a movie last night. Uh, howdy yourself, ma'am. Nope. Must have been two other cowboys. I've been working here at the Double L for almost five years. My mistake, partner. Matson's the handle. What's yourn? <laughs> Is that the way cowboys talk, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, Hollywood and vine variety. I'm glad to know you. Call me Jeff, Miss Matson. Check. This is Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt, Jeff. Are those shoulders sewn in, or are they real? <laughs> I'm afraid they're real. Hiya, Mr. Watson. You riding herd on all those bottles back there, Jeff? Yep, for better or worse. Chang, our regular bartender, took powder on his day before yesterday. Uh-oh. Seems like he picked a bad time to do a run-out. Oh, you mean the missing jet from Glen Valley? Glen Valley? Yeah, that's the ranch next to ours. Yeah, I understand the police are on the lookout for Chang, but he didn't do it. He's a good, honest Chinese boy. Even so, it's a bad time to disappear. Oh, I admit it doesn't sound good. Well, if you folks won't mind the efforts of an amateur dispenser, what can I do for you? An old-fashioned for me, Jeff. Well, that I can try. <laughs> from now on, it gets easier. Rembrandt only wants the coke. Well, I can sure fix that all right. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Here comes the Duchess. The Duchess? Yeah, one of our guests. Oh. She's been out here about two weeks, and she can go through distilled spirits faster than a buzzsaw through mushy pine. And I hope you're prepared to talk. Always, Jeff. Always. Hello, my dear. You've just arrived, haven't you? Uh, mentally or physically? Oh, oh my! A sense of humor, too. I, I shall enjoy your company. Are you staying long? Well, I, I'm not sure now. My plans are rather indefinite. Oh, you'll love it here, Miss... Uh... Met. And may I present Mr. Rembrandt Watson? Charmed, I'm sure. As of now, me life has come in. Oh, you delightful lad. Uh, Jeff, dear boy, make me just a little nip of the old favorites, will you? Sure. One painkiller coming up. Oh, here's your old-fashioned, Miss Matson. Thanks. Mr. Watson, your coat. Thanks, sir. Young lady, you must be an actress. You look like what? Well, no, I'm not. I used to be an actress, a mm. famous one. Mm -hmm. I toured all over the continent with the greatest of stars, the finest of plays. Mm. I was the toast of London, Berlin, Vienna. Yes, but I... I, I had kings and princesses uh. worshipping at my feet. Oh. I was once the vortex of an international incident. But no matter... Those days are gone forever now. I... And here's your tonic, Duchess. You what? Oh, thank you, Jeff. Well, as we used to say, here's to cry. What was that? It's a perfect toast. We have quite a mystery in this part of the country, young lady. And so I keep hearing. I can't understand. Mr. Ferguson had everything to live for. Mr. Ferguson? The man who owned Glen Valley. Wealthy, good-looking... In the best of health. You seem to know quite a bit about the gentleman, Duchess. Only what I read in the newspapers, and I can't understand it. Well, as I said, here's to crime. We dallied at the bar for a few more moments. Then Jeff informed me that lunch was ready and Rembrandt and I ate. We managed to duck the Duchess. I don't think I could have taken her with food. After lunch, Lawrence showed me to my cabin. It was, as he said, delightful with a warming flame in the fireplace. It was cheery and comfy and I felt completely at home. Lawrence left to talk to Rembrandt. They were going to discuss the pictures he wanted taken. I felt like going riding, so I changed into my jeans and started to leave. But as I did... <gasps> oh, sorry, Miss Matson. I didn't mean to frighten you. <laughs> You did, Jim. Oh, I was just about to knock when you opened the door. Oh, that's okay. Was there something you wanted? Well, you're in riding clothes, and that answers my question. The question being? Well, were you going riding? <laughs> you see, the boss wanted to know if you were going riding, and if so, did you want some company? I usually show the guests around the acres. Well, yes, that'd be wonderful. And uh, how long do you want to be out, Miss Matson? About three hours or so. Sure. In that case, we'll take the deluxe tour over across the back 60 and up through Manzanita Canyon. You know, when we get up to the top of Iron Mountain, you can see the whole valley of the moon. That's for me, Jeff. Let's hit the leather. 
Jeff was obviously born to the saddle and came into this world teething on a tether rein. You couldn't tell where the horse left off, and Jeff began, a real rider. We nosed out through the clump of ranch buildings and on into open space. I had a fine horse under me, and I really felt like I was living. We'd been riding about an hour when we came across a little stream. Jeff indicated we should stop and water the horses. How long have you been a cowboy, Jeff? Oh, about as long as I can remember. Around here? No, up around Montana. Then little by little, I gradually drifted further west. Hit upon the Valley of the Moon about five years ago. Fell in love with it. I've been here ever since. Reckon I'll stay here, too. No, I don't blame you. Excuse me if I seem to be full of questions, Jeff. Well, that's what I'm here for, ma'am. Good. Because I've got a couple more. What's up that little draw there on the other side of the creek? Mm, nothing but a tangle of manzanita. Scrub oak and brush. Pretty hard to get through there, hmm? Hard. It's impossible. Well, I've seen chipmunks get fouled up in that draw. Uh-huh. Then how come those boot prints are going right up there? Boot prints? I don't see any. Well, hey, you're right. Either boot prints are the result of shoes with Cuban heels. Well, now, there's a strange one. Exactly what I thought, too. Say, you know, something just dawned on me. Matson. Didn't I see your pictures in the Frisco papers a couple of weeks back? San Francisco. Big pardon. San Francisco. Oh, yeah, San Francisco. Excuse me. Well, sure. You know, the way you was asking those questions just now, <laughs> it hit me. You're a detective. I'm afraid you got me, partner. Uh oh, wait a minute, Miss oh. Matson. Listen. Let's duck, Jeff. Too late now. What the? Well, who there? What are you doing over this way, Jeff? Hi, boss. Well, sir, you give us quite a little start. You haven't answered my question. Oh, we just stopped to wallow the horses, Mr. Lawrence. Miss Matson here is a mighty fine rider. She wanted to make the big circle of the ring. Well, you certainly picked a fine time to do it. Whoa. The sheriff's posse is out around this way. You're liable to get shot. Now get back to the ranch, pronto. Just a moment, Mr. Lawrence. You've been uncivil ever since I got here, and I don't like to be dictated to. It's like being on board ship, Miss Matson. The captain is the law. I'm the owner of this property, and you'll do as I say. Now get moving, both of you. And if you don't like my attitude, you can leave any time you want. Leave? Now? Yes. Oh, no, Mr. Lawrence. I'm beginning to find your ranch extremely interesting. <laughs> Jeff and I wheeled our horses about and sifted back to the ranch house. I looked back a couple of times, but there was no sign of Lawrence. I was mad, and Jeff must have sensed it because he was smart enough to keep his mouth closed. As I dismounted at the stables and headed for the house, he waved me a forlorn adios and disappeared. Just as I went through the door, I was greeted by Rembrandt. Oh, there you are, Doug. I was about to institute a searching party for you. Oh, I was safe enough until I gained the grips with a thing called my own temper. What have you been doing, Ducky? I've had a most delightful afternoon, Candy dear. I've been playing canasta with the Duchess. Canasta? Ooh, you don't know how to play canasta. Well, I know that, and you know it, but I don't think the Duchess does. <laughs> She celebrated each hand with a hefty pull on her bitters. Why'd you manage to make any sense out of the game? Well, that has me puzzled, too. All I'd do is put down some cards, any cards, and she'd congratulate me. Maybe you've got a green thumb for the game. Incidentally, I thought you were going to be taking pictures this afternoon. Called off on account of the law. Hmm? Mr. Lawrence had to ride out into the lone prairie and deliver a phone message to the sheriff. He's making like ghost riders in the sky out there. Do go and change, dear. The smell of horses. Yes, I know. Oh, and incidentally, we're to have a soiree this evening. Two more guests arrived. The cook tells me there's to be a little entertainment after dinner. Good. Around here, anything will be an improvement. I didn't tell Rembrandt I was going to change, so it wasn't a fib when I stayed in my jeans. I went back to the stables, got the boy to rig me another horse, and headed out toward that creek again. I rode faster this time, because I'd noticed something else there besides the footprints. It was a battered ten-gallon hat on the far side of the creek with studded initials J.F. on the crown. But when I got there, the cupboard was bare, but good. Not only was the ten-gallon hat gone, but the boot prints had been completely obliterated. I stayed for another few minutes of study and frustration, and then went back to the ranch. I changed, met Rembrandt, had dinner, and then we relaxed in the living room. Oh, Dove, I'm so full. This outdoor living makes me ravenous. Outdoors? <laughs> I don't think you've stepped out of this building since we got here. Well, then it's the thought of outdoor living that does it. <laughs> oh, they're the new arrivals. All about the fire. Did you meet them? No. 
They look at me as though I might soil their escutcheon, whatever that is. Mm, I can see what you mean. Hi, folks. Do you enjoy, enjoy your dinner? Oh, hello, Jeff. Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, has anybody seen Mr. Lawrence or the Duchess? We haven't seen Lawrence, no. Uh, the Duchess is over there writing a letter. Oh, well, I hope you'll all drop around in about an hour. I'm going to do some singing and a little guitar plucking. Is there anything you don't do, Jeff? No, very little. But none of them too darn good either. Sure, we'll be here, won't we, Rembrandt? What? Oh, yes, I go with three diamonds and a joke card. Jeff left, Rembrandt snoozed, and I threw a wrap around my shoulders and took a stroll around the patio. The air felt good. I went over to my cabin, picked up some cigarettes, and started back. But as I came close to the cabin opposite mine... It was the Duchess. I'd recognize those tones and groans anywhere. Duchess? Yes? This is Candy Matson. Are, are, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Touch of indigestion, I should imagine. Oh, is there anything I can do? Or can I get you something? Oh, what a dear thing you are. No, I'll be all right. I have these attacks all the time. You run along and enjoy yourself. Jeff is going to sing. He's such a dear boy. But you're sure you'll be okay? Yes. Yes, dear. You go along. Oh, here. Now, let me put a blanket over you. Oh. Here, and take off your shoes. You'll be ever so much more comfortable. Oh, you're so sweet. So pretty. You remind me of myself when I was young. Thank you. Thank you so much. I tucked the old girl in and left her to dream of the past and went back to the ranch house. Jeff was just pulling up a chair in front of the fireplace. Well, you'll have to understand, folks, I'm not a singer. I don't pretend to be. I just warble along the way I feel. Now, is there any particular kind of cowboy tune you'd like to hear? No, Jeff. Why don't you just sing a favorite of yours? Good idea. Just do what comes naturally. Okay, you asked for it. Let's see, here's one I think you might like. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie Where the coyotes howl And the wind blows free in a narrow grave, just sit by three. But Barry. Oh, hi, boss. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go right on with what you were doing. No, Mr. Lawrence. You arrived just in time. The entertainment's over. What? What are you talking about, Miss Matson? I said the show's over. Is the sheriff around? Yes, he and his men are outside. They're just leaving for the night. You better call him back right now. The Duchess is dead in her cabin. What? Poisoned. Wait a minute. Sheriff! Sheriff Hop! Is that you, Lord? That's right. Can you and your men come back for a spell? Seems we have more trouble. Okay. We'll be over as soon as we tie up the horse. Now then, what's this all about? Well, I could tell you, Lawrence, but I think it'd be more proper coming from the star himself. Don't you think so, Jeff? <laughs> Looks like this is it, doesn't it? You know, you're smart, Miss Matson. Like they say in that ad, never underestimate the power of a woman. That's right. That letter the Duchess wrote proves your point. What? How'd you get hold of that letter? I thought I... Oh, <laughs> she wrote a duplicate. Is that it? Like you say, never underestimate the power of a woman. Wait a moment. I don't understand what's going on here. Go ahead, Miss Matson. You tell me. Looks like I'm not the star any longer. Well, Lawrence, up to about two weeks ago, you had as nice and gentle a cowfolk working for you as there ever was. Then the Duchess arrived. She wasn't kidding when she claimed to have mingled with nobility, important people. As a matter of fact, she had an inside tip about your ranch and the one next door, Ferguson's place, Glen Valley. Didn't you receive a fantastic offer for your property from a big wine company just recently, Lawrence? Why, yes, I did. So did Ferguson. They were going to merge the two places and make it one of the world's largest vineyards. I didn't know about that part of it. But the Duchess did. She wanted in on the ground floor. That's why she came out here. She tried, tried to talk business with Ferguson, but he'd have none of it. So in one of her boozy moments, she 
hit upon the idea of doing away with Ferguson. But she didn't have the nerve to go through with it. That's when she approached Jeff here and cut him in on the deal. Jeff was tired of the poor but honest cowboy routine, saw a chance to make some heavy sugar, and went along with the gag. Right, Jeff? She's got it straight so far, boss. Jeff, I, I can't believe my ears. Oh, that's nothing. Just wait a while. Jeff and the Duchess were out riding one afternoon when, by chance, Ferguson rode up, too, just where the boundaries of the two ranches meet. While the Duchess talked to Ferguson, Jeff sneaked around and back and bashed in his head. They hauled him up to that draw where you bumped into us this afternoon. I know now why you ordered us out of there. On the other side of that snarl of brush and manzanita, there's a quicksand pit. That is now Ferguson's permanent residence. This is terrible. Terrible. In the hurry to dispose of your late neighbor, they left shoe prints along the bank of the creek. And they also overlooked Ferguson's hat with his initials on it. I'm mighty glad you came by when you did, Laura. After I had noticed the boot prints, I... I think Jeff was going to dump me into the quicksand, too. <laughs> You're right again. After the boss sent us back in, I sort of figured it'd get to you tonight instead. And then, Lawrence, you were going to be next. Because in your will, you would name Jeff as your sole heir. Is that right? That, that's right. I, I love him like a son. Then the Duchess and Jeff could have swung a hard bargain with that wine outfit. All very smooth, except for one thing. One thing? I'm kind of curious about that one thing, Miss Matson. Alcohol, Jeff. It's not only lifting to begin with, but also acts as a depressing agent. The Duchess had been imbibing all day, and after dinner she arrived at that point of depression, realized what a horrible thing she had done, and she wrote the full story about the wine company and Jeff's duplicity and made a copy. You were afraid of that yourself, Jeff. That's when you went out and slipped the old girl a lethal Mickey. I heard her groaning and went in to investigate. She said it was indigestion, but I knew differently. Her breath. And I knew, too, that she'd be dead within five minutes. Then I saw her shoes. Cuban heels with mud caked on the inner side of the arch. That's when I had a hunch the letter she was writing had a definite meaning. You overlooked it, Jeff. I found it. Where only a woman would think of looking. Tucked inside her bosom. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lauren. I had you figured wrong from the start. I was the one who was wrong. You aren't hard at all. You're soft as putty. <laughs> well, Jeff, here comes the sheriff. Yeah, so I see. Well, I'm ready for him. You can't beat a royal flush with a pair of deuces. Or should I say, dunces. Ah, oh, go, there won't be any fuss. And all of a sudden, it dawns on me. People should accept their luck. If you're born to be a cowboy, just stay a cowboy. And if you're born a millionaire, don't fight that either. Well, goodbye, Miss Matson. And I'm glad the boss happened along when he did, because I don't think quicksand would look good on you. Like Jeff said, he went quietly. No trouble. Too bad he wasn't content to be just a ranch hand, simple and unspoiled. Because as Rembrandt had noticed, he did have wonderful shoulders. He played the guitar, he sang, and he made fine old fashions. All in all, a very nice guy, except for two vices. Hitting from the behind and poisoning. The Valley of the Moon? Oh, I'll go back. It's lovely. After all, one man with a snarl brain can't undo the work of the original master painter. Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Helen Klebe as the Duchess, Lou Tobin as Lawrence, and Clancy Hayes as Jeff. Henry Leff as Inspector Mallard and Jack Thomas as Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, and any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. <laughs> Hello, 
Joe Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Just a moment. People can barge in on you at the... Now, where is that? Oh. Oh, that's better than nothing. Wait a second. Hi, Candy. Well, Mallard, my favorite foot flat. You caught me at the wrong time. Depends on your viewpoint. Shall I leave? No, no, come on in. What brings you up to Telegraph Hill, Mallard, dear? You. An interesting subject. Care for a drink? No, I'm on duty. You mean I'm being honored with an official call? Sort of. In that case, you can leave. No, seriously, Candy. Uh, you can help me, if you will. Well, the mountain coming to the mountain. Oh, you're not so large. Now you can leave. Only kidding. Uh, here's a pitch. An acquaintance of mine, Gordon Ayers, has a little problem on his hands. He needs your help. What is this? Oh, don't get excited, Candy. He's an insurance adjuster for an aviation outfit here in San Francisco. A couple of months ago, a guy and his wife took off in a private plane from one of those little airports down the peninsula and crashed. She burned to death. Ayers investigated and okayed the claim, a rather fancy amount. But his company doesn't like it. They don't think the crash was legit. It gets interesting. Well, he has to prove he was right. He came to me, he wanted us to verify the facts. But we're the San Francisco police, and that's out of our jurisdiction. So? So, I mentioned you. Oh, he wants to meet you and have a little talk. If you can get the guy out of the soup, there's a nice little hunk of cabbage in it for you. Mallard, I'll take it, but there's something phony. Well, how do you mean, Kenny? This is the first time you've ever given me a helping hand in my private eyeing. Could be there's a reason. Could be a reason why I'm going to take the case, too. Must be the rabbit in me. I love to nibble on large hunks of cabbage. <laughs> Do you recall the lyrics from that old song, the one that goes, He floats through the air with the greatest of ease? Well, that's what happened to Candy Matson, one of San Francisco's better-known private investigators. She found herself floating through the air all right, but not with the greatest of ease. As a matter of fact, it was one of the most hair-raising experiences this pert little gal detective ever ran into. Well, why go on about it? Here she is to tell you about it herself. Well, that's the way it started. Inspector Ray Mallard, an old friend of mine, and that's all I can call him, darn it, an old friend of mine, dropped by and insisted I meet this Gordon Ayers, an aviation insurance adjuster. Two things induced me to take the deal, Mallard's big spaniel-like eyes and the money angle. It was right after Christmas, and I was a bit short. Mallard left, and I took the slip of paper he'd given me with Ayers' phone number on it, sat down by Amici's pet aversion, and doodled with the dial. Afternoon, Pacific Seaboard Fidelity. How do you do? Is there a Mr. Gordon Ayers there? Speaking. Well, Inspector Mallard suggested I call you Mr. Mr. Ayers. This is Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson, yes. Happy to know you. Uh, I imagine Mallard explained my dilemma. Not in detail, no. Well, uh, the situation is quite complicated. I was wondering if we could meet and discuss it at length. Uh, can we get together this afternoon? If you say so, yes. Uh, time is of the utmost importance, Miss Matson. All right, you call it, Mr. Ayers. Splendid. I'm just leaving the office now. I have an appointment down the peninsula in an hour. Uh, do you have a car? Yes, I do. Uh, could you meet me at the San Mateo Airport? Cranston Flying Service. That's okay. Uh, about an hour and a half? Hour and a half. Fine. Goodbye, Miss Batson. This I didn't like. Already I was money in the hole. San Mateo Airport. Right on the water next to Bay Meadows, separated by the highway and a couple of salt marshes. Why should I have to meet the guy down there? Oh, me. Well, I drove down to the San Mateo airport, found the, found the Cranston Flying Service building, and got out of the car and waited. It was a nice afternoon, so I stood watching some of the planes take off and land. Uh, pardon me, uh, you, uh, you aren't by any chance... Oh, no, of course not. No, I'm not by any chance. I'm Candy Matson. Are you Mr. Ayers? That's right. I didn't expect anyone quite so young. 
Well, did, did you want to talk, Mr. Ayers, or just stand there like a sea bass out of water? Oh, uh, pardon me. I want to talk, of course. Uh, by the way, have you ever flown? On commercial airlines, many times. Why? Uh, would you like to take a little hop this afternoon? Hmm? Well, what's that got to do with why I'm here? Plenty. It'll give you a picture of what I'm up against. In what do we fly, and who's going to be our guiding angel? Well, we'll probably fly in that Cessna over there, and I shall do the piloting. Well, I don't know. Have you been flying long? <laughs> About 20 years. Oh. And I also flew for Uncle Sam in the late mess over Germany. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Good. Let's go into the office. <laughs> Mother told me there would be days like this. Candy, she used to say, never leave the house without your parachute. <laughs> We slipped through some prop wash, and I displayed a bit of silk that didn't belong to a parachute. Then into the building that housed the Cranston office. It was typical. A glass-topped counter with various flying trophies hung about the walls. Old propellers, silver cups, pictures of planes, and assorted certificates. Ayers plopped his wallet on the counter, and the chap proceeded to check him out. We went out onto the field and climbed into the plane. Then Ayers gunned the motor, and we were taking off. This is all very cozy, Mr. Ayers, but what's the idea? There's a very definite reason for it, Miss Matson. Uh, see that tower down there? Mm-hmm. No, no, down there toward Redwood City. Oh, yes, I see it. Oh, that's where we're going. About a mile east of that, there's a private airport run by a man named Folger. We're going to simulate a landing at that field. Well, I'm still not with it. I want you to notice all the physical qualities of that field as we come in for a landing. Notice the boundaries, the hazards, and the amount of free space a plane has. Especially a light plane. You make me feel like a latter-day Nellie Bly. Okay, Mr. Ayers, let's go. I'll watch. Fascinated as I am by flying, I started looking around. The lower end of the bay on our left, the skyline to our right, and the bustling peninsula directly beneath us. I was shocked out of my reverie when the plane turned on its side and we cut sharply to our right and out over the bay. I thought Ayers had lost control of the ship, but no, it was just a routine bank. Then another bank right, and we were nosing in toward an airfield down and in front of us. Did I startle you? (laughs) A little. It's all right now that I know we're not playing tag with gravity. I'm going to cut the throttle now and nose in for a fake landing. I'm glad you told me. I'll know how to behave. Keep your eyes open, Miss Matson. Do you see any high-tension lines around the airport? No. Any fences, highways, or any other obstructions? No, no, I don't. Now, look, this is a normal landing. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, if I were to sit the plane down here, I'd be about a mile from the waterfront. Then if I let the plane taxi the usual amount, I'd be up by those hangars. Any problems about that? None that I can see at the moment. Now, look carefully. You see anything at all? Anything? No. If I didn't know better, I'd say we were in the Sahara. Okay, then I'm going to give it the gun. Without the wheels touching the ground, we were climbing into the sky again and back toward the San Mateo airport. In less than minutes, Ayers brought the plane in for a neat landing, and we were over a very dry martini in a little spot in Burlingame. Okay, we've played charades long enough, Mr. Ayers. Cut me in on the plot. It's merely this. The man who owns that airport, Folger, was out flying with his wife one afternoon. Brand new plane. They came in for a normal landing. Just as we did. As far as I could figure out, the plane nosed over and caught fire. He escaped. His wife didn't. As the adjuster on the case, I voted straight accident and asked my company to pay the claim. They didn't like the idea. Well, you know how insurance companies are, Miss Matson. Naturally, they have to be suspicious. But in this case, their fears are groundless. Mm-hmm. What about Folger? Where is he now? Still running the airport. Now, let's get down to cases, Mr. Ayers. Just why did I get the free plane ride this afternoon? Well, I've known your friend Mallard for some time. I wanted him to sign this affidavit saying the field is perfectly safe for normal flying. He wouldn't do it. Naturally. Naturally, being with the San Francisco police. Then he suggested you... I have to have some licensed representative of the law's signature in order to clear my neck with my company. Here, you saw for yourself. You sign it? Whoa there, boy. Wait a minute. Feather your prop. 
You, uh, you mean you won't sign it? I didn't say that. But I don't sign anything until I read the fine print, not even for my pal Mallard. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave now, after I have another olive and what goes with it. And then I'm going home. I'll call you tomorrow afternoon sometime. What, Miss Matson? Don't you... start to argue, Mr. Ayers. After my second olive, I get very stubborn. This got wilder by the moment. I was supposed to sign an affidavit clearing this joker on the basis of a 30-second buzz over a cow pasture. But oh no. I wasn't going to get caught with my flaps down, not for Mallard or anybody. I drove home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, dished up a warm tub, some warm soup, and then some warm blankets, and blacked out for the night. In the morning, I drove over to California Street near Old St. Mary's. I wanted to see a good luck piece of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt's a photographer and tops in his profession now that he's not supplying the rent for all the bistros on the Barbary Coast. Candy, my lily, greetings. Uh, you know, if I was a G.I., I'd slug you for that. How are you, Rembrandt? Strictly, je suis très bon. I... That's French. Well, that's your opinion. And that's English. Oh, dove. You look as well scrubbed as Mount Diablo after a rainfall. <laughs> There's a romantic parallel. What brings you about on this lovely day? This lovely day. How would you like to go for a little drive, Ducky? Let's see. I was supposed to have tea with Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman. But he'll understand. Yes, I'd love it. Where are we going and why? San Mateo. And for why, I don't know. Well, that's San Mateo for you. <laughs> Anyone else going with us? No, just the two of us. Oh, good. Then I shan't have to ride in the tunnel. Wait just a moment, Dove. Whilst I toss Henry me great day in a brisket or two, and I'll be right with you. <laughs> Rembrandt fed his monster. We piled into the car and whooshed off to San Mateo. On the way down, I tried to plot a course of action. It wasn't easy. As my friend Ayers had said, the field was free from flaws, and where do you go from there? I was soon to find out. Is this our destination, Duff? That's right. Arid little spot, what? Yes. Reminds me of the recruiting posters I used to see for the Foreign Legion. Come on, Rembrandt. I want to see something. What, dear? The other side of this hangar over here. What's over there? The burnt fuselage of a plane. You can't be, girl. Your sense of the macabre knows no bounds. Can't help it. This is business. Is that the one? I should imagine so. Hmm. Quite a mess, isn't it? Ooh, what a horrible way to go. Look it over, Rembrandt. Anything strike you as strange? Wait a moment. Yes. Why are there tattered pieces of fabric on this side of the plane and on the other, nothing but melted steel frame? Good point, Laddie Buck. And another thing. Look inside the cabin there. The safety belt on the other side. Intact. So it is. And I should sign affidavits yet. Wait till I see that mallard. Pardon me. Was there something oh. you wanted? Oh, how do you do? I don't like his looks, dear. Did you want a ride? Is that why you're here? We have cubs, Cessnas, just about anything. No, no, nothing like that. Then, uh, what is it? I happen to own this airport, and I don't like people poking about. But the owner? Well, then you must be Mr. Folger. Why, uh, yes. That's right. Who are you? Santa Claus. A little late. Come on, Mr. Folger. Let's go into your office. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Folger led the way, and we went into a little Quonset hut type of building that served as the airport office. There were no trophies here, nothing but bareness. On one side was a pot-bellied stove, and on the other a mangy-looking parrot inside a cage. Folger motioned us to a couple of firehouse chairs and sat down himself in one that swiveled. Now then, what's this all about? I'm Candy Matson. This is my friend, Mr. Watson. I see. I'll be frank with you, Mr. Folger. I'm working with a Mr. Gordon Ayers of the Pacific Seaboard Fidelity Company. What? That's right. And they're holding up payment of your claim until Ayers can get a signed affidavit verifying his judgment. Oh, Fidelity! What in the oh, world? Pay no attention, Miss Matson. That fool parrot picks up anything you say. I must admit this is somewhat of a shock. I thought it would be. Now, is there anything you can do to help me? Pictures, diagrams, anything like that? Yes, I have a complete file, including a newspaper photograph of the crash itself. May I see them? Ah, uh, newspaper! Crash! 
quiet, you idiot. Quiet, you idiot. Quiet, you idiot. Quiet. Yes, you may see them. I keep them in my apartment in the city. If you'd uh, care to drop by this evening, I'll show them to you. Good. Supposing you give me a call when you get in town. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Mm, I'll write that down. Candy Matson, Candy Matson. That's right, Polly. NC 98012. I said quiet. Oh, someday I'll wring that blasted bird's neck. The only reason I keep her around is because she belonged to my wife. There. I'll call you this evening, Miss Matson. <laughs> We left the place, got in the car, drove back down the road, and ducked into a little clump of trees, well hidden. Rembrandt looked at me as though I was losing my mind. But in about ten minutes, we heard the sound of a car coming from the airport. It roared past us, and at the wheel was Folger. That's all I wanted. I whipped us back to the Quonset hut, fully expecting the place to be locked tighter than a drum, but it wasn't. The door was wide open. What's the idea, Candy? I'm not sure, Rembrandt. It's just a hunch. That open door, though, means we're going to have to work fast. Work fast? At what? My telephone number is Yukon, not NC something or other. I have a sneaking idea that somewhere in back in the dim recesses of that parrot's memory, I can get a key to this whole thing. Now, hello, Polly. Pretty Polly. Give me a pencil, Rembrandt. Pencil? Here. Thanks. Pretty Polly. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Pretty Polly. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Candy Matson, Candy Matson. NC, NC. NC, 98012. 98012, that's it. Thanks, Polly. Come on, Rembrandt, let's get gone with the wind. I left Rembrandt off at Diogenes Murphy's place on Van Ness Avenue and drove downtown. I ran into a present-day miracle by finding a place to park then took the elevator up to the offices of the Pacific Seaboard Fidelity Company. I spotted Ayers' office and walked in. Well, Miss Matson, sit down, sit down. You're as good as your word. Thanks. Got anything for me? I may have, but first I want to know if you've got anything for me. Some little piece of information you've been holding out, from your own company, for instance. I don't quite understand you, Miss Matson. I'll come to the point, then. How in the name of Kitty Hawk could you p- honestly pay a claim on that wreck at Folgers Airport? The plane was obviously burned only on one side, the passengers. And also, the passenger's safety belt was still intact, tightly fastened. <laughs> You're a suspicious little thing, aren't you? Well, I'm like the insurance companies. I made the same mistake myself. That fuselage you saw was a training plane. It cracked up on a routine flight. No one hurt. The plane in which Mrs. Folger was killed was sold for scrap a week after my formal investigation. Oh, well... Looks like I pulled the trigger on the wrong target. Oh, well, that's all right. As I said, I made the same mistake myself. However, I don't think it was advisable for you to go down there without consulting me first. Oh? Folger called me on the phone right after you left. You've given him a fine case of the jitters. Look, Mr. Ayers, I operate in my own manner. If I saw reason to give Folger's cow pasture the once over, that's as it should be. And if that isn't agreeable to you, you can get another boy or, or girl. Oh, now, now, wait a moment. I'm sorry. No, no, you continue doing as you are. Good. Naturally, you want to be thorough about this thing, and I can't blame you. Right. Uh, now then, what's the next step, Miss Matson? I... Well, offhand, I really don't know. I'll call you first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, fine. I knew what the next step was, but I wasn't telling heirs or anybody. This was more than just working for a commission. I felt I was on to something now, and I was going to follow through. I called a friend of mine at an aviation insurance brokerage and got enough night work to keep me going until next St. Swithin's Day. I took my material home and started in. It was a history of every fatal plane crash in the United States for the past ten years. About eleven, I fixed some coffee. About two, I started to nod. Pinched my cheeks and snapped out of it. About four, I had some more coffee. Then at seven, just as the sky dawned, red streaked across the bay... I found what I wanted, exactly what I wanted. It didn't tie together yet, not all of it, but the knot was now begun. It only needed a little tightening. I stretched out on the couch, set the alarm for nine, and woke up right on schedule. Once again, I got airs on the phone. Pacific Seaboard Fidelity, Air speaking. Good morning, Mr. Ayers, Candy Matson. Oh, good morning, Miss Matson. How do things look? Well, if you're referring to me, awful. I've been up all night. By the way, I wonder if we could make that flight again. Flight? Yes, over Folgers Airport. 
Only this time, I'd like to make an actual landing. Oh, why, sure, that can be arranged. And I'd like Folger to come with us. I want him to describe just what happened as we go along. Oh, well, yes. Uh, this morning okay? The sooner the better. I'll call him right now, have him get a plane ready. I'll uh, meet you there about noon. <laughs> Now I had to work fast. I called Mallard, explained the situation, and he agreed to get one of his radio technicians and come along with me. We drove back down the peninsula, and I left them both at Cranston's flying service where they went to work. Then I continued to Folger's airport. It was a little before noon, and Folger had the ship out on the runway warming it up. Hi there, Mr. Folger. Seen anything of airs? Yeah, he's in the office. He'll be right out. Come on, you can get in. Okay. Here comes Ayers now. Here, let me give you a hand. Mm -hmm. You can sit up front, and I'll sit back here. All right. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Right on time, I see, Miss Matson. Yes. Got the plane gas, Folger? Yeah, I'll sit. Well, I guess we can take off. Here we go. then, Miss Matson, What's your plan? Just do what we did before. Circle out over the bay and come in for a normal landing. Okay. I'll bank her here. Fine. Now, is there any way for Folger to take the wheel? I... I beg your pardon? I said, is there any way for Folger to take the wheel? Oh, why, no, I don't think so. He's back there. That's because he can't fly, isn't that right? Isn't that right, Folger? What? What's she talking about, Ayers? I don't know. She must be out of her head. But I'm not taking any chances with her. I'm going to set the ship down right now. The way you set it down with Folger's wife in it? So she burned beyond recognition? Why, you... I can get the whole story, Ayers. Look at Folger, white as a sheet. He's ready to talk right now, aren't you, Folger? Yes. I'll talk. I'll tell everything. Including the story about the same kind of crash in Toledo, Ohio? All right, you two, don't move. I assure you this gun is very deadly. You, Folger, open the starboard door. Go on, open it. Gordon, you don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. And neither one of you are going to live to tell about it. Go on, Folger, get up by the door. Go on. God, please don't do it. What a fine rat you are, Ayers. You're next, Miss Matson. Just a little too darn smart for your own good, aren't you? I should have known better than to try to use a dame for the fall guy. Go on, stand up by the cabin door. Sure. Okay. I'll stand up by the cabin door. Oh. Oh. Well, Candy Girl, let's see you get yourself out of this one. I hope Mallard's still listening to this mic. Mallard. Mallard, you big dumb cop, can you hear me? I can hear you, Candy. What's wrong? I had to tap airs over the head. What do I do now? I don't know how to fly this thing. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I'll put Cranston on. Mr. Manson, listen carefully. Take the wheel and hold it in the middle. Get your nose up a little. That's it. How am I doing? Fine. Now look down at the horizontal bar at your feet. Press the left one ever so slightly and turn the wheel left at the same time. Like this? Keep your nose up. Up. So it's just above the horizon. That's it. Keep it there. Better. Now straighten both the bar and the wheel. Slowly. Slowly. I've got it. Now you're headed towards San Mateo Airport. Now try to drift off to your right a little, using the opposite technique. Better? You're doing fine. Hang on, Candy, you're going great. Now look for the protruding gadget on the right side of the dashboard. Mark throttle. Push it in about a third of the way. I'm falling. Mallard, I'm falling. No, you're not. Just do as I say. You're coming in for a landing. 
Now, don't move the wheel or the bars until I tell you to. Well, the ground's coming up awfully fast. You're coming in just right. Now, ready? Pull back the wheel just a little. No, not too much. That's it. Okay, gal. Right her on in. Now, quick. Kill your ignition. Kill it. Turn off the key. Candy, you made it. Candy, I said... Come on, crash, and let's get out to that plane. All right, kid? Yeah. My knees feel like I did the conga from here to L.A., but otherwise I'm all right. Uh, the boys will take care of theirs. Come on, we've got a report to make. Report? Sure. I sicked you on to this airs guy purposely. What? Sam and Teo didn't want to scare the guy off until they solved the case, so we cut you in on the deal without you knowing it. Candy, you did it. We've got a recording of the whole thing made over the plane's radio. Congratulations, Candy. You'll get a nice hunk of dough for this. Nice hunk of dough of all the dirty tricks. Mallard, you... I... Oh, what's the use? I can't bawl you out now. I'm airsick. It was a very slick deal. Ayers was a top-notch insurance boy. About five years ago, he met up with Folger. This was in Toledo, Ohio. Folger was married to a very wealthy gal, but couldn't get his hands on any of the money. Ayers hit upon a pretty little method of mayhem back there. He took out a license plate under Folger's name, fireproofed his half of the plane, also the passenger's safety belt. Then one fine day, he came in for a landing, deliberately pancaked the ship, left the motor running, and let the crate burn, with Folger's wife in it. They collected plenty... In those days, they had the names of Smith and Jones or something like that. And Ayers was the insurance adjuster. They moved on to California, took the names of Ayers and Folger, and set about to do an encore on the same old act. Folger met another wealthy gal, married her, and set himself up in the airport business. Ayers got himself a job with a San Francisco insurance outfit, and voila, they were ready for another crack-up. My suspicions were first lit up when I saw Ayers' face. He had more scars and stitches than a well-seasoned hockey player. And that broken-up fuselage behind Folger's airport, that was another giveaway. It was a test model they'd used to make sure their plans were all set. But the real giveaway was the parrot. What a memory. NC-98012 was the license number of the plane that crashed in Toledo, killing Folger's first wife. The parrot was also her pet, and Folger had kept it for sentimental reasons. He shouldn't ought to have done it, though. Because through the parrot, I traced the whole thing. It was a nice one-time racket, but they should have quit before the police tripped them up. Oh, yes, Ayers was convicted. And Pacific Seaboard Fidelity rewarded me quite handsomely. But that mallard, deliberately using me for bait. <laughs> I got even with him, though. I made him take me deep sea fishing about a week later. Oh, did he get sick. Seasick. And I just stood there and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Lou Tobin as Ayers, Harry Beckville as Folger, and Jack Cahill as Cranston. Henry Leff as Inspector Ray Mallard and Jack Thomas plays the part of Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The 
National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Hello? Oh, girl, this is Rembrandt. I've been trying to get in touch with you for the last three days. I've been smog-bound. What? I've been visiting an aunt of mine in Los Angeles, Ducky. A fate worse than death. <laughs> However, I am glad to know you're back. How are you feeling for long hair music, Dove? Mm, I can take it or leave it. Why? In this case, I hope you can take it. Ever hear of a gentleman named Eric Spaulding? The noted English symphony conductor? Oh, of course. I used to know him in London. He's here to conduct a series of concerts. Bully for him. I know where I can get him a baton wholesale. He needs more than a baton, Candy, dear. He needs help. That's why I'm calling you. What's he want me to do, look for the lost chord? You don't know how close to being right you are, girl. Anyway, he's going to drop by me place this evening. I wonder if you could come over, too. Well, I was going to hit the prone position early tonight, but if you really want me to be there, I'll do it. Splendid, Candy. Come for dinner, won't you? I just bought a new chafing dish, and I'm whipping up a tasty scraping of pasta rasson. Well, how interesting. It is. It's spaghetti a la Watson. <laughs> Candy Matson, the girl all San Francisco claims to know personally. That's because she hits the front pages of the newspapers more often than the Three Bridges. Gate, who came in late, Candy makes a tidy little living by minding her own business. The business being one of private investigation. Take this deal with Rembrandt Watson and Eric Spaulding. It sounded innocent enough to start with. The clue here, a corpse there can make a very interesting story. One that Candy Matson can tell you about herself right now. <laughs> What did the man say? A clue here, a corpse there? Well, he's almost right. The corpse came first, the clue later. I also ran across the most ingenious device ever dreamed up to cause a man to lose his job. And I managed to get a little culture on me, whether I wanted it or not. Because in the course of this little deal, I got better acquainted with Mozart, Brahms, Beethoven, even Cachetorian. Bless you. It all began by accepting Rembrandt's invitation that night for dinner and a meeting with Eric Spaulding. For the sake of the musician, I climbed into a gown that made music as I walked. It was cut trimly on the grace notes and called for a reprise every other bar. Then I put on my coda and went over to Rembrandt's place on California Street opposite old St. Mary's. Candy girl... Welcome to Maynard Hill, Lamasetti. Thank you, dear. Come in, come in. Breathtaking. Positively breathtaking. Thank you. You look gorgeous in that, uh, what is it, Candy? If you just stop and consider the thousands of man hours put in by little worms all over mulberry bushes, you wouldn't ask that question. Oh, silk. Mm hmm. Where's the maestro? Oh, Eric hasn't arrived yet. He'll be here shortly. What's his problem, Ducky? I haven't the slightest idea, but he seems terribly upset. His worry seems to concern itself with his concert tomorrow night at the opera house. These boys with the long hair and coattails to match, they're always worrying. I don't know how most of them manage to live so long. Oh, help yourself to the port, dear. I had some hors d'oeuvre, but Henry, my great Dane, beat us to them. Henry, heavens. I haven't seen him in ages. How is he, dear? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Candy. He's missed you terribly. I'll let him in for just a moment. Oh, no, 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 Rembrandt, I, I didn't mean that. He's missed you so, dear. Oh, Oh, Rembrandt, he's charging me. No, Henry, no. Oh, Rembrandt, help. He's got his paws all over my prow. Isn't that sweet? Such devotion. Candy adores you. Well, tell him to do his adulation from the floor with all four paws on it. Quick, Rembrandt, I'm becoming pigeon chest. What a beautiful picture. Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, Henry, down, sir. This instant. There we are. Now I know how that mud shoal in Chesapeake Bay felt when the big mole landed on it. Into the kitchen, Henry. Back to your side of beef. That's the lad. Oh, that must be Eric. Or another great Dane. Eric, dear boy, do come in. Thank you. Ah, what a charming place, Rembrandt. So bohemian. That's one word for it. Personally, I call it cluttered. Candy, dear, may I present Eric Spaulding, Eric Candy Madsen. How do you do? Really quite an honor, Mr. Spaulding. I've heard many of your European recordings. Is that a fact? Yes, I had a very good orchestra in London. Nice chaps all. Played well together. I used to know the producer on the Standard Hour. That way I became quite familiar with the playing of the San Francisco Orchestra. How do the two compare, Mr. Spaulding? That's like trying to compare the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. 
Both large bodies of water, but entirely different in characteristics. However, I feel the San Francisco organization would rate among the best in the world, with the proper conducting. And you feel you can give it the proper conducting? Most certainly. Mm, I see. Why don't you tell Candy about your innovation in music, Eric? I'm sure she'd be greatly interested. Oh, yes, I'm surely. It's nothing more nor less than applied showmanship, Miss Matson. I've always had the firm belief that music should paint a mental picture. I imagine the composers did, too. So I've made it a point to always include one number in my concerts where we play in fluorescent lighting. Oh, yes, I recall reading an article in Life about that. I've been severely criticized for it. I conduct with an illuminated baton. To me, the musical message is much better presented in that manner. The audience sits in the dark. It has a chance to interpret what the composer intended saying. Hmm, could be. I've been accused of everything from cheap theatricals to degrading the concert stage. But I'm sticking with it. I'm convinced the public appreciates what I'm trying to do. Uh, Rembrandt tells me you're bothered about something, Mr. Spaulding. Yes, I am. I'm an artiste, Miss Matson. I know only one thing, music. That's why I wish to speak to someone in uh, your line, investigating and that sort of thing. That sort of thing leads to money. I know. And I'll be very glad to retain you, if you can help me find out what I want to know. And that would be? Someone is trying to sabotage me, Miss Matson. The San Francisco concerts are critical stepping stones in my career. I've given two concerts, each time during the selection where we black out the lights. The orchestra, en masse has hit one foul, rotten chord. Well, didn't you get it straightened out in rehearsal? That's just it. It never happened in rehearsal. I've checked the score afterward. Perfect. I've talked to the orchestra personnel. They're more amazed than I. To say the least, it must be extremely embarrassing at a moment like that. Believe me, words haven't been invented to describe such a feeling of mortification. The audience starts to titter, then laughs. By then, the whole thing has been shot to blazes. My reputation is at stake, Miss Matson. I see what you mean. I thought perhaps with your trained sleuthing instincts, you might be able to help me. My old friend Rembrandt here recommends you highly. Thanks, old friend here. You've got me interested, Mr. Spaulding. When did you say your next performance is? Tomorrow night at the Opera House. Tell you what. I don't know what your contract calls for, but whatever it is, we'll split the fee and I'll go to work for you. What? Why, that's preposterous. Isn't the future of your career worth it, Mr. Spaulding? Why, I... Very well. I think it's outrageous, but what can one do? Okay. Now, when do you rehearse for tomorrow night's concert? Tomorrow morning, at ten o'clock. Very well, I'll be there. Just one word of caution. Pay no attention to me whatsoever. Make like as if I don't even exist. Agreed. Oh, I'm so glad everything's settled. Now we can get to the spaghetti vassal. Me food is practically chafing at the dish. Let's have at the regular stuff, shall we? The spaghetti boisson was magnificent. Rembrandt has the green thumb for taking the most ordinary food, adding a bird's nest or two and a dash of some witch's potion and making it taste like ambrosia. Uh, there was only one drawback. For days after, you walked around like you had a red-hot barbecue pit in your stomach. I stopped off on my way home, bought a chronicle, completed the journey, and piled into bed. Then I read the paper, missed Kane, caught the ruse, glanced at the radio column, and then concentrated on the musical section. There it was, Spalding's concert for the following evening. The first movement from Brahms first, the Fountains of Rome, the Rienzi, so on and so forth, and, and for his blackout selection, Swan Lake. With that, I dozed off. And before I could pick up the remnants of a dream I'd had the night before, it was morning and I was dressing in on my way to the opera house. Just a moment, young lady. You're not with the orchestra. No, no, I'm here on official business for Mr. Spaulding. Oh, sure. Go right on in. I passed through the stage door and onto the stage itself. Just as I did, a little faraway thought started tickling the back regions of my brain. Spaulding, Spaulding. By a strange quirk, there was a gal who plays first flute in the orchestra named Spaulding... I worked my way around to where the musicians were unpacking their instruments. There she was, the gal herself. Hello there. Oh, hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. You don't remember me, do you? I'm Candy Matson. Oh, yes, the young lady detective. You used to drop backstage now and then to the standard broadcast. That's right. Nice to see you again. Thank you. 
What's this I hear about the orchestra falling on its face the last two concerts? It's an amazing thing, Miss Matson. We're at a complete loss of words for an explanation. I understand it's front-page news all over the country. And why not? A thing of this sort is news. Eric's fit to be tied, of course. I can't blame him. Incidentally, I just happen to think, isn't your name Spalding, too? I beg your pardon? I said, isn't your name Spalding, too? Why, yes, it is. We spell it differently, however. Oh, so? Yes. Eric spells his name S-P-A-U-L-D-I-N-G. I have no U in my name. Mm-hmm. You both have a decided British accent. Oh, you think so? I rather thought I'd lost mine. No, hardly. Uh, tell me, do how do the members of the orchestra feel about these numbers played under fluorescent light? Well, it doesn't bother them. They think it's slightly silly, but they don't pay any attention to it. Each conductor has his own little idiosyncrasies. I see. Well, I hope you have a fine rehearsal, Mrs. Spaulding. Miss. Miss Spaulding. Oh, yes. Miss. You, um, you're going to be around for the concert this evening? I believe so. I find it becomes more interesting all the time. Something was phony with the gal, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I tossed it off and decided to think about that angle later. In the meantime, I ducked into a quiet corner of the wings and listened carefully to the whole rehearsal. Then it came time for the blackout number, Swan Lake. It went beautifully, without a hitch. At the finish, Eric mopped his moist brow and spoke to the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You all know what has happened to these particular spots. The rehearsal this morning has gone beautifully. I thank you. I hardly think I need to remind you that tonight's concert will be critical, to say the least. If we repeat what has happened in the past two performances, I shudder to think what will be said of me and you as an organization. Will you all please pay a special attention to the score this evening for my sake, as well as yours? That is all, and again, I thank you. With that, Spaulding dismissed the orchestra. I waited a reasonable length of time, then dropped around to his dressing room. The concertmeister was in with Eric, so I waited. And waited. Finally, he was alone. Or so I thought. Oh, Miss Madsen, uh, come in, come in. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Spaulding. I thought you were by yourself. Oh, a thousand pardons. Uh, Miss Madsen, may I present Waldo Raimondi, my arranger? Mr. Raimondi. A yeah, pleasure indeed. Now, there was something you wanted to talk about, Miss Madsen? No, no. Well, that's all right. I, I'm just pushing off. <laughs> Do that, will you, Waldo? And uh, take care of that second bar after letter K. It should be an A natural. Uh, no, Eric, not an A natural. It should be A flat. Ah, yes, yes, that's right. A flat. Yes. I'm so upset. I well, Take care of it, will you, Waldo? Uh, right -o. I'll see you back at the hotel. Uh, very happy to have met you, Miss Madsen. Also, Mr. Ramondi. Well? Well, yourself. I don't understand. Neither do I. Let's both get with it. Are you acquainted personally with any members of the orchestra here? Oh, in a vague sort of way. How vague would your friendship with the first Plutus be? How did you know about her? I didn't, but now you've told me, almost. What about her? I was hoping this would be kept quiet. She was my wife. I had a hunch it was something like that. Could she have anything to do with your lack of grace notes? No, not Nona. Nona? The former Mrs. Spalding. Well, we've got to start somewhere. She's as good a target as any. I'm afraid you're on the wrong scent, Miss Matson. Nona and I had our differences. We split up. She came to America and joined the orchestra here in San Francisco. She's respected and admired. She wouldn't do anything to jeopardize her musical career, I'm sure. But she might yours. Have you cut up any old capers since you've been here, Mr. Spaulding? No, we haven't spoken. It's an unwritten rule we've both observed. Hmm. This has the same aroma Monterey has during the sardine season. Well, I'll keep plugging away. Good luck on the concert tonight. You need it. The hotel where Spaulding and Company made its headquarters was just a hop, skip, and a jump from the opera house. But I would have looked silly getting there that way, so I drove. A simple question produced results. Waldo Raimondi was in room 1812... 
Before I could ponder whether that was from the overture of the same number, I was there. Come in, please. Oh, hello. Uh, come in, won't you? Thank you. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Oh, no, no, not at all. Seems we have a music lover in our midst. However, don't you think Eric might resent this little visit? Why, you little... Cut it, Ramondi. You're lucky I only slapped your face. I'm here on business only. Get out of here. Not yet, small time. I want to have a little talk with you. Who do you think you are, walking in here and making demands of me? The name is Miss Matson. That doesn't mean anything to you, I'm sure, but I happen to be a private investigator. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't think that... Uh, you will forgive me, won't you? I'll call a meeting of the board and let you know. I've got a couple of questions to ask. Give me the right answers and we'll both save time. Gladly, if I can. How long have you been with Spaulding? Almost uh, 17 years. Did you know that the first flutist here was once his wife? Yes. We don't talk about it. Neither do we talk to her. What about this studied confusion that's occurred during the last two concerts? It's most incredible. None of us can understand it. No, none of us. Doesn't it strike you that a whole symphony orchestra just couldn't possibly go sour unless the whole symphony orchestra had agreed? Or unless the score was wrong. Uh, but that couldn't be it either. Both Eric and I have checked immediately afterward, and that leaves us... Nowhere. Exactly. I have only one further suggestion. And that would be... Get better acquainted with Nona Spaulding. What do you mean by that? You are a private investigator, Miss Madsen. Why not apply the tools of your trade? The whole thing was becoming as simple as hydrogen. Using my cool Sam Spade logic, I decided to do nothing until after the concert that evening. So I went home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, showered and slipped into something movie writers would have described as... comfortable? Then I called Rembrandt on the phone. Rembrandt Watson Studios. This is Candy Matson, Private Eyeball. How delightful. We both got to plug in. Yes. What's on your mind now? You, dear. How would you like to attend the Spaulding concert tonight? No, oh, Candy, I've heard music before. So have I. But this is more or less a command performance. I recognize the command in your voice. Very well. Shall I dress? It's customary, isn't it? I mean, how would you like me? In soup and fish? No, Ducky, I've seen your soup and fish. It's covered with soup and fish. No, just come as you are. Oh, Candy. Very well. As you say, dress. I'll pick you up about 7.30. Splendid. Uh, where are we sitting? The Diamond Horseshoe? That's right. Backstage in the wings. I bustled about getting ready. As long as I was going to be backstage, I didn't have to get too fancy. So in practically nothing flat, I was out in the car and once again driving over to Rembrandt's place. He was ready, he jumped in, and we took off for the opera house. The carriage trade was arriving at the carriage trade entrance, so I found a place to park out in back, and then we went in. Talked to Wally, one of the stagehands, and got two chairs on the left. Just at that moment, the concertmeister gave the cue for the orchestra to tune up. That was Spaulding's cue to float out from stage right and make his entrance. He carried more ham per pound than you'd find in a Chicago stockyard. He minced to the podium, bowed, scraped, and faced the orchestra. It all started nicely enough, even though the orchestra was playing as if it were sitting on eggs. First the Brahms, then Fountains of Rome. They took a bath in the first fountain. It felt so good they went on to another. Then another, and they were through, through all the fountains. Now it was time for the production number. The lights dimmed. The fluorescent lights on the music stands came on. Spaulding flipped a switch and his baton lit up. You could feel a tenseness come over the audience and the orchestra started hatching its eggs. Eric gave the downbeat, and Swan Lake was underway. Everyone seemed to feel that the worst was over. You could almost hear the snapping of spines as the audience relaxed and settled back in their seats. And... That's when it happened. Ah! 
It had happened again. The most horrible sounding chord I'd ever heard. The audience stood up. This time there were no laughs, just a stunned amazement. The orchestra stopped playing and Spalding threw his baton on the stage and walked off into the wings. Slowly the orchestra followed. I was just as dumbstruck as the rest. Then I got my wits about me and ducked around to the rear. Come on, Rembrandt. To where, girl? Anywhere. I want to talk to people, find out what happened. Don't you know? They blew a king-sized clinker. Oh, that was well established. It'll be heard around the world. But I want to find out how it happened. What Uh-oh. There's Spalding talking to Raimondi. I'm ruined, Waldo, through. Washed up. How can this sort of thing happen? How can it possibly happen? Oh, look, Eric, calm down. It's not as bad as you're making it out. I'm not making anything out. I'm facing the facts. I'm through. Do you suppose I can face the critics, the public, after three successive performances like this? Oh, there you are, Miss Matson. A lot of help you've been. You let it happen again. Cool off, Buster. Uh, you can't avoid something uh, happening when you don't know what that something is. This is a something that's never been written into the books. Or, oh, wait a minute. Hasn't it? All of a sudden, I've got me an idea. Great heavens! Why, you're the prophets. What's going on here tonight? If you'll forgive my sudden departure, I intend finding out. We made like the cavalry going up San Juan. The scream had come from off stage over in the dressing rooms. That's where we headed. By the time we got there, a crowd had gathered. And there, in room 14, with her flute clutched firmly in her hands... They known as Spalding. Oh, Possibly, I'm going to try and get through here, Rembrandt, find out what's happening. Excuse me. Pardon me. How is she, Candy? She's not feeling well, Rembrandt. As a matter of fact, she isn't feeling at all. She's dead. <laughs> This was the kind of development I hadn't counted on at all. An orchestra coming apart like wet tissue paper is one thing, but murder is another. That's where my friend Inspector Mallard comes into the picture. I made a call to headquarters, but he was out. So instead, a couple of his boys came over. I left the entire thing in their capable hands and tried to clear up a little unfinished business of my own. You still play the cello, Rembrandt. Strictly for me on amusement, Dove. Why? Well, you know music. Take a look at the score. Right about... about here. Oh, yes. This is just about where they hit that foul chord. That's right. Notice anything wrong? Let me see. This bar looks all right. Hmm, and so does this one. They didn't get past this point. Look carefully. Why, yes. Little indentations alongside the notes. Ever so slight, but there, nevertheless. The pattern is beginning to take shape, Rembrandt. And if you'll look again, you'll find these little irregularities throughout the whole score. Andy, you're right. Now's as good a time as any to find out if I'm right or not. Wally! Wally! Is that you, Candy? That's right. Do me a favor, Wally. When I shout, now, switch on the fluorescent lights, will you? Okay. Now hand me that score, Rembrandt. We'll place it on the music stand like this. Keep your eyes on this bar right here. Don't look away for one instant. Now, Wally. Okay. Watch now. There are the lights. What do you see? Candy. Incredible. That chord changed right before me very eyes. Why, nobody could play that. It has dissonance over dissonance. That's what you heard tonight. Keep watching. The regular lights again, Wally. Right, Candy. There. You see? Back to normal again. But you don't see the bad chord, do you? No. This is amazing. Most amazing. The copyist used a certain kind of ink that vanished under the fluorescent light. And at that time, a whole new score appeared with that awful chord buried in it. Diabolical, isn't it? Yes, isn't it? Too bad you're so clever, Miss Matson. <laughs> Hi, Raimondi. I wasn't sure for a while, but when Mrs. Spaulding got it in the dressing room, I had my money on you. It's a shame your knowledge won't do you any good. You're not going to be able to use it. You see, here in my pocket, a very competent 38. Now move, both of you, quietly, over to Eric's dressing room. You better do as the man says, Rembrandt. Oh, there you are, Miss Matson. I want oh, to... Oh, no, you don't, Eric! <laughs> 
Spalding, you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Just nick me. Come on, Rembrandt. He's ducking around backstage. There he goes. He's trapped and he knows it. The cops are over on the other side of the stage. He's coming back this way. Rembrandt, the stage has been raised on the elevators. He's going to run right into that opening. Raimondi, look out! Raimondi! Ah! How do you feel, Spaulding? A little weak. Just hand me a spot of that brandy, will you? I shall be all right. Sure. Tell me, why was Ramondi gunning for you? Until tonight. I didn't know he was. All of a sudden, that name Ramondi means something to me. Here's your brandy. Thank you. Yes, Balto was a very promising violinist. Great things had been predicted for him until the summer of 1933. What happened? We were driving through Sussex when my car overturned. His left hand was badly smashed. Had to have the last three fingers amputated. That was the end of his career. First, he was bitter, wouldn't speak to me. Said it was all my fault. Little by little, I won him over. Then, because music was his world, I gave him a position of companion and librarian. He's been with me ever since. Yes, plotting your downfall. And very cunning, too. He waited all these years to pull the switch on his clever device. Why is that, Miss Matson? Your wife, Spaulding. Raimondi had it figured out that you'd attach all the blame to your ex-wife. Poor Nona. Gone. And Waldo, too. Yes. And all because that accident left a bigger scar on his mind than it did on his hand. Well, I'll see you, Spaulding. That was some concert tonight. It seemed to have just about everything... It was too bad about the ex, Mrs. Spaulding. She let her heart rule her head. She went to Raimondi's dressing room to make an overture to perhaps make an effort to patch up her lost romance with Eric. She walked in at a bad time. Raimondi was applying the finishing touches to his phony score. There was an assortment of ink all over the table. At the time, it didn't mean anything to Nona, but during the performance, she discovered the same thing I did. After that bad chord, she rushed off stage, ready to apply the crusher to Waldo. He saw what she was up to and beat her to it, with a window weight over the head. Well, like I've said many times, some of that music gets too deep for me. I think I'll just stick to something not quite so complicated. Something simple, enjoyable, something you can understand, like Bop. Perhaps. Listen again next week at the same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial Candy Matson, Yukon two eight two zero nine. Tonight were Hal Burdick as Eric Spaulding, Harry Bechtel as Waldo Raimondi, and Norma Tuart as Mrs. Spaulding. Jack Thomas plays the part of Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Bill Walker speaking. The program came to you from San Francisco. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Ladies and gentlemen, before we commence tonight's Candy Matson story, 
It's a very great pleasure to welcome as our distinguished guest this evening, the widely read radio columnist of the San Francisco Examiner, who conducts his own radio column under the title, Day and Night with Radio and Television. Mr. Dwight Newton. Thank you, Dudley Manlove. Recently, I conducted a popularity poll to determine our readers' favorite radio program originating in San Francisco. Heading the list, and a top-heavy favorite, was your Candy Matson program. In behalf of the examiner readers who participated in the poll, I am happy to present this award, which reads as follows. 1950 San Francisco Examiner Favorite Program Award. This certifies that readers of the San Francisco Examiner have voted Candy Matson their favorite local radio program in a poll conducted by the underside writer of the column Day and Night with Radio and Television. Congratulations to all who participate on the Candy Matson program to Monty Masters, who writes and directs it, and to you, Natalie Masters, the Candy Matson star. Thank you, Dwight Newton. We're doubly proud of this award tonight because next week's program will mark Candy Matson's first birthday. From all of us here at NBC in San Francisco to Dwight Newton, the San Francisco Examiner, and most of all, you, the listeners, who've made this award possible, our very sincere thanks. We continue now with Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Just a moment, I'll be right there. How do you do? You, you are Candy Matson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. And who are you? Willa Gray. Come in, won't you, Willa? Is there something I can do for you? I, I don't quite know how to explain this. It's my brother. Your brother? Maybe you've heard of him, Miss Matson. Gordon Gray? Why, sure. The songwriter? That's right. Who doesn't know him? He's written almost as many hit songs as Irving Berlin. What about him, Willa? Well, like many people I know, Gordon is a crime student for relaxation. He reads all the books, listens to all the radio programs, and naturally he's heard and read a great deal about you. Well, I'm flattered. When... I suggested talking to you here. Agreed immediately. Talking to me, Willa? What about? Well, it's his mental condition, Miss Matson. He suddenly become extremely childish. All day long he sits at the piano playing nothing but uncoordinated notes. Are you sure they're uncoordinated, or is it some new style he's trying to develop? Miss Matson, you're familiar with Gordon's work. Songs like Lazy Old June, The Tenderness of You. What he's doing now is just Musical gibberish. How well I remember lazy old June. I was just a kid in high school at the time. Are you living with your brother, Willa? No, I'm not. Just as well, too. I don't think I could take it. Why do you say that? These foolish notes he plays. He says he's working on a thing to be called Symphony of Death. That someone is going to kill him. Why? Now you've got me interested. I hope so, Miss Matson. He won't talk to me. Every time I drop by, Gordon just sits at the piano, laughing horribly and playing these kindergarten notes. As I said, he's a great fan of yours. Won't you go and just speak to my brother? Sure, I'll see him. Gordon Gray with a shattered mind. What a pity, if true. Think of all the jukeboxes that would have to settle for promissory notes. <laughs> Candy Matson, San Francisco's well-known gal private investigator. Merely trying to get her penthouse on Telegraph Hill cleaned, and she walks into a stack of memories. Memories created by a songwriter named Gordon Gray. Symphony of Death. It never became a popular composition, but it will always be on Candy's all-time hit parade. A tune she'll never forget. Because it brought about a very strange chain of events, and a fascinating finish to the entire story... Oh, and the in-between department? Well, here she is, the gal who never suffers from gaposis, Candy Matson. When I went into the cold, hard world to make a living for myself, Gordon Gray was an American institution. That's when he wrote his never-to-be-forgotten The Rhapsody of You. I'd had no idea that Gray was in San Francisco. The last I'd heard, he was in New York, working on the score of a brand-new musical. So when his sister confronted me like that, naturally, I was caught a bit off base. 
She wrote Gordon's address for me like the rabbity little elf she seemed, ducked out as abruptly as she came. Then I dressed, drove over to an apartment house on Powell Street, just down from the family club. I pressed the button. It blew an ugly little noise back at me. I entered and went up the stairs to 221. The door opened. Yes? Mr. Gray? Yes, that's right. I didn't call you on the phone. I thought I'd just more or less barge in on you. I'm Candy Matson. Candy Matson? Do come in. Oh, please, do come in. Thank you. So, my little sister finally got up enough gumption to call you. Yes, she came by this afternoon. She, we had quite a nice little chat. A nice chat? With my sister? Impossible. A little mouse doesn't know how to put one word after another. Oh, here, here. Do sit down, won't you? Place is a mess. I've got manuscripts all over the floor, the high boy, the whatnot. Everywhere. Uh, highball? Spot of sherry? Thank you. No, not right at the moment. As you say. <laughs> I beg your pardon? It's nothing, really. <laughs> I'm just thinking of my monstrous joke. I'm going to be killed, you know. Yes, so your sister said. Oh. Uh, uh, you mind... My sister, young... <laughs> she's young enough to marry my grandchild. Do you know what? She thinks I'm slipping my cable. Do you mind if I call you Gordon? I'd love it. Providing I can call you Candy. I'd despise myself in the A.M. if you didn't. Candy, you're just as delightful as I had you pictured. Thanks, Gordon. Now, frankly, what do you think? Are you uh, slipping your cable? Of all the idiotic... Of course not. Willa seems convinced you are. Willa's a mere babe, a suckling. What about this new thing you're working on, Gordon? This, this symphony of death? She told you about that, too, huh? That's part of my monstrous joke, Candy. Want to confide in me? Let me know what this joke is? I don't mind in the least. You have brains. Not many people have brains in this world, Candy. But you do. And because you have brains, I'm going to give you a challenge. Okay, let me have it. Oh, no. <laughs> the challenge will only come after he kills me. He? Who are you referring to, Gordon? <laughs> That's part of the challenge, Candy. I see. Do you really believe that someone's out to kill you? But of course. That's the delicious part of the whole thing. I'm going to be killed. It can't be avoided. That's why I'm writing my symphony of death. Oh, oh, sure. Now I see. You're making fun of me, Candy. No, no, I'm not, Gordon, really. It's just that, well, I've never met anyone who was happy about the prospect of getting knocked off. I don't mind, actually. I've lived a full life. I've seen the world. Me lots of money. I've been wined and dined by people in all walks of life. My music will live after me. That's all I care about. Now I can understand. There. You see? That's why I like you. You have brains. Uh, shall I play my new composition for you? If you like. Very well. As you will discover after I'm dead. It's all part of my monstrous joke. <laughs> Excuse me. Pay no attention to the technique, Candy, my dear. My fingers aren't quite as supple as they used to be. <laughs> there, what do you think of it? Gordon, I think it's a great, monstrous joke. I knew you'd see it. It's part of the joke. You're really sharp. I knew it. That's part of the joke, and you can see it. You pay wonderful compliments, Gordon. Thank you. But don't you think this symphony of death is a complete departure from your usual style? From something like, well, the Rhapsody of You, for instance? Certainly, certainly. It's because of him. I had to write something dedicated to him, didn't I? Well, to scramble a dangling participle, who's him? The man who's going to kill me. <laughs> As I left, I tried to shake the picture of a cackling man playing one-fingered doodles on the keyboard, but I couldn't. The impression was indelible. When I arrived home, I was greeted by the sight of a familiar auto parked out in front. It was my number one boy, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. I invited him up to sit a spell and chew the fat. What's new, Cupcake? I haven't seen you for several days. Seems like weeks. Ha! Huh, a compliment. That means you're after something. I am not. Can't I ever say something nice without you misconstruing? Okay, okay, compliment accepted. 
Mr. What brings you around here this time of day, Mellor, dear? Aren't you on duty? That's the trouble. I've been on duty for almost 48 hours straight. I have to take a little breather for myself. Working on a deal? Yeah, a hot one. No leads, no clues, no nothing. For a slight consideration, I might be inclined to help you crack the case, Sherlock. Huh? By the way, what are you working on? Nothing but hope and what's left of the bank account. You mean to say the great lady private eye is temporarily at liberty? I mean to say just exactly that. Well, if I'm any judge of your business ability, you've got enough money tucked away to buy the Philadelphia Athletics from Connie Mack. <laughs> What do you do with all your loot, Candy? Sew it in hair mattresses and sleep on it. <laughs> oh, excuse me a moment, Mallory. Sure, go right ahead. Oh, hello, Willa. I didn't expect to see you so soon. I hope you won't think me a nuisance, but I just had to see you. I understand. Come in. No, thanks. You've been to see Gordon. I just spoke with him on the phone and he told me. Yes, that's right. What do you think, Miss Matson? Very sad, Willa. How long has he been like this? Just a week or so. He flew in from New York, and I could see the change in him right away. How long ago did he leave for New York? He left Hollywood for New York last month. Was he all right then? Oh, yes. Just fine. He seemed so happy. He just finished writing the music for the new show in the East. But when he got there, the backers, as they say in show business, told him the music was no good. He said he'd return to the coast and redo it. But... Instead of going back to Hollywood, he came here. Took that apartment on Powell Street, and he's been holed up there ever since. Do you think being told his music was no good had anything to do with his present condition? Oh, I'm sure of it, Miss Matson. He's always been such a sensitive person. No, no, Willa. <laughs> I've known several people who snapped momentarily under a terrific strain. Maybe it's not as serious as you think. What am I going to do? Well, first, he needs aid. Immediately. I know a Judge Conway here in town. I think he'll help you get Gordon committed to a sanitarium where he'll get the finest medical aid available. A sanitarium? Oh, no, Miss Matson. That would kill Gordon. Well, it's either that or have him get progressively worse. I, I suppose you're right. Could you... I mean, would you talk to Gordon? Explain what must be done? I don't think I'm capable... Sure. I'll do it, Willa. You sit tight and I'll call you just as soon as I speak with Judge Conway. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I imagine I should inquire as to how much you charge for your services. No, forget it, Willa. Getting Gordon Gray back to normal will be pay enough. You're, you're just wonderful, Miss Matson. Goodbye. Poor kid. So helpless. Poor kid is right. I couldn't help overhearing. She's about 90% mouse. She and Gordon must have been poured right out of the same mold as far as sensitivity is concerned. Is that the Gordon Gray Candy? The famous songwriter? That's the one. And he's cracked up? Mm-hmm. Down that chair. Well, thanks, pal. Just the sight of you has picked me up considerably. I'll be getting back to the grind. Melly, dear, hold me tight for just a moment, will you? Sure. Don't let Gordon Gray get you down a cupcake. Well, it wasn't a very pretty sight. And I've got to face him again. Thanks for the hug, Mallard. I'll return it someday. Mallard released his grip and left. I snapped my ribs back in place and steeled myself for the ordeal ahead of me. It wasn't going to be easy, but it had to be done. So once again, I found myself ducking down Green Street, over Powell, across California, and down the roller coaster of a hill to Gordon's apartment. He answered the door, and I was met with just as much enthusiasm as before. Candy Matson, I was wondering where you'd been. You've been gone for ages, darling. Do come in. I've got a surprise for you. When did you get back from Europe? When did I get back? Oh, just a day or so ago. Your letters were wonderful. I especially adored the one from Naples. What a time you must have had. Yes. Yes, quite a time, Gordon. How's the new symphony coming along? That's the surprise, my dear. It's completed. Long last, it's finished. To be perfectly frank, Candy, I, I think it's great. I've been in touch with Toscanini. He's going to give it its premiere performance at Carnegie next month. I've already sent him the revised manuscript. Can you picture it, Candy? A hushed crowd. Master wraps his baton. The orchestra comes to full attention. 
Then that magnificent firm downbeat of Toscanini's and Symphony of Death is making its debut. First, the Allegretto. Then, the Molto Andante. The audience is at first inclined to scoff, to think that Gordon Gray could write serious music, from lazy old June to Symphony of Death. Too much of a step, they'd say. Then, Toscanini glides into the Conmoto. The audience tenses, not believing their ears. Little by little, they understand what Gordon Gray is trying to express. Then, as if it were not enough, Toscanini moves into the breathtaking finale. It soars, it moves. It transports everyone in Carnegie Hall into another world. And abruptly, symphony of death. The symphony of death is over. The audience arises as one. They, they shout for Gordon Gray, the composer. History's being made. More shouts for the composer. But Gordon Gray isn't there. Gordon Gray's dead. Because of him. Gordon, listen to me. <laughs> because of him. The world will have to be denied any further music from the pen of Gordon Gray. I said listen to me, Gordon. Hmm? Oh. What? I want to talk to you. And you've got to listen very carefully. You're sick. You need help. Your sister and I are arranging to have you sent to a home nearby. They'll have you on your feet in short order. Sent away? Yes. That means he will visit me sooner than I'd planned. Very well, Candy. Tell Willa to do whatever she thinks best. I won't give her any trouble. It's for your own good, Gordon. Believe me. I know. Candy, you never went to Europe, did you? You were here earlier this afternoon. Isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> you just went along with the gag. That's right, Gordon. Yeah. You'll be here sooner. Much sooner than I expected. <laughs> Gordon Gray went into the other room and lay down on his studio couch, face down. That's when I tiptoed out of the apartment. If only I could have peeked into the future, I'd never have left, because that was the last time Gordon Gray was seen alive. I went home, fixed myself something to eat, turned the radio on low, and sat down with a book called That Frail Vessel, a book about the behavior of the human mind. Out of one corner of my ear, I heard it. It was the 10 o'clock news over NBC with Sam Hayes. And there it was. The body of Gordon Gray had been found in his apartment. The book clattered out of my hands and I sat there for a moment stunned. But only for a moment. In another second I was driving over to pick up an old pal of mine, Rembrandt Watson. There was a good reason for it. Rembrandt studying to play the cello. On the way over I noticed the headlines. The police had the net out for Gordon's sister, Willa. Rembrandt was home. He was agreeable to going to Gordon Gray's apartment with me. And before you could bat an eyelash, providing your batting average was good, we were in said apartment alone. My word, girl. What a garish-looking place. It didn't belong to Gordon personally, Rembrandt. He was merely renting it. He still doesn't deny the fact that it's garish. Can't be the truth now. Why did you want me to come to this Victorian mausoleum with you? Just a hunch, Ducky. Are you still taking cello lessons? Taking them? Girl, don't be ridiculous. I'm now giving them. <laughs> Even better. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. The boys in blue haven't touched anything. The manuscript for Symphony of Death is still on the piano. Can you play single notes on the piano, Rembrandt? Well, I can try. Good. Run your hangnails over this. Hmm. Strange. This isn't music. Such a series of notes with no meter, phrasing, or regard for the proper time to the bar. Exactly. Play it just the way it's written. Very well. And call out the notes as you go along. I think I'm beginning to understand Gordon's symphony of death. As you say, C, A, D, and for no reason at all, there's a rest candy. D, A, D, and a rest. Go ahead. E, G, G, and another rest. Mm-hmm. Then it goes 
D E A D. The long gap in the manuscript. You know what that spells musically, Ducky? Bad egg dead. Utter confusion. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I don't think so. As we say in the movies, continue on. F A G G E D. No timing at all. That spells fag. So am I. However, it goes on like this. D E A F. Another rest, then B E E. Finish. What? Through. It's the poop. Finish. Let's see now. Bad egg dead. Fag. Deaf. B. It can be love. If you're going to the notes of the musical scale, you could spell practically anything out of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, even from a tune like Ragmuff. But this means something. I know it does. Gordon told me it was going to be a challenge. What? Who's there? Don't be alarmed, Miss Maxson. It's only me. Willa. Willa, how did you get in here? Don't you know the police are looking all over town for you? Let them look. I don't care. My brother's dead. I read it in the papers. How did you get in here, Willa? The cops are surrounding the place. I just walked in through the front door. Oh, wait till Mallard hears about this. Willa, you didn't kill Gordon, did you? No, Miss Madsen. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. I believe you, Willa. Because I think I know who did kill your brother. You do? Tell me. Oh, please, tell me. Down at the Hall of Justice. Okay, let's go. Oh, Rembrandt, bring along that bust of Beethoven sitting on the piano, will you? Oh, pleasure, dear. I'll be glad to... <clears throat> Candy, this thing must weigh at least 15 pounds. Well, you're the only man in the group. Oh? Oh. <clears throat> Very well. Come along, bust. All of justice or likewise. <laughs> Candy, what are you doing here at a time like this? Can't you see I'm busy? Sure, I only want to see you busier. This is Willa Gray, remember her? Just the girl we're looking well, for. Well, save your breath, Mallard. Willa's innocent. She had nothing to do with Gordon Gray's death. Okay, you know so much. Who in tarnation did? Put that bust of Beethoven on Mallard's desk, Rembrandt. I was wondering how long I'd have to hold this thing. What in the name of Schenectady do I want with that? There sits your murderer. Sandy, are you out of your head? No, it's so complex it's simple, Mallard. Gordon Gray works like a beaver for two months writing a musical score for a new Broadway show. He takes the score to New York. Producers tell him it's no good. It's the first time it's ever happened to Gordon. It does something to his mind. He broods. He comes to San Francisco. His mental condition becomes worse. So is yours. For your concern, yes. But let me finish. Here, take a look at this. Uh, bad egg dead. Fag. Deaf B. Okay, I give up. What does it mean? Bad egg dead. Gordon Gray is referring to himself. Fag? That means he had come to the end of his rope. His musical knowledge and creative ability were running dry. Gray had nothing more to live for. Okay, Miss Edgar Allan Poe. What does deaf B mean? Well, that had me stumped for a while, too. Then I got to looking at this bust of Beethoven standing on the piano. It seemed to dominate the entire room. Then I put two and two together and got Ludwig von Beethoven. B was an abbreviation of Beethoven. Beethoven was deaf. Deaf B. I don't get it. You will. Beethoven is going to hit an all-time low. The answer lies inside that plaster bust, I'm sure. Stand back, Mallard. I'm about to splatter a genius. Take a look. Good gravy. A small fortune in greenbacks. That's right. And a note, too, if these eyes don't deceive me. Yeah. Congratulations, whoever you might be. You learned the true meaning of my symphony of death. You've also just executed my killer, von Beethoven. Now perhaps he knows how it feels to be cracked up, too. Thanks for participating in my little joke, my last charade. This is my entire estate. Put it to whatever good use you need to fit. Gordon Gray. <laughs> oh, Rembrandt, do me a favor. Take Willa outside. The poor kid's pretty badly shot. Certainly, Dove. Come along, young lady. 
I still don't get it, Candy. It's easy to fill in the gaps now, Mallard. Gordon's music was falling apart. He knew it. So he started swiping melodies from obscure Beethoven themes. But Gordon, with only his flair for writing popular music, couldn't grasp what Beethoven had originally intended. Consequently, the things he wrote were terrible. The more he copied, the more he realized that Beethoven was becoming an all-ruling obsession. It was Beethoven in the morning, Beethoven at night, Beethoven 24 hours a day until it drove Gordon completely out of his mind. That I can understand, but what's this joke he mentioned? Well, he was a great mystery fan. That's why he wrote this gibberish thing called Symphony of Death. A group of notes that spelled out bad egg dead, fag, death be, and so on. All part of his warped mental condition. Well, that makes sense. Except for one thing. How did Gordon Gray die exactly when he wanted to die? Mallard, dear, I now know there are some mighty strange things in this world. Even a completely sick mind such as Gordon has great powers of concentration. Gordon was like a, a captain without a ship. Like a man who's been married 50 years who suddenly has no wife. You probably won't believe it, Mallard, but Gordon Gray, knowing that his mind was shot, and knowing, too, that every last bar of creative music had been drained from his heart, his soul, willed himself to die. Fantastic? Not necessarily so. There are many stories about animals who have done the same thing. If animals can do it, why can't a human being with a so-called higher plane of intelligence do it, too? So that's what Gordon had done. Taken his life savings, sealed them into a plaster bust of Beethoven, along with his last laugh note, and sat himself down to die. In Gordon's mind, Beethoven had killed him. I can understand why, too. For just before we left his apartment, I found another manuscript. I had Rembrandt run over it. Note for note, it was the Moonlight Sonata, backwards. But in one respect, Gordon had outscored the old masters. He had completed his symphony of death, and Beethoven was in little pieces. That left him one up on another old master, a fellow named Franz Schubert. He'd left one entirely unfinished. <laughs> The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Actors heard this evening were Phyllis Skelton as Willa Gray. John Grover was her brother, Gordon Gray. Jack Thomas as Rembrandt Watson. And Henry Leff as Inspector Ray Mallard. From the star of our program, Natalie Masters, and from her husband, Monty Masters, who writes and directs Candy Matson and from the staff of the National Broadcasting Company, we wish to express our deep thanks and sincere appreciation to the San Francisco Examiner and Dwight Newton, radio columnist of the Examiner, for tonight's presentation, naming Candy Matson as the number one program in the San Francisco Metropolitan Bay Area. Listen again next week at the same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209... Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Eat that baby on the tree. Uh, fix those dolly tracks. And look out for that cable, it's hot. Mallard, what in the name of the San Francisco Police Department are you doing up here on Telegraph Hill? Working, Candy, in the name of the San Francisco Police Department. Here? With these people who are making the movie? Yeah. How about that? Me, a lieutenant in homicide, and I'm assigned to riding herd on these Hollywood characters. Oh, it's better than murder. I'll take murder any day. <laughs> what are you doing around here? 
I did some shopping at Speedy's this morning while I was pinching the avocados. They told me that there was a Hollywood gang over by Coit Tower shooting some scenes for a movie with a San Francisco background. They might just as well have stayed in the studio. They brought their own lawns, prop trees, fake bushes, the works. <laughs> if it ever snowed up here on Telegraph Hill, they'd have brought some of that along, too. <laughs> You've never worked in Hollywood, Mallard. Only God can make a tree, but Hollywood presumes to improve on them. <laughs> what are they doing now? Uh, just getting ready to shoot a scene, I think. Oh. They've been rehearsing it all morning. Mm -hmm. What's it all about, you know? As far as I can figure, it's a story about San Francisco right after the gold rush. Look at all the costumes. Very authentic. Looks like they'd been shipped around the horn. <laughs> By the way, Mallard, do you know who's in the picture? Some lush tomato named Cherry Dana and a Colorado boy, Buff Arnold. Arnold? D did you say Buff Arnold? That's right. Why? Oh, forgive me, Mallard, dear. I... I knew Buff Arnold when he didn't have a place to house in. He professed to carry a very warm torch for me. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's why you so casually dropped by. Oh. An old flame, huh? Don't be ridiculous. I didn't even know the guy was here, let alone still in pictures. A likely story. <laughs> All right, quiet, please. Let's have quiet. Quiet. This is a take. All set, Mr. Dix. We're ready. <laughs> Good. Okay, Cherry, we'll roll this one. Take a chance on it. Just remember to keep up against those trees. We don't want any shots of those modern buildings below the hill. Oh, remember, Red. Where is my old pal, Buff Arnold, Mark Mallard, dear? By me. Judging by what's been going on, he's not in this particular scene. Mm -hmm. All right, stand by. Roll him. Scene 47, take 10. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute. Cut, cut. Oh, where's that coming from? Out on the bay, Mr. Dix. A uh, fine thing, a present-day steamer whistle in an 1850 picture. Hold it. Ames. Yes? Let me know when the fool ship is tied up. We won't shoot the scene until it's docked. Yes, sir. Oh, darn it. I was hoping I'd see some action. Well, I'll give you some action. Come on, walk around with me, Candy. I'll show you all the sights. Sites like what, for instance, Mallard? Oh, all the lights they brought up here. They must have a thousand of them. Undoubtedly to wash out the wrinkles on the leading lady's face. And talk about props. It must have taken a whole freight train to get them up here. Oh, well, I have to have them. Uh, uh, for instance, look, uh, right up there. Hmm? Where, Mallard? Uh, up, up there, above. In that tree, hanging by their necks. <gasps> oh, Mallard! <laughs> Don't jump like that, Cupcake. Oh. They're only dummies hanging from those ropes. Three of them, they, they look so realistic. Well, I must admit, they really do. I understand they use them in a scene where they recreate a lynching in Portsmouth Square. Recreate, did you say? Yeah. Maybe you're right. Take another look, honey, by a good look at the one in the middle. What are you trying to... Fry me for lard. That one in the middle is no dummy. You're no dummy either, boy of mine. How many times have you looked up there? Well, just a couple of times, but the last time I looked, the one in the middle wasn't an ex-human being. With that, I tossed the whole thing in your lap, Mallard. I promote you back to homicide. Oh, why didn't these characters stay in Hollywood? It is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Cluttering up our lovely Telegraph Hill trees with gently swaying corpses. Come on, Mallard. Let's give the director a slight touch of apoplexy. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. It's funny how sometimes when you're lazy and want to do nothing except live the good, pure life, trouble, trouble comes up and belts you over the head with a vengeance. Well, that's the way it happened to me. I would just finished a deal that took me three weeks to crack. I made some good money out of it, banked it, and sat back to relax. When I heard about the movie company on location on the other side of the hill, my curiosity got the better of me. As of that moment, my contemplated relaxation was at an end. Period. Paragraph. I literally walked right into trouble because there was Mallard and cut down. Okay, Mr. Dix, take a good look at him. You recognize the gent? I recognize him, yes, but I don't know him. He was one of the extras we used in a scene yesterday. Did he come up from Hollywood with you? I'm pretty sure he didn't. I think he was hired here locally. Uh, wait a minute. Who's this young lady? I don't want any outsiders in on this. Don't no, fret your little head, Mr. Dix. Aside from being a material witness, she's a well-known private investigator. Ah, excuse me. I didn't know. That's all right. No need to apologize. Some of my best friends are movie directors. Uh, who would keep the roster on your personnel? My assistant, Bill Ames. Is he around? 
Well, I'm right here, Lieutenant. Oh, good. Can you give us any dope on this fellow? Oh, golly, uh, I'm afraid not. I've seen him, but I wouldn't know his name from Adam. How about the payroll? When do you pay off the extras? Ah, that's a thought. We pay off at 5 o'clock tonight. Why don't we come back then, Mellard? We can check off the names against the pay vouchers. There's one thing extras like to do, and that's get paid. The name that doesn't show up is our friend the corpse. Okay, we'll let it go like that. What do you pay off? Room 873, Montfair Hotel. Make sure everybody's there, unless they want a little trouble thrown at them. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dix. You can go on with your shooting now. Uh, no, no more today. It's too unnerving. Ames, knock it off. Call will be for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning sharp. Right, Chief. Uh, break it up, everybody. 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in costumes. And that means 8 o'clock, understand? You mind waiting here for a moment, Candy? I want to put in a call to the coroner's office for a wagon. Sure, that's all right. Go ahead. Good. It'll only be a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Dix, pardon me. Yes? Can you tell me where Buff Arnold is staying? What uh, What do you want with Buff Arnold, young lady? I used to know him when he was playing bit parts in Hollywood. Oh. Did you uh, work in Hollywood? I did a little time down there, sitting around in agents' offices. You know, uh, you're a sharp little cookie. <laughs> Say, all of a sudden I've got an idea. I'll bet. <laughs> no, no. On the level, believe me. I have a small part coming up that'd fit you to a tee. Good-looking gal, wise, supposed to work in her father's store selling supplies to the miners. Can you uh, act at all? I used to shoot a fairly sharp mess of dialogue. Do you live close by? Right over there, one block, penthouse on the top. Hmm, all the better. As soon as your policeman friend removes the deceased there, uh, why don't we go over to your place and uh, look at the script? You know something? I've got an idea that's the idea you had the idea about. Okay, I'll look at the script. But for your information, Mr. Dix, I'm interested only in playing a part in your picture. Mallard came back and I told him what had developed with Dix. He shot me a look that had more question marks in it than a government income tax form. I assured him I could handle the situation and he left with the body still clad in its 49er prospector's outfit. Dix issued some final orders, took me by the arm, and we strolled over to my place. Ah, charming, but positively charming. Thank you. What a gorgeous view. How long have you lived here, Miss... Oh, now, isn't that silly? I don't even know your name. Matson, Candy Matson. Candy Matson. Never have I heard a name match a personality so completely. <laughs> I'm Reginald Dix. Um, just call me Reg. As you say, Reg. Uh, would you like a drink? Oh, splendid. Soda highball? I think I can scrape one together. <sighs> this is absolutely enchanting. I'm going to ask to make all my pictures in San Francisco from now on. I don't think you'd go wrong. Uh, of <laughs> course, it'd be a little rough if you were making a picture with an Indian background and needed shots of the Taj Mahal and the Himalayas. <laughs> oh, simple. I'd change it to the Ferry Building and Twin Peaks. <laughs> Very good. Here you are, Reg. <sighs> Thank you. I can use this after that messy discovery up there on that tree. Well, here's to crime. Uh, that's a charming toast. Now then, about this part you were speaking of, I don't even belong to the Screen Actors Guild anymore. Oh, mere detail. I'll call the studio tonight and have them arrange your membership. As simple as that. You know, I think if some of your bright boys got together, you could win the war in Korea without half trying. Oh, let's not be snide, my dear. Mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me a moment. Someone at the door. Uh, certainly. Whoever it is, though, uh, send them away. Yes, master. Hi. Hi. But now that we've established our highs, is there something I can do for you? I'm Cherry Dana. Is Mr. Dix here? Oh, why, yes. Uh, would you wait here, please? I will not wait here. I want in. Now, just a minute. There you are, Ed. You have a short memory, haven't you? Cherry, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm having a conference. So I see. I hate to mention it, but this happens to be a private home, Miss Dana. I'll have to ask you to leave. Don't be boring. You lured my director up here, and I'm going to see that some little local wench doesn't put the squeeze play on him. Why, you pampered brat, get out of here right now, or I'll show you how a local wench can back up words with action. Oh, now hold on here, both of you. Cherry, I resent this intrusion just as much as Miss Matson does, I'm sure. I'll bet. What about me? 
You said you were going to drive me back to the hotel. Very well, it slipped my mind. I'm sorry, Candy. I dislike scenes of this sort. We'll discuss our business uh, later. Good. I find now that I'm extremely interested. Good afternoon, Miss Dana. I'll see you later. I was so mad I was boiling. If I'd been a thermometer, Quicksilver would have been streaming out of my ears. I did the most natural thing, took a shower, and little by little I simmered down. Actors and actresses are like anybody else. Most of them are darn nice people just trying to make a living, but one ham, like Cherry Dana, can ruin the picture. Just as I was getting dressed, the ferry building siren blew its top, indicating 4.30. I had to step on it if I was going to be at the Montfair at 5 in time for the payroll sequence with the extras. So I stepped on it and found myself in a minor mob scene outside room 873 at the Montfair Hotel. Mallard spotted me, grabbed me by the arm, and took me inside the room. I really didn't expect to see you, Candy. Hmm? Why not? I thought perhaps you were discussing contract terms with Dix by now. Big Hollywood star and all that. Oh, Mallard, cut it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as I call out your name, step up fast and sign the voucher. Anderson, Robert, Apperson, Lou, Bennett, Bert, Beverly... I studied the faces as they stepped by the cashier's table set up in the room. They were all types. Anyone could have been a, a villain, a dance hall girl, a hero, an ingenue, or just plain extra. The roll call droned on in the background. The whole thing took about ten minutes. And suddenly, we were alone. Ames, the assistant director, the girl who had done the actual paying, Mallard, and myself. Well, that's it. Who's missing, Ames? You're in for a bit of a shock. How do you mean? Nobody's missing. Everybody listed on our payroll, checked in, and was paid off. What? That's right. Did you recognize every person who had been paid off? I'm pretty sure I did. Well, this is a fine kettle of nothing. We have an extra who's working in the picture, and yet he isn't. So he ends up hanging by his neck from a tree on Telegraph Hill. Who was the Joker? The Joker, the one you can play wild. Are you sure they're all paid? Well, positive. Double check with their guild cards and signatures. Well, isn't this cute? Oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Yes, this is Ames. Oh, 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 yes, Cherry. What? He's what? Great Scott. What's the matter, Ames? What is it? You're white as a sheet. Dix. He's just been found shot to death in his room. From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Reginald Dix, well known Hollywood director, shot dead in his hotel room. We were looking for developments, and we got them, but not the kind we expected. Mallard led the way up to the suite that Dix had been occupying on the top floor. There was a mob around the door, and my boy Mallard soon dispersed them and instituted some semblance of order. Dix was sprawled out on the balcony overlooking the bay, and an ever-widening pool of blood showed that he'd been hit in the chest. Cherry Dana was pacing the room, smoking a cigarette. Ames stood in the middle with his jaw flapping. And who should be in the room, too, but my old pal from my days in Hollywood, Buff Arnold. Candy. Candy Matson. What a place for a reunion. Yes, isn't it? How are you, Buff? Ill. Terribly ill. If I have to step into the other room, I hope you'll understand. Reg was a great friend of mine. Sure. Sure, let's go in the bedroom. Uh, you look sort of green. Mm. Besides, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, Buff. It's a deal. Anything to get out of here, let's go. Wait a minute, Candy. Who is this guy? Buff Arnold Mallard, the fellow I was speaking about. Where were you going? In there. He doesn't feel too good. The closest he's ever been to blood is a bottle of ketchup in color. Okay. Don't let him out of your sight. I have a flock of questions and need a flock of answers. As you say, Miller, dear. And don't get carried away yourself. This the bedroom? Yeah. Well, Buff, you seem to be doing all right. <laughs> 
Mm, a lot different than what I knew you in Hollywood, Candy. You look swell, Buff. Too darn swell. Hmm? What do you mean? You bring back too many memories. You look mighty good yourself, Candy. You're no longer a plump little kid just out of high school. You're downright pretty, gal. In the good old days, I'd have jumped through hoops to hear you say that. Got any hoops handy? I'll say it again. No soap. Maybe we could revive some of those memories, Candy. Not a chance, Buck Boy. Things have changed. Hollywood and everyone in it, including you, are a part of a dim, sad past. And instead of just plain buff, that's a rebuff. Very cute. I haven't heard the gag pulled since yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, did you hear about the body that was found on Telegraph Hill this morning? I sure did. Now, poor Reg. I told him this picture had a jinx on it before we left the studio. Little things have happened right from the start. Like what? Well, in the first place, I wasn't even supposed to be in the picture. They were going to give it to some new kid as a build-up. A week before the first day of shooting, he up and disappeared. He hasn't been heard from since. Well, they shoved me into the breach. Then the assistant director tripped and fell off a catwalk, broke both legs. He had to be replaced. Anything else, Buck? Yeah. About that time, Cherry Dana whipped herself into a batch of temperament and walked off the lot. Held up production a week. Then the luggage for San Francisco was rerouted somewhere else. Never has caught up with us. Now the body this morning and Dick's just now. Certainly sounds like a jinx. By the way, how do you and the great Cherry get along, Buck? Hmm? Fine, fine. I try not to see her except on the set. Come here, Candy. Just let me hold you in my arms once, just once. I want the feel of someone who's truly genuine. You're still just a little boy, aren't you, Buck? Hmm. Okay, Arnold, I'd like to... uh... Well, pardon me. I hate to break this up, Uh, but I want to talk to you, Mr. Arnold. That was a fine time Mallard picked to walk in. And then I got to thinking, maybe it was a fine time. He was due to have a little fire set under him. As I walked out into the other room, the boys in blue had arrived, and they were swarming all over the place. Ames was no longer present. Neither was Cherry Dana. I wasn't going to give Mallard the satisfaction of an explanation, so I eased out the door and went down to the lobby. I asked where Ames was staying and went back up to his room, 672. A knock on the door produced results. Just a moment. Oh, Miss Matson. Something you wanted? Yes. May I come in? Why, I... Yes. I was just lying down. This thing about Reg has knocked me for a complete loop. It seems to be quite a shock to everybody. You've been with Reginald Dix for a long time, haven't you, Ames? Well, off and on, yes. A good number of years. How about La Dana? Cherry? Hmm. Well, I've known her extremely well, even before she became a top-flight star. Can you give me any idea who might have had it in for Dix? If you can, you better spill. The truth will come out sooner or later, Ames. It always does and things of this sort. I've only one little thing I can tell. I've already told it to your lieutenant friend. Oh, and what's that? As I got back from Telegraph Hill, I dropped by Reg's suite. Wanted to talk about tomorrow's shooting. As I drew near his door, I heard loud arguing. Arguing? Who were the opponents? Reg and Cherry Dana. Mm-hmm. And what were they arguing about, Ames? You. So that's it. Tell me, is Cherry the kind of woman who would turn killer on an impulse? It's hard to say. She has a terrible temper. Mm-hmm. Does Buff Arnold fit into the picture in any way? I don't know. He's a sly one, that Arnold. He plays his cards in strictly a commercial manner. May fit into the picture. He and Reg were never too friendly. I see. Oh, thanks, Amesy. I'll leave now. And You'd better lock your door. The way things are going, you might wake up to find yourself dead. <laughs> I went up to Cherry Dana's suite, but I drew a blank there, no answer. So I went back to the scene of the murder, Dix's rooms on the top floor. Mallard was just leaving. He shot me a look that would have knocked out a North Korean tank at a thousand yards and started to brush on by me, but I would have none of it. 
Now, just a moment, boy blue. Come on back to that over-21 level. Just because Buff had his arms around me is no sign we were playing a scene from Romeo and Juliet. I don't think I've seen that close a grip even in professional wrestling. Oh, cut it out. What'd you turn up in there? Anything at all? No, not a thing. Can't even find the murder weapon. Got any ideas? Lots of them. We've already taken Miss Dana into custody. I had a hunch it was leading in that direction. Uh, uh, incidentally, did you ever hear of a Christopher Seema? He's been a bookie around town here for several years. Christopher Seema? No, can't say I have. Why? Well, he was the boy who was hanging from the tree. Oh. According to our files, he dabbled in everything from gambling to blackmail. Seema. Seema, that, that name rings bell somehow, Mallard. Uh, one other thing. <laughs> This isn't personal, you understand. Yeah. But stay away from Buff Arnold. We've got our eye on him, too. Little things were suddenly clicking way back in my mind. Awfully vague, but the old processes from years before were coming to life ever so slowly. Mallard had work to do, plenty of it, down at the Hall of Justice, work in which I was included out. I went outside on California Street, watched him get into a squad car with two of his men, and I waved him a goodbye. That was when I had another idea. Dix's suite. The cops were through with it. The body had been removed. But I had a hunch that was the key to the situation. Knowing the manager of the Montfair, it was no trouble at all to get a key to Reg's suite, and that's where I headed, up to the top floor. I let myself into the darkened room, closed the door behind me. With the lights of the city way below seeping through the balcony window, I found a place in back of the settee and sat down to wait and think. The balcony window being opened, the roar of the city traffic underneath came gently through and helped my thinking. That's when it hit me. Seema. Several years before I had served my term in Hollywood, there was an actress named Vivian Seema. The same face as that of Cherry Dana. Now the clouds were beginning to lift... And at the same time, the door opened in the suite and the silhouetted figure of a man entered the room. Blast the luck. Okay, Buff. Relax. What? This is Candy. Come on over here by the settee. Hurry. I'm expecting company. What are you doing here, Candy? You've got the wrong page of the script. That's my line. What are you doing here, Buff? Honestly, you've got to believe me. I, I left my lighter here this afternoon. I was afraid the police would find it. Naturally, I can't afford any bad publicity. It ruined my career. I believe you, Buff. You always were fond of that career, weren't you? Don't answer. Just keep quiet. What's up? A guy named Seema, if I'm right. Shh. Who's this? Reginald Dix didn't like him. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone coming along the hall. <laughs> the door slowly opened and closed again. The dim light from the hall showed the form of another man. Then the dark figure moved slowly but surely across the room. It stopped for a second or two, as though listening for something. Then moved again to the balcony, out onto the balcony, and whoever it was grabbed the ledge above hoisted his feet up under the iron grill work and hung over the city. That's when I acted. Okay, Ames. Stay right where you are. In that position. What? You think I'm a fool? Candy's out on that ledge. He's ducked around the outside on that ledge. I'm a fool. Quick, Buff. Go down the hall and get out on the fire escape. Cut him off. Okay. What are you going to do? Go out on that ledge after him. You better come back, Ames. You're cut off at both ends. Oh, no, I'm not. Not with this gun I've got. That's the same gun you killed Dix with, isn't it? Very clever, hiding it up on this ledge out here. No wonder Mallard and his boys didn't find it. Look out there on the city, Ames. One misstep and you go off into space. Think it over. You better come back. Not on your life! I'm coming after you. I'm down at the other end, Candy. Good. Now we've got him. Yes. Yes, you have. Obviously, this is the end. Perhaps you don't know what it is to love Perhaps you don't know what it is to be scorned. I do, painfully so. This is the end, but I'm not going to go alone. You're going with me, Miss Matson, like this. No! No, the recoil, it'll knock you right out of the neck! Oh! So it was 
was just a matter of jealousy. Is that right, Candy? That's right, Miller, dear. The same thing you developed when you walked in on Buff Arnold and me. Okay, okay, so I was burned up. Tell me more. It was the name Seema that did it, Mallard. Uh, do you know what that is? All right, I'll play quizzies with you. What's the name Seema? Seema is Ames, spelled backwards. Uh-oh. You see, that was Ames' real name. At, at one time, he had married Cherry Dana under the name of Seema. When she began to be big in pictures, she divorced him, but he carried the eternal torch. Silly, she wasn't worth it. Of course not. Because she collected men. Reginald Dix, not because she loved him, but because she was fading in pictures and because Dix was the only one who could keep her in front of the public. Logical. But what about the Seema hung up in the tree on Telegraph Hill? Uh-huh. There we have the plot. The Seema up in the tree was Ames's brother, a ne'er-do-well. The night that Ames arrived in town here, he looked up his brother, got a bit tired, and told him what he'd done. Caused the original leading man to disappear, shoved the original assistant director off a platform, breaking his legs. In general, did everything he could to sabotage the picture. Then he pulled the strings to get himself named as assistant director so he could be near Cherry. Love and jealousy. Mallard, I'll get to that in time. Cherry had vaguely promised that she'd remarry Ames. But when he saw his own brother was going to blackmail him, he went crazy. That's when he strung him up with the dummies in the trees. From there, it was just a step to knock off Reginald Dix and have a clear track for himself. Well, I'll go back to what I said to begin with. Why did these characters from Hollywood have to come up here to San Francisco and louse up our scenery, as well as our police department? Oh, to heck with your police department. That's the last time I'm going to climb around a ledge hundreds of feet in the air. Not so strange. Buff Arnold was out on that ledge, too, wasn't he? Oh, Mallard, sometimes you make me... So... That reminds me. I have a date tomorrow night. Sure. With Buff Arnold. No, no, that's tomorrow morning. I'm driving him down to the railroad station. Date for tomorrow night? With you, Mallard, dear. We're going to see a Roy Acuff movie. Oh, Candy. Roy Acuff. Monarch of all the cowboys. Yeah, monarch of all the cowboys. I'll see him with you. Oh. And if that isn't love, I don't know what is. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209. Heard tonight were Hal Burdick as Reginald Dix, John Grover as Ames, the assistant director, Mary Milford as Cherry Dana, Kurt Martell as Buff Arnold, and included in the cast was Ken Langley. Henry Left plays the part of Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's play were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Tonight's engineer was Clarence Stevens. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello, Yukon 2A209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Did you ever know a girl private detective? Perhaps not. They're pretty rare. Well, we've got one. Candy Matson is the name. And she's both pretty and rare. Figure? She picks up where Miss America leaves off. Clothes? She makes a peasant dress look like opening night at the opera. Hair? Blonde, of course. And eyes? Just the right shade of blue to match the hair. You're expecting more? All right, let's meet her. She's on the phone now, in her penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Hello, Candy Matson. Well, bless my ever loving little old serial number, Candy Matson. Watch out how you go tossing your serial number around, Pally. Who is this? Candy, hope you remember me. This is Sergeant Kenley down at Port Ord. Kenley the Galan, uh -huh. the G.I. who filled my slipper with beer and drank it. <laughs> That's me, the poor man's Diamond Jim Brady. Sure, I remember you. I met you when I was down at Port Ord with the U.S.O., What's on your mind, Kenley? Oh, wait a minute. I'll put it this way. What's new? Oh, like this is new. 
We're having a big shindig at the Senior Non-Commissioned Officers Club tomorrow night. Uh, you were elected as the girl most likely. Finish the sentence. Okay. As the girl most likely to be the queen of our ball. Kenny, you mad lad. I'd adore it. But what would I do for a chaperone? A what? Don't play doll. You heard me. Oh, 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 sure. Well, why don't you bring your mother? Wonderful idea. And I know just the fellow. Roger, Kenley. I'll report to the orderly room sometime tomorrow afternoon at Fort Ord. That's the way things happen with me, so casually. I'm at home on Telegraph Hill overlooking San Francisco Bay, polishing a few old sapphires, when the phone rings. Sounds innocent, doesn't it? But uh uh-uh. I ran into two rather grisly murders in Monterey. Want some details? Listen. When I told the sergeant I knew just the fellow to be my mother, I met my old pal Rembrandt Watson. In former days, Rembrandt, an A1 photographer now that he doesn't imbibe, used to see double by noon, triple by four, and complete darkness by eight. One night, the darkness became too dense and he suddenly saw the light. That's when he threw all his bottles out the window. Of course, he was arrested for disturbing the peace, but he hasn't touched a drop since. And when I mentioned Rembrandt as my chaperone, I wasn't fooling. He's been like a mother to me many, many times. He was just back from his vacation, so I got in my car and drove over Powell and down California Street. At Grand Avenue stands Old St. Mary's, and on the bell tower just underneath the clock, there's a sign that says, Son, observe the time and fly from evil. I'd seen it before, but somehow that afternoon it had an added meaning. I parked my car and went across the street to Rembrandt's apartment. Candy. Rembrandt, you old dear, how are you? Wonderful, just wonderful. Darling, you're looking simply grand. <laughs> a slice of thinner, Rembrandt. You've only been gone three weeks. Oh, sorry, dear. So come in, won't you? Mm-hmm. I'm just having some tea. Won't you join me, Candy? I'd love it. It's all ready. Oogly, big, 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 Bob. Wait a minute. What was that again? In case you don't know, Dob, that's Bob. Where did you ever pick up Bob? I was visiting a friend of mine last night, a professor of psychology, over at that institution across the bay. California? No, San Quentin. He's a penologist. He played some Bob records for me. Well, what do you think of Bob, Rembrandt? They say it's the latest thing. Why, girl, I can remember when they were playing Bob back in 1926. You can? Certainly. Only in those days, they called it bo do 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 bo do 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 Here's your tea, Dob. It's warm. Thanks. What brings you by this afternoon, Candy, dear? You. I got an invite to a ball for both of them. How delightful. I'll get my Grand Marshal's uniform out of my trunk. It's not that kind of a ball, Ducky. It's just a dance for soldiers at Fort Ord. Fort Ord? That's down near Monterey. That's right. And I want you to go along as my chaperone. Candy, I'd really love it. Good. I'll pick you up at noon tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. I have an appointment at two. You run along and, and I'll get the Del Monte special. Okay, and I'll pick you up at the station in Monterey. Splendid, splendid. Oh, uh, by the way, dear, I'm just a little... Uh... Oh, sure. Here, take 20. Oh, no, no, not that much, Candy. <laughs> no, 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 yourself, I insist. No, I'm so glad you're firm about these things. Thanks ever so much. Not at all. Thanks for the tea, Rembrandt. I'll see you in Monterey. I gave Rembrandt a little chuck under the chin. He quivered his bushy eyebrows, and I left. If I was going to be queen of a military ball, I had to get some royal raiment. I picked up a mantilla and a strapless evening gown you had to hold up by sheer concentration and deep breathing. <laughs> then I had a quiet dinner for one, please, James, and went home and climbed aboard the Dream Express quite early. When I woke up, I had the nasty feeling that I had something to do. Then I remembered. I had a date that evening with Mallard. That's Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. The nomenclature reads, 6'2", weight 190, nice features. Smart guy when it comes to solving a crime, but... When it comes to talking about us and the future, he freezes up completely. I got dressed and whipped down to the Hall of Justice on Kearney Street. Well, Candy, how's Telegraph Hill's greatest lady detective? At the moment, Mellard, dear, I'm just between detectives. Kind of slow, huh? No, not slow. I just wrapped up a case. Now I want to take it easy for a few days. I've got news for you, Candy. Such as like what? Such as like I can't keep our date for tonight. Oh, Mallard, I'd been counting on it. I know, Candy. I'm sure sorry. But how did I know this guy was going to do what he did out in the Taraval district? Playing straight, I say. What did the guy do out in the Taraval district? He parlayed a sudden impulse into a seat in the gas chamber. How so? He done in his old lady. Mallard, don't talk like that. Okay. He ostracized his wife from the world of the living. With a pipe. That's better. Over the head. I get the picture. 
Anyway, I've got news for you, too. And yours would be? I'd have to break our date tonight anyway. Uh-huh. Well, I just knew I was going to get stood up. And tonight's the night that Tex Acuff is playing in Loves of Laredo. Candy, it's Acuff's best movie. Acuff will just have to keep his chin up. You're busy in the Terravel, and I've got to be at a dance at the NCO club at Fort Ord. Oh, that's right. I am busy tonight. So you're going to Fort Ord, huh? Mm-hmm. Weren't you there a couple of times during the war? That's right. With the USO. That same sergeant still there? The same sergeant. He's the one who asked me tonight. Now, this calls for drastic action. Come here, Candy. Oh, Mallard. <laughs> It was one of those rare moments. Mallard kissed me. Part of me floated out of his office. Then part of me floated back in and picked up the rest of me. Then all of me floated out again. Then I realized I'd forgotten my hat. I went back and got it. Then I saw I didn't have my purse. I went back and got that. Keep this up and you won't even get past Market Street, let alone to Fort Ord. That Mallard, he can do the sweetest thing sometimes. That was one of them. I got in the car, shifted into low, and that's the last I remember until I came to in front of the rancho in Carmel. Obviously, one kiss from Mallard was better than a tank full of hundred-proof octane. I registered, got a cabana out and back, showered, changed, and drove back into town. The drive down must have been dusty because I was extremely dry. So I stopped at Griff, a cute little place with old theatrical pictures all over the walls. Yes, miss? Would you care for something? Oh, yes, a, a martini, please. Very dry. Very dry. Righto. You're new here, aren't you? Yes, I am. I started working here about three weeks ago. I thought so. I was down about a month ago, but I don't remember seeing you. No, the fellow who was here became ill. Mr. Griffin hired me. Nice place to work. Oh, yes. It's very enjoyable. Here you are, miss. Thank you. I I know you don't know who I am, but I'm a very good friend of Mr. Griffin's, and I came away without any money. Could you cash a check for me? Well, I don't know. I'd like to, but... Do you have any identification with you? Oh, yes, of course. Here, my driver's license. Matson. Candy Matson. Mm-hmm. Now I know why I thought I recognized you. Aren't you presiding over the dance tonight at Fort Ord? Well, yes. Why? I saw your picture in the paper yesterday. Yesterday? What? I only knew about it myself. Yes. Oh, that Kenley. What an operator. I'll be happy to cash your check, Miss Matson. <laughs> Good. I'm going to need it. A queen has to scatter a little gold amongst her subjects. The lad cashed my check and I left for the fort. I drove out past Seaside, then on past Ord Village onto the reservation itself. The guard motioned me through the south gate with a wave of his hand and a... <whistles> yep, still the same old Fort Ord. I wove my way through the streets and finally pulled up in front of the senior NCO club. As I got out, there was my pal, Kenley, coming down the steps in his fatigue jet. Oh, Candy, you beautiful thing, you. Don't you beautiful thing me, Sergeant Kenley. What's the matter? You know what's the matter. They printed a picture of me in the Monterey Herald yesterday. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong? When the paper came out yesterday, I hadn't even heard about your wing ding tonight. Oh, don't be mad, Candy. Uh, I've never seen you say no to a worthwhile cause yet. This is a worthwhile cause? That's right. Every cent we take in, we're turning over to the community chest. Oh, well, that puts a different light on it. Oh, I knew you'd see it that way. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. You don't charge for these NCO dances. How are you getting any proceeds out of it? Oh, I didn't tell you, did I? Every half hour having a raffle. The highest bidder gets a free dance. With you. Oh, that Kenley. Well, it was getting dark, and the Del Monte special with Rembrandt aboard would soon be pulling in. So I went back to Monterey. All of a sudden, I decided to play games. About a mile from town, the train stops at Del Monte itself. I thought it might be cute if I went back, got on the train there, and met Rembrandt that way. There she was, coming right in on schedule. I parked the car and went over to the little country-like station. The train wasn't in sight yet. It has to make the bend around Seaside. There it was. Now the headlight was sending its beam down the shining rails. It stood out like a beacon in the Monterey twilight. Then... I saw it. The glare of the locomotive's light picked up the crumpled body of a man. It was stretched across the tracks in a grotesque manner. Suddenly, my mind flashed a signal to my feet, and I moved. It was a man, all right. 
The train was getting closer. I grabbed him by his lead like shoulders and tugged. He wouldn't budge. I tried again, but still no luck. I looked down in desperation. That's when I saw that one of his feet was jammed between the rail and the tie. I gave a yank and the foot came free. Then I grabbed him by the shoulders again. He must have weighed over 200, but little by little I was getting his body over the rails and off under the shoulder. Finally I made it, just as the Del Monte rolled by. <laughs> The body had fallen over on top of me as I pulled him away from the rails. I shoved him to one side and he flopped over. As he did so, I realized my companion was very cold, very limp, and very dead. A card fell out of his pocket and I did the natural thing and picked it up. By that time, the train was pulling out. I tried to catch it, but it was too late. It was only a mile into Monterey, so I left my cold friend and drove in after the train. I got snarled in a traffic jam just before I made the right turn into the station. The Rembrandt was waiting for me as I drove up. Gerald, how nice of you. Right on time. Never mind the salutations. Come on, we've got work to do. Don't tell me I'm supposed to take your place at the ball tonight. No. I've discovered a body. Andy, dear, how occupational. How irritational. Come on, let's go. Where? Monterey Sheriff's Office. But you'll miss the ball, girl. Not tonight, I won't. I darn near got killed myself. Tonight I'm going to have fun. Let's go. I went over to the sheriff's office. They have a staff of nine men. I placed everything in their capable hands and drove Rembrandt over one of the local hotels. I went back to the rancho, climbed into my strapless queen outfit, and went back to pick him up. He came out with a bewildered look on his face. I didn't say anything. We drove along through the Ord reservation, and finally I popped the question. Okay, Rembrandt, what's wrong? Nothing, except this. What's this? A card. While I was dressing, a man knocked on me door, shoved this into me hand, and told me to tell you about it, and left. Let me see it. Here. Oh, careful, now. Don't go off the road. The military wouldn't like that. They dislike messy thoughts. Wait a minute. Look through my purse, Rembrandt. Precisely, for what? For a card that matches this one. Mm hmm. Lipstick, lighter, handkerchief. Oh, here we are. You're right, Candy. It matches exactly. Does it make sense? Not yet. This is a warning, Rembrandt. A warning to keep my nose out of somebody's business. Yes, but what's this on the card? I don't understand. I thought you were studying the cello, Rembrandt, dear. Oh, I am. Then you should know what that is. That's the musical signature for F sharp. <laughs> The gent who gave Rembrandt the card had obviously been following us since we left the sheriff's office. Now I knew I was in on something. But what? That body didn't crawl on the tracks all by itself. It was placed there deliberately in hopes the train would mangle all evidence. I'd have to worry about that later. I had a date to keep, and I was going to keep it. Once again, I pulled up in front of the senior non-commissioned officers' club. Rembrandt helped me out, and we went in. The joint was really jumping. As we went in, dear old Sergeant Kenley was there to greet us. Oh, Candy. I'm oh, glad you're here. I was getting worried. Ha, ha, ha. He's worried. Yes. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. I don't get it. That's all right, Sergeant. Kenley, I want you to know Rembrandt Watson, my chaperone this evening. You're, uh, you're... Uh, uh, glad to know you, sir. You didn't talk down to me, Sergeant. I have campaign ribbons for just such battles as this. Okay, Kenley. When do we start the raffle? Right now. Come on, Candy. If ever a girl gave her all for the army, that was I. I danced until my insteps had insteps. Going on toward midnight, they started another raffle. A dark-looking sergeant did six dollars, and I was to dance with him. Rembrandt was fighting the Boxer Rebellion all over again with some top kick, so I was stuck, but good. Miss Matson, that was my last six dollars. You shouldn't have done it, Sergeant. Oh, it was worth it. But if you don't mind, I'd rather not dance. Ah, oh, Sergeant, for those kind words, I make you a lieutenant. Ah, uh, no thanks. I'd rather be a sergeant. <laughs> uh, but would you mind walking outside on the terrace? It's awfully stuffy in here. Sergeant, it would be a pleasure, believe me. We went outside. The night was strictly moderation. Sparkling with stars, not warm, not cold, and a slight smell of sardines in the air. That's good. That meant the canneries were working. But speaking of the smell of fish... Uh, let's go this way, shall we? I... Why? There's a beautiful view of the entire bay from over here. Look, Sergeant, I only came down here to... I dance. should come with me. What? You're hurting my oh, arm. 
Now, wait just a minute, Sergeant. Oh, you wait, Candy Matson. I know who you are. You had to come down here where you weren't wanted. You don't seem to understand that. You had to go find a body on the tracks. And you ended up with two cards that were identical, didn't you? Give me those two cards. I I haven't got them. (gasps) Don't give me that. Where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't got any cards. Okay, sister. You ask for it. The sky was whirling. Time was nothing. I was in China. I was in Cuba. I was nowhere. Suddenly, things came into focus. I was out in back of the club, and Rembrandt and half a dozen G.I.s were standing over me. Well, there, Ducky. You're going to be all right. What happened? I got slugged. That's what happened. And the rat only bid six bucks for the privilege. How do you feel, Dal? Terrible. Oh, Kenny, I feel terrible, too. I don't know how this could have happened. Hi, Kenley. Oh, my head. Oh, gee, I I, I, I just can't apologize enough. That's all right. I came down here to be queen of the ball. I got crowned, didn't I? I thank Sergeant Kenley for the party. It was a nice affair. After all, it was no fault of the NCO club or Fort Ord that I got wrapped over the head. So I got Rembrandt in the car and we drove back into Carmel. Rembrandt was quite concerned. He suggested that we stop and I have a touch of brandy. I didn't argue. We went into grip. Oh, good evening. You wish something? Yes, please. Uh, brandy for the lady. Lemon Coke for me. A uh, brandy and a... What was that again? A glass of water. A glass of water, yes. Yeah. Hold it. Uh, you weren't here this afternoon. No, I worked the evening shift. Frankie's here during the afternoon. Frankie? That's right. Frankie Sharp. <laughs> That's when Roman candles went off and bells started to ring. Thinking back to the afternoon, the guy who cashed my check had one slight characteristic. I remembered as he handed me the money, his cufflinks were stamped musically, F sharp. I must have had a funny look on my face because Rembrandt spoke. What's the matter, dear? Doesn't the brandy agree with you? No, no, it's not that. I'm trying to put one and one together to make two, but it doesn't add. Uh Uh-oh. Looks like we're going to have company. Pardon me, Miss Matson. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, Corporal. Everybody's getting into the act tonight. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. I just heard the regrettable news. You're getting slugged at the club. I, I left just before, I guess. How did it happen? He was a sergeant. He outranked me. Oh, incidentally, my name is Case. Dave Case. Fourth MP Company at the Fort. Glad to know you, Case. This is Mr. Rembrandt Watson. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Where's your accoutrement? What? You're a billy club and pistol, your armband and so on. <laughs> I don't wear them when I'm not on duty, Mr. Watson. <laughs> You're in good hands, Candy. I've got to leave and stand the place where they only serve you water. That's what you asked for, Rembrandt. I know. Yield not to temptation, I always say. Glad to have met you, Corporal Case. Mm. Good night, Candy, dear. Uh, see you in the morning. You two just stay and talk over the battle of the bows, that knob on Candy's head. <laughs> good night, Rembrandt. Does he always duck out on you like that, Miss Matson? He's a man of whims. That's why I like him. Mm. Mm, this brandy isn't doing anything for me. What I need is some air. Corporal, do me a favor and walk me down to the beach and back, will you? Why, oh, I'd be delighted. We left Griff's and walked down Ocean Avenue to the beach. There was a half moon shining down from the east and hitting the waves. It made the ocean look almost luminous. <laughs> Feel a little better, Miss Matson? Yes. Mm. I wonder what that character hit me with. Come on, Corporal. Let's go along the beach a little way. Aren't you cold? No, this is fine. Wait. Wait a minute, Kate. Hmm? What? Down there. Right at the water's edge. Looks like the body of a man. I... I... You're right. Let's go. <laughs> We ducked around a clump of brush and hightailed it down to the water. Sure enough, it was a sprawled figure of a man. Every time a wave came in, the body would change position, setting new patterns of crumpled legs and oddly shaped arms. <clears throat> Give me a hand, Kate. Yep. Help me roll him over. Okay. There. Hey. Look at this. What, Miss Matson? Do you know who this joker is? This is the lad who flattened my skull at the dance tonight. Oh, I'll bet he's awfully sorry he did it now. He's... Quite dead. A 
Corporal and I pulled and tugged and finally got the boy high and dry up on the beach. Then we ran up to my cabin. <coughs> Operator? They must have closed the switchboard for tonight. Well, you wait here, Miss Matson. I'll run up into town. There's usually a prowl car there at this hour. Okay, but hurry, Corporal. <laughs> Case slammed out the door and I was left alone. I walked over to the cabinet, got a cigarette and lit it. Thoughts were going through my head like a roulette wheel, but none of the thoughts were dropping in the right slot. And suddenly... Did you ever get the feeling you weren't alone? That a pair of eyes was watching your every move? I wheeled around. There he was, standing over by the closet door. Good evening. My bartender friend of the afternoon. Enjoying your cigarette, Miss Matson? Yes. Yes, I am, Mr. Sharp. Fine. Drag on it. Drag deeply. The last drag always tastes the best. What's on your mind? You. You've been on my mind ever since you pulled that body off the tracks this evening. Was that one of your jobs? Oh, yes. Hadn't you surmised by my musical signature? Wasn't that being rather dramatic? I don't think so. All great artists sign their work. Why shouldn't I? I came here to paint. But they only laughed at me. Jeered. So I decided to paint in a different manner. It was beginning to pay dividends, too. But you and the others, you had to spoil it. I could have been big. Do you understand? I could have owned this whole country. Oh, no, Frankie. You leave too many of your cards around. Recognition. There has to be recognition for everything done in this world. Look. Here. I've got another F-sharp card, Miss Matson. So I see. I made it especially for you. About an hour ago. Is that when you held your pal's head under the surf down there on the beach? Shortly after, yes. And now I shall have to work fast, won't I? Your corporal friend with the muscles will be returning with the police. Over there against the wall, Miss Matson. You can't get away with this, Frankie. I think I can. You see, everything I touch must either live or die. In your case, it's too late for the former. So die, you must. Corporal! Get back, Miss Matson. This guy's nuts. Looks like I'll have to add another. Oh! Corporal, you all right? Just got me on the shoulder. All right, Mac. Uh, try this. Uh, 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 <laughs> Hang on to his gun, Arn. I'll try to get him with his lamp. Never mind that. He's going to drop that gun right now. Oh, oh, oh. Quick, Corporal, down the hall. You better hold it, Sharp. I'm warning you. Okay, you are for it. Sharp was quite flat there at the bottom of the stairs. And Sharp, being flat, was a natural. He looked awfully good that way. All I can say is I am terribly grateful for Fordor's highly efficient MPs. Case had ducked out to get the police, but halfway down the stairs he heard Sharp's voice in my room. He tiptoed back and listened just long enough outside my door. Just as Frankie had leveled his pistol at my head, Case broke through and wrestled the gun out of Sharp's hand. <laughs> Oh, the rest of the facts? Well, I've got the discerned data right here. Frankie Sharp was a wise boy. He was dishonorably discharged from the Army in 1946. He came to the Monterey area with a complete load of Army uniforms, fatigues, and general equipment. He set up a little ring of other ex-GIs with bad records, all dishonorably discharged also, all professional gamblers. On Army paydays, he'd rig his mob out with GI uniforms. Then they'd gang up on the boys from the camp and take them for all their dough with marked cards and loaded dice. The gang was familiar with army routine, so it was easy for them to make like real soldiers. But Frankie Sharp was keeping too much of the loot for himself, so he decided to set up a new gang. One by one, he had his boys marked for sudden and violent death. The first was the guy I pulled off the tracks. Sharp and the fake sergeant who slugged me were parked up on the highway watching to see the Del Monte special put on the finishing touches. When the gag misfired, they followed me, found out where Rembrandt was staying, slipped in one of their business cards as a warning for me to stay out. But the fake sergeant turned chicken. He didn't want those F-sharp notes all over the area. 
So he came out to the NCO club, bopped me over the head, and got them back. When he returned, Frankie knew the fat was in the fire and that the time to strike was then. So he took his pal down to the beach, gave him a finger wave and a permanence, the kind you don't wake up from. Then he went back to my cottage to wait for me. Sharp was his own undoing. The poor guy was a megalomaniac and insisted on signing his works of art. His greatest masterpiece, though, was one he autographed. It was called Picture of a Corpse at the Bottom of a Stairway. Because when we went down to look at his body, he still had his own F-sharp card clutched in his rigid fingers. Corporal Keith? Good boy. He's been studying criminology with the United States Armed Forces Institute. He was discharged about a month later, and because of his considerable amount of gray matter, was promised the first opening with the Monterey Sheriff's Office. Ah, oh, me, it's beautiful around Monterey and Carmel. The soft ocean, the gently rising knolls, especially the one on my head. That's the last time I'm going to be queen of a ball. Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson. Yukon 28209. Heard tonight for John Grover as Sergeant Kenley, Lou Tobin as the pseudo sergeant, Kurt Martell as Corporal Dave Case, and Jerry Walter as Frankie Sharp. Henry Leff is Inspector Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas betrays the role of Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Eloise Rowan was at the organ, and sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Corporal David C. Case is an actual person. Any resemblance to other people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> Candy, how's the one woman uh, Scotland Yard? Oh, okay, Inspector. If business was any better, you fellows could all retire on your big fat pensions. Is Mallard in his office? Oh, sure. I just left him there. He's working on a deal, but it's all right. A deal? Oh, I won't bother him then. It's all right. When last observed, he was uh, perched neatly on the horns of a dilemma. Ouch. <laughs> well, in that case, I'd better go in, Inspector. Right oh, Drop around any time. High heels sound so much nicer than flat feet. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Lieutenant Mallard. Candy, for Pete's sake, I wish you'd knock when you'd come in here. Why? Well, I might have been, uh... What, Mallard? Asleep or something. <laughs> well, now that you're in, pull up a chair and set a spell. I heard you were busy. You heard I was busy, so you barge right in? I can always barge right out again, you know. No, 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 stick around. I've done all I can for now. What have you got, a murder? In homicide, I'd be working on a purse snatching. <laughs> here, take a look. Ever see anything like that before? Nope. Looks like a small medallion of some kind. I don't think so. Near as I can figure, it's the symbol of an order or a cult. You recognize the characters on it? Oh, they seem to have an Egyptian flavor. That was my thinking, too. However, I'm not an Egyptologist. You can always take it over to the University of California. <gasps> University of California? What's wrong with that? Well, it'd be like cutting off my own nose. I've got Stanford and six points in the big game. After what UCLA did to them? Oh, no, sir. From now on, I will knock before I come in here. And if I get an answer, I'm going to leave. You've got a point there. I know I have. Uh, I mean about taking this over to the university. Hey, wait a minute. Why didn't I think of it before? Why? Rembrandt. He has a brushing acquaintance with the Egyptian language and writing. Rembrandt? Rembrandt Watson? Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. He spent quite a bit of time in Egypt before the war. Come on, get in the car and we'll drive over to his place. I've got to see him anyway. Oh, I'm sorry, Kenny. No can do. i got to be in Judge Wallach's court in ten minutes. Well, let me have it and I'll take it over to him. If Rembrandt comes up with anything, I'll report right back. Okay, just don't lose it, that's all. Why? Can't you get another one? Well, not this particular one we can't. We took it off the body of a woman they found floating last night in Stowe Lake. 
Stow Lake and Golden Gate Park? Mm-hmm. Oh, what a charming place to take your last bath. Oh, I almost forgot what I came here for to begin with. Here's the book I borrowed from you, Mallard, dear. Book? Which book is that? Latest facts and figures on the rise and fall of crime throughout the Western Hemisphere, plus a comprehensive digest on criminal trends in the United States as compiled by police departments of major cities throughout the country. Oh, thanks. Did you get anything out of it? The book? Heck no. I just barely managed to get through the title. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. I slipped the medallion into my coin purse, slipped the coin purse into my handbag, slipped Mallard a peck on the cheek, and slipped out of the Hall of Justice. I climbed into my car and drove over to California Street opposite Old St. Mary's Cathedral, almost bordering Little Alley facing St. Mary's Square. It is there that a very old friend of mine lives, Rembrandt Watson, the eminent Pacific Coast photographer. I'm so glad you came by, Dove. Today of all days, I need the firm stanchion of your friendship upon which to brace myself. Rembrandt, what on earth are you talking about? Never has the weight of gloom rested so heavily on me shoulders. Never has the mantle of depression hung all my head as it does oh, now. Oh, put the hand back in the icebox. What gives here, Ducky? You are gazing upon a man about to be bereft of a home. You mean you're being evicted? Not yet. One must face eventualities. Can't you pay your rent? Is that it? Oh, no, be silly, Candy. I have plenty of money. Well, then in heaven's name, why the Hamlet routine? What do you mean you're going to be evicted? Well, simply this, girl. A bunch of uncouth varlets are going to build an underground garage in the square next door. <laughs> May I ask what is so funny? <laughs> well, you probably won't have to move. Chances are they'll never touch this building. But think, Candy. The dirt, the noise. Well, I've never known either one to affect you before, Rembrandt. It's not myself I'm thinking about. It's Henry, me great Dane. All those steam shovels and riveting machines <laughs> that have to give Henry a nervous stomach. And on a great Dane, that's something. Yes, isn't it? And here's something that'll prove I'll be evicted. Look, this morning's paper. Mm -hmm. Right down here. Uh, preliminary to construction of a garage beneath St. Mary's Square was approved yesterday by the Board of Supervisors Finance Committee. The project, recommended by the San Francisco Parking Authority, involves use of St. Mary's Park subsurface area and seven adjacent parcels of privately owned property in the area bounded by Kearney, Pine, California, and St. Anne Street. There. Do you see what I mean? Well, I'd hardly call this hovel a, a parcel, but yes, I do see what you mean. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, what can I do about it? Look for a new place to live, that's all. Laddie boy, I'm glad you said that. I've been meaning to have a word with you for quite some time. Now, you're doing a whale of a good business. More and more, you're catering to an extremely fashionable clientele. Well, that's true. It's about time you lived the part. Your photographs are becoming known throughout the country. You couldn't have stayed here much longer anyway. But it has such atmosphere, Candy. Uh, that it does, especially when the wind's from the east. I tell you what, you help me on a little deal right now, and I'll spend the rest of the day looking at places with you. Oh, Candy, will you? I was hoping you'd say that. You're the lamb. Mm -hmm. In the spring, I am. Oh, I get it. Spring lamb. Yes. Oh, la. <laughs> I feel ever so much better already. Atta boy. But before you bound completely out of your skin, Ducky, take a look at this. Wait a minute. There. Hmm. Fascinating. What is it? An amulet of some kind? I don't know. That's why I came to see you. What does it say on there? It's in the Arabic. Awfully fine print. What did I do with my glasses? On your forehead. Oh. Uh, El Magi, El Hada, El Mastakbao. Hmm. There's one I can't seem to translate. Wait a moment. Oh, of course. Milky. What does it mean, Rembrandt? Well, I'm not exactly sure of my translation, but I take it to read the past, the present, the future are mine. Well, that sounds good enough to me. Let me make a phone call, dear, and I'll be right with you. Tell me, Ducky, does that expression mean anything to you? Have you ever heard it before? No. There are literally thousands of such sayings in Arabic. You could refer to almost anything. That's what I was wondering about. Hmm. Headquarters, Delucci speaking. Oh, hello, Delucci. This is Candy Matson. Is Lieutenant Mallard there? Lieutenant Mallard, no, Miss Matson. He left with Judge Wallach and the jury on that happy dance supermarket killing. Out of Lake Merced. Probably be there the rest of the afternoon. Oh, okay. Uh, would you write this down for me? Okay. El Maji, El Hader, El Mastakbal, Who Milky. Uh, Miss Matson, this is a phone conversation? It's legit. 
Uh, well, in that case, Gesundheit. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, have you got that? I guess so. Good. Just sign my name to it and put it on Mallard's desk, will you? Uh, sure, if you say so. Thanks, well, Delucci. Uh, Goodbye. Candy, are you crazy? Mallard won't understand that. Crazy? Hmm. Just the other way around. This is one night I know I'm going to get Mallard to call me. Candy, you fool. <laughs> but you're a nice fool. Just having you assure me that moving from here is the right thing to do has removed all my troubled thoughts. Transform me into a, a, a blithe spirit. A blithe spirit. <laughs> well, come on, blithe spirit. Let's go haunt for houses. <laughs> Knowing Rembrandt as I do, he's the sort of a man who would open a doll factory across the street from a boys' school. But in this case, I was going to make sure he'd fit the locale to the business and vice versa. But what was the locale to be? Suddenly, I had it. It was a barn type of building out on Octavia Street, just off Pacific. It used to be a dance studio, but somehow or other, I seem to recall a for rent sign on the place. And that's where we went. What is it, Candy? Looks like the place might have been a stable. Ooh, I imagine it was at one time. I do know it was a dance studio for a while. It's for rent, all right. There's the sign. Mm -hmm. I hope we can get in. You'll like it, I'm sure. It's just ideal for a photography studio. And it has plenty of room upstairs for living quarters and a fine big backyard out and back for Henry. It sounds ideal. If I could only see it. Let's walk around to that little wooden bridge at the side. Maybe there's a window we can peek through. If not, we'll run down to the real estate office. You see? Mm -hmm. The outside needs fixing up, but not too much. No, as a matter of fact, if the place is any kind of shape at all and the owner is willing to talk business, I might be interested in buying the place. What? Well, why not? Now that I'm in the mood, and I've saved a fair amount of money the past year or two. Oh, here's a window. Pretty dirty. Wait a minute. Can you see anything, Candy? Hmm? A little. Enough to give you an idea how much space you have in the studio itself. Here, you take a look. Hmm. Oh, oh, it's wonderful. Just perfect. I could do all the portrait work up in front there and put all the equipment back in the... Oh! Ducky, what is it? I saw a man in there. Let's see. He's motioning to us. I don't understand what... Is there a door down that way, Rembrandt? Wait, let's take a look. Yes, I see one. Oh, that's what he wants. Come on. Do you suppose he is, dear? Caretaker, maybe. We'll find out. Was there something you wanted? We're just looking around. We saw the sign out in front. Are you the caretaker? No, no. I am the owner. Oh, then you live here. Again, no. There was a fire here last night. I, I came over to investigate. A fire? Yes. There wasn't much damage done. One of the neighbors saw it, and the fire department arrived almost immediately. Lucky for you. Uh, how much rent are you asking? I'm afraid you'll have to take that up with the real estate people. I let them handle all my transaction. Would you be willing to sell? I might, but that's something you have to discuss with them, too. That sounds odd, does it not? But much better off if I don't transact my own business. Sure. Sure. Would you mind if we looked around? Mr. Watson here is rather interested. I'm afraid that is out of the question. You see, the electricity has been turned off. You would have to use matches. We'll be very careful, sir. I've got matches right here in my purse. No, no, no. It is impossible. After what happened last night, I'm afraid things might be misunderstood. I should be accused of... Accused? Accused of what, Mr... Uh... And uh, what did you say your name was? I didn't. And neither did you. We, uh, we have a quaint custom here in the United States. I am not interested in custom. I'm only interested in keeping my appointment. You keep your appointment, I assure you. Do you remember High Low Rembrandt? Oh, yes. A quaint little device used with a great deal of success on the gridiron. Yes. Would you like to take High and I'll take Low? A pleasure, really. Now? Now? Oh, oh. Get his arms if you can, Rembrandt. I'm trying to think this like an eel. I, I think he needs a little persuasion on the head like so... Oh, dear. I hope you didn't tap him too hard. No, he just went sleepy by for a little while. May I ask the reason for this unwomanly outburst on your part, Dove? You certainly may, Slugger. Look, up there on that beam above us. Oh, dear. Where are my glasses? <laughs> Back up on your forehead. Oh. Now, what did you want me to see? Up there. A sign on that beam. Just barely visible, but you can make it out. Candy, no. El Madi, El Hada, 
El Mas that foul, whom? Milky. Sure. I saw it when we first came in. When the boy on the floor mentioned matches, it gave me a perfectly natural chance to open my purse and flash the medallion. He saw it, all right. He stopped like he'd been sapped. He was? Twice, yes. Once by the medallion, once by me. I think we've got something, Rembrandt. Come on, let's get to a phone and call Mallard quick. And may I say something, Ducky? Oh, certainly, dear. Well, I shouldn't say it, but that was the prettiest high-low I've ever seen. <laughs> From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 2 I left my gun with Rembrandt, who by this time was sitting on our little friend. I took off, found a grocery store about three blocks down, and placed a call to Mallard. Fortunately, he was in, and after I told him what was happening, he was out again, this time headed for the former dance studio. I ran back to the place, and Sleeping Beauty was showing signs of coming, too, with Rembrandt still riding a choppy sea on the guy's twisting chest. I'm so glad you're back, girl. Miss Steed is beginning to buck a bit, and I did so want to avoid smacking him on the noggin again. Yeah, I don't blame you. After a while, it begins to hurt. Here, give me the gun, Rembrandt. Thanks. Now, stand back. If the Joker tries anything, there's going to be badminton with bullets for birds. Did you get mad Yes, he'll be here in a moment or two. In the Hall of Justice? That'll be forever. You don't know Mallard when he has a chance to play with that siren. Oh. Yeah, Tessman's snapping out of it. Oh. I think, miss, you will regret exceedingly what you have done. Maybe so, maybe no. Now, uh, care to tell us about this past, present, and future our mind stuff? I'm not saying a word. Does it surprise you I know the translation? You might as well tell us. You'll have to in the long run. I have nothing to say, and I mean that. I'll bet you do. Wait a minute. See who it is, Rembrandt. It's Mallard and his platoon system. Good. Open the door for them. Well, this is cozy. All you need is a fourth for bridge. Can I kibitz? He's all yours, Footlet. Okay, get him, boys. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. You haven't seen the building. The building can wait. This cookie's hot, and I want to keep him that way. Like I said, boys, take him away. Give him that big hall of justice. One, two, three, O'Leary, and we were at the jailhouse on Washington Street. Four, five, six, O'Leary, and our lad was whisked away into the inner sanctums for a pleasant little game called Information, Please. Seven, eight, nine, O'Leary, and Mallard was back in his office snorting fire at me. And when he snorts fire, Sister Susie, it's frightening. What are you trying to do? Have the whole city administration down on my neck? But, Mallard, what do you mean? I'll tell you what I mean. We've arrested a man who's completely in the clear. He can shoot the works at us, sue us for false arrest. Wait a minute. Something's off the beam here. What's his name? Tessman, Al Tessman. How do you know he's in the clear? Because we checked just now. He's been a respectable citizen of San Francisco for over 20 years. Owns a lot of real estate around town. Fine reputation, excellent credit, the works. And you have to stir up a hornet's nest. I I don't know what to say. I do. Go home and stay there. I have a hunch the guy's going to press an assault and battery charge against you and Rembrandt. And he's got every legal right to do it, too. Yipes. I wonder how I'll look in stripes. (laughs) Mallard was just plain out and out sore. Judging the mess on its face value, he was entitled to be sore. But I'm not the gal to take things on face value. That sign on the beam out at the old studio definitely had a link with the inscription on the amulet. I was sure of it. And I was sure that Tessman was a link, too. So I fell back on the private eye's first lesson, how to shadow a suspect. The use of doorways, trees, buildings, shrubs, fences, and etc. So hiding behind an etc., I waited outside the Hall of Justice until I saw Tessman leave the building. All he did was snag a cab and disappear into an apartment house on the top of Clay Street. I checked the ground floor and found there were only three outlets. The main entrance, the service entrance alongside, and the garage around the corner. I parked across the street where I could see all three and waited. And waited. About 2 a.m., I figured Tessman had holed up for the night, so I went home and got myself a nice little jolt. My penthouse was a mess. It looked like a senior-grade monsoon had ripped through the place. It stacked up that Tessman couldn't have done it, so there must be somebody else who wanted in on the act. As far as I could tell, nothing was missing, so I straightened up as best I could and hit the sack. The alarm went off at 5 o'clock the next morning, and I struggled into my clothes, drove over to Rembrandt's place, rustled him into my car, and we took off. 
You're mad, Candy. Positively mad. What's the idea of waking me up in the middle of the night? It's not the middle of the night, Dougie. It's morning. Remember, the early birds get the worms. For the change, I'd like to see the early worm get the bird. <sighs> what are we doing gallivanting about like this? We're putting the shadow on Tessman. Is he the worm? One of them. In spite of the fact that Mallard whitewashed him. <sighs> here we are. How lush. The Blake Essex. We'll just park here. Hunch down in your seat, Ducky. I hardly imagine our worm has departed yet. A half hour passed by, just as the sun peeked over the East Bay Hills and scattered its own bright rays on the water of the bay, a car backed out of the Blake Essex garage. It was Tessman, all right. He wheeled the car down Clay Street, and we followed. He turned left on Taylor, and again when he reached Pacific. I had a hunch where he was going. He crossed Van Ness Avenue, and we did likewise. That was when Rembrandt spoke up. I hate to mention it, dear, but I think the shadowers are being shadowed. How do you mean? I looked behind several times. There seems to be a car following us. Oh, just a coincidence. I wouldn't worry about it. Look, our boy's turning off onto Octavia. Just as I thought, he's returning to the studio. What do we do now? Go as slowly as we can. Give him time to park the car, get inside the building, and then go in after him. Are you sure you know what you're doing, Candy? Nope. Oh. Well, then it's all right. We'll go past Octavia to Laguna, then down to Broadway and come back from that direction. That should do it. Now to double back along Broadway. I dislike being repetitious, girl, but the car's still following us. Well, there's nothing like a showdown. Here we are at Octavia. Let's find out. Look, across the street at the studio... Out in front there. Bags of cement, sand, and a pile of bricks. That wasn't there when we left yesterday. No. There's our friend, Candy, if he is. Well, I'm going to find out about this right now. Please, Miss Matson, remain seated in your car. There's a gun, Candy. That's a naive observation, Rembrandt. Looks more to me like a cannon. I assure you I won't hesitate using it. Now, if you and Mr. Watson will get out in an orderly manner and walk across the street into the studio, there will be no trouble. Looks like we have no choice. Come on, Ducky. This should be great sport. When you have a gun that size poking into your nose, it's easy to be convinced. We walked across the street and into the studio. Even with the brilliant morning sunshine outside, the place was dark and grim. And Tessman Lad was waiting to meet us, wearing the very latest in smirks. Just as you planned, Master. It was so easy. They fell into our trap beautifully. And now they shall feel no pain. To work, Tessman. There can be no further delay. Yes, Master. It he, shall be done. He calls me Master. And that is as it should be. Now, Miss Matson, now that you've so conveniently returned to our shrine, the amulet, please. I, uh, haven't got it. I left it at home in another purse. It wasn't in your place last night. Ah. So you're the character who wrecked my apartment. That is right. And now, if you will be so kind as to empty your purse on the table there. You better do it, Candy. Yes. There seems to be no alternative. Ah. Now the coin purse, please. Ah, yes, the amulet. Thank you. There's a streetcar token, too. You can have that if you want it. The past, the present, the future are mine. Mine, Miss Matson. An old saying of one of the ancient pharaohs. I adopted it for myself. Rather brilliant, wouldn't you say? I'd say you need a new scriptwriter. Now I shall tell you about your future. This building, being on a hill, was built on solid rock foundations... My faithful servant, Tess Mann, is an expert stonemason. You see that chamber-like affair hewn into the rock? Tess Mann is going to build a brick wall across it. You are going to be sealed inside, also like the ancient pharaohs. Only it will take more than a Howard Carter or a Lord Carnarvon to discover you. <laughs> The guy was a madman, and a madman usually keeps his word. Tessman went to work. 
Little by little, the ceiling wall of bricks took shape. Once I pressed my hand against the bricks. They must have been using a fast-hardening mortar mix of some kind. The wall was as firm as the ages. Zoma smiled. Finally, there was an opening just large enough to crawl through. That's when Zoma spoke up. Enough, Tessman. I will complete the work. As you will, Master. My mission here is finished. You three are the only ones who know about me. And so I shall destroy all evidence and move on to newer fields. Tessman, in you go. What? Master, no. No. I have served you faithfully. I said get in. No. I won't die. I won't. Not even for you. What? That fool. The future belongs to me. You two, get him. What? Shove him into the tomb. Now. I trust you won't be quite so idiotic. Suffocation isn't too unbearable. <laughs> I think I shall call this the Tomb of the Wayward Three. <laughs> yes, that will be good. Is he in? Yes. Very well. You may follow. Go ahead, Rembrandt. I'm sorry I got you into this. That's all right. And now for the final act. A complete obliteration. Ah, yes. People all over the world have lost their way. They struggle in darkness. It is up to me to bring them the truth. For after all, El Hadi, El Hader, El Mostak Balhum Milki, all mine. What about that woman you dumped in this stove lake, Zoma? A very generous lady. She contributed over $15,000 to the cause. But then the poor thing began to doubt me. Said something about going to the authority. Most unfortunate. It was then that even I, Zoma, made a mistake. I forgot about the amulet I had given her. She was still wearing it about her neck. I will not make that error again. And now, like the final toast to life, the last brick. Sleep well, foolish ones. Forever. Get your hands straight up in the what? air, Mac. You, you desecrator. I said get your hands up. Yes, I will, like this. Candy, where are you? Over here, Mallard. Behind this brick wall. A fine thing, that's all I've got to say. Running around and messing things up. Boy, he's really got you tucked away, hasn't he? Come on, Mallard, get us out of here. We can hardly breathe. We? Rembrandt and I. Oh, no. Your pal Tessman, who's past breathing. Boy, you can sure do it, can't you, Candy? I think I ought to leave you in there. You almost messed this whole thing up. I did? How? Why did you think we released Tessman? Tessman. Yeah, I know. Ali Tessman. I'll call him Tessman. Because it was the first lead we got on this Joker Zoma. We've been after him for months. Why? Playing on the superstitious people with a yen for the occult. We had nothing to go on until we fished that woman out of Stowe Lake with the amulet around her neck. And you have to go and stick your pretty nose into the picture. What about Tessman? Uh, up until he met Zoma, he was okay. Doing quite well in real estate. Then along came the master. Tessman turned over the studio for Zoma to use as a temple. But after he dumped the tomato into Stowe Lake... Zoma realized he'd have to uh, liquidate his affairs and get the bejavers to other parts of the country. With you and Rembrandt making like cops and robbers, he knew he had three people to get out of the way. He almost got away with it. But how did you get here when you did? Sheer luck, Cupcake. I was only returning to make a routine checkup on this joint. Sister, are you lucky? You can say that again. All right, sister, are you? Oh. On second thought, maybe you aren't. What do you mean, Mallard, dear? If there's one thing I can't stand, it's an interfering woman. I think I'll just leave you in there. Mallard, no! Irene, good night. Oh. Irene, good night. Mallard, you can't do this. Irene, get us out of here. Uh, oh, 
Okay. On one condition. Sure, sure. What is it? Promise you'll go to a Roy Acuff movie with me tonight. Roy Acuff movie? What do you think, Rembrandt? A fate worse than death. That's what I thought, too. So long, Mallard. On your way out, just seal in that last brick, will you? <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. The part of Tessman was played by John Grover. Zoma was Lou Tobin. Henry Leff is heard as Lieutenant Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas is Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Bill Brownell creates the sound effects, and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Frank Barron. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The characters in the story were entirely fictitious. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> Come on, Mellard. Stop pouting. Enjoy yourself. It's earlier than you think. Monterey at Christmas time is delightful. Carmel is most enchanting. Salinas, I enjoy. But to haul us way over to some unexplored cannibal country is too much. <laughs> Did you hear that, Rembrandt? Cannibal country, he calls it. Mallard, me boy. This may come as a shock, but San Juan Batista was founded by the Franciscan Fathers in 1797. I remember it as though it were yesterday. Don't let him bother you, Ducky. Mallard can't stand this wonderful air. He misses the gas fumes of the big city. That's not that candy, but I do want to get back. Relax, Max. You had a chance to take two days off, so make the most of them. Uh, what's the name of this town again? San Juan Batista. You'll love it, Mallard, dear, really. The mission, all the old buildings still standing. Oh, you'll adore it. Honestly, you will. Look, Rembrandt, old friend, I may like a thing. But I'll be hanged if I'll adore it. As you will, minion. Oh. How much farther, Candy? We're just entering the town now. I thought we'd take a look at the mission first. Okay. Hey, this is a cute little town at that. That's my boy. I knew you'd warm up once I got you over here. You know, strictly from a police angle, you might be interested in knowing that Joaquin Murrieta visited here more than once. So did Three-Fingered Jack. Where's my shooting iron? I'll get the varmints. <laughs> take it easy, hop along. We're approaching the mission. Oh, for golly sakes. It's a big one. Isn't it beautiful, Mallard? And don't you get a whole flood of thoughts going through your head when you look at it? Yeah. With a little imagination, one could almost see the native Indians walking back and forth, coming into town for the evening vespers. I only hope the mission's open. Well, let's find out. Good idea. I think I see one of the fathers around the front, Candy. You can ask him. Thank you, Ducky. Yes, let's go. Good afternoon, Father. Mm -hmm. Oh, good afternoon, young lady. Can you tell me if the mission is open this afternoon? Oh, yes, most certainly. Do forgive me if I appear somewhat startled. I was picking these red berries and I failed to hear you drive. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, that's quite all right. I fear my thoughts were wandering. Uh, pardon me, may I introduce Mr. Watson? How do you do, Father? And this Watson? gentleman is Lieutenant Mellard. How are you, sir? Uh, 
Lieutenant? No, but... not the military, Father. I'm with the San Francisco police. The police? Oh, no, Father, we're not here on business. <sighs> I was wondering. I thought for a moment that Father Philip might have reported me. Reported you? For what, Father? At lunchtime, I made a frightful mistake. By, uh, <clears throat> error, I ate his apple. <laughs> right under his very nose, too. <laughs> oh, pardon me. I'm Father Paulino. I'm very happy to know you, Father. My name is Candy Matson. I have some free time I would be pleased to show you about. May I? We'd be delighted, Father Paulino. <sighs> I think uh, we can start with the yard. It gets dark so early this time of year. Father Paulino. Father Paulino. Why, it's uh, Miguel Torres. What could be wrong? Oh, Father Paulino, it is there. Miguel, my son, what is it? What has happened? Oh, the most awful thing you ever hear of. Vicente, he just shoot himself. Merciful in heaven. Is he badly hurt, Miguel? Oh, I think... I think he is dying, Father. No, 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 no. The poor boy. Where is he? At his house. Excuse me, Miss Matson. I must leave immediately. Would my car be of any help, Father? Uh, the car. Yes, thank you. From Studio A in San Francisco's Radio City, the National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Tragedy in the sleepy little California mission town of San Juan Bautista. But it wasn't the first time. If you look around the side of the mission, you'll see that the place marks the mass grave of 12,000 Indians who died in a smallpox epidemic years ago. San Juan has seen knifings, too, and other shootings. It had lived a rowdy life in the dim years gone by, and obviously the rowdiness was still alive in a minor sort of fashion. We got in the car, and with Miguel directing us in broken English and Latin gestures, we made our way out on a dirt road about three miles outside of town near the granite quarry. We finally pulled up in front of a one-story wooden house that must have been built before the turn of the century. We went inside, and... There was the prone form of a Mexican boy of about 21 or 2. The, there he is, Father. Is, is he all right? I don't know, Miguel. I'll have to see. He's gone, isn't he, Father? Yes. May his soul dwell eternally in peace. He, he, he is dead. Miguel, listen to me. His flesh is cold, yes, but his soul still lives. Do you understand what I'm saying, my son? Yes, Father Paulino. Wait a moment. Mallard, hmm? look. Here, where he was shot. Well, well. If Vicente knocked himself off, he certainly did it the hard way. You're not kidding. Miss Matson, would you mind very much if we brought the body back in with us to the mission? I'm afraid we can't, Father. Would you step over here? I have something to tell you. Certainly, Miss Matson. You wear a look of concern. Is there something wrong? I'm afraid there is, Father Paulino. But what do you mean? Well, it looks very much as though this wasn't self-inflicted. What? You don't mean that... Oh, Miss Matson, are you sure of what you're saying? Reasonably so, Father. You see, a, a gun held at close range leaves powder marks. Vicente's wound is as clean as a whistle. Well, I... I don't know what to say. I... I'm sorry, Father, but that's why we can't remove the body. We'll have to call the sheriff's office in Hollister. Can you tell me where I can find a phone? Yes, there's one at the mission... If you don't mind, I'll stay here. I have work to do. Father Paulino was right. He had work to do. The ecclesiastical kind. And he did it in a simple and impressive way. San Juan Batista, with a population of a little over 600, and we run plop into a murder. 
Mallard said he'd go back to the mission and make the call, and left. Forty-five minutes later, the undersheriff of San Benito County drove up with Mallard. He asked the standard questions, but learned nothing. We went over the house with a fine-tooth comb, but we came up with a blank. There being nothing else to do at the moment, the men put the body in the sheriff's car, and he drove back to Hollister, and we returned to the mission. Would you uh, care to take a stroll about the gardens, Miss Matson? It's most peaceful. Makes a wonderful place for clear thinking. Well, yes, Father. I, I'd love to. Mallard? Well, you go ahead, Candy. I promised the sheriff I'd take a look around town for him. Oh, sure. You want to come along with me, Rembrandt? Yes, I believe I will. If you don't mind, Candy. No, no, not at all. One thing before you go. You will be my guests for dinner, won't you? Oh, that's most gracious of you, Father. What do you think, Candy? I think it would be charming. Okay. We'll see you back in a little while, then. This is a tragic thing, Miss Matson. Vicente was a splendid lad and a good Christian. I know how you must feel, Father. I never could understand why there must be things of this sort in the world. Not only between individuals, but countries and nations as well. It is hard to comprehend. The more I try to reason, the more confused I become. About Vicente, Father... Who do you suppose could have done it? I don't know. I I really don't. How about Miguel? What? Oh, no, Miss Matson. Why, he and Vicente were like brothers. Brothers sometimes quarrel, you know. Uh, not in this case. Miguel is a good boy. Why, he works here at the mission. You'll pardon me, Father, but in my business I find I have to be doubtful at times. What is your business, Miss Matson? I'm... A private investigator, Father. How very curious. Yes, I, I suppose it is. But in a sense, you're a policeman too, Father. I? Yes. You police the soul, don't you? Ride herd on the, on the thoughts and actions of men? Why, yes. I'd never thought of it that way before. Yes, in a sense, I suppose I do wear a badge. I wear the badge of righteousness. The star of God. Father Paulino was a wonderful man. As we walked about the mission gardens, he spoke of many things, but in parallels, all connected in some way with the killing of poor Vicente. The time passed swiftly. I was so engrossed in listening to the kindly voice of the man. And before I knew it, Mallard and Rembrandt had returned, and it was time for dinner. Miguel did the cooking and waited on the table. Dinner was a masterpiece of simplicity. And if it hadn't been for the tragedy of the afternoon, I would have been enjoying a serenity I'd never known before. Did Vicente live out there all by himself, Father? Yes, the house belonged to him. He's a descendant of one of the original families of San Juan. His great, great, great grandfather owned one of the largest ranchos in California. It stretched from here to the Pacific Ocean. That's a lot of property. Indeed. Uh, you see, it was given to him by the King of Spain under one of the original Spanish land grants. I understand there still are some in existence. Yes, I believe there are. But they've all been chopped up and sold in much smaller parcels. Did Vicente work, Father? Oh, yes. He was a good worker. Seasonally, in the artichoke fields and the lettuce fields, in the off-seasons, he did odd jobs about the town. Uh, speaking of town, Father, do you know a woman named Rose Taylor? Why do you ask that? Do you? Yes. Why do you mention the name? There's a little bar down the street. Yes, I know. The frailties of mankind. The fellow who runs the place says there's been talk about Vicente being kind of loco over the Taylor girl. I'd heard something of the sort, too. I was going to speak to him about it on Sunday. How long has she been here, Father? She arrived about two months ago. I'm afraid she's been a disturbing influence on our little village ever since. Did you talk to her, Mallard? No. Where does she live, Father? In a small cottage over on 2nd and Polk Street. I think we ought to take a little walk over there, don't you, Mallard? Right as rain, Cupcake. I dropped by her place before dinner, but she wasn't in. Oh, you know where it is, then? Mm-hmm. Good. 
Please don't think it's rude, Father, but it's something we have to follow through on. I understand, Miss Matson. We got up from the table and went outside the mission. We pulled our coats closely about us and little jets of steam came from our mouths as we breathed the crisp evening air. We'd only gone about a dozen steps or so and we were stopped by a voice from behind. Please, Senorita Matson, Senor. Huh? Why, it's Miguel. What is it, Miguel? Something wrong? I hear you talking inside. You are going over to see Senorita Taylor? That's right. Oh, she is no. The Senorita Taylor, she is a good girl. She would not to hurt anyone. That's not what Father Paulino seems to think. Oh, the good father, he does not know much about the outside. All his life, he lived in the mission. He is, uh, how would you say, is secluded? And the good father may be secluded, Miguel. But I have a strong hunch he knows more about what's going on around here than anyone in town. Oh, but please, you believe me? Senorita Taylor, she is a good person. Look, Miguel, you want to find out who killed Vicente, don't you? Oh, see, si, see. Si. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Now, you be a good boy, Miguel, and don't get yourself all in the stew. We left Miguel and walked over a couple of blocks to 2nd and Polk Street. We found the cottage and saw a light in the front window. Mallard knocked. And what opened the door would have been a delight on any movie screen, if you like your beauty the hard way. Rose Taylor, it was obvious, could raise an awful lot of havoc with the local swains. Something you wanted? Yes, we'd like to talk to you for a moment, if you don't mind. Yes, I do mind. I'm kind of busy. I'm sorry, Miss Taylor, but you'll have to unbusy yourself. This is the police. Police. Always the police. Why can't you let me alone? You've uh, been in trouble before? Mm, nothing serious. Might be this time. You know a kid named Vicente? Yeah, I heard what happened. These crazy kids. They have a yen for knifings and shootings. Don't they just? This is Lieutenant Mallard. He tells me he was by here this afternoon and you weren't in. That's right. I went into Salinas to do some shopping. We can prove that, can we? Absolutely. Well, well, what have we here? A very cozy little thirty-two revolver. And also nicely cleaned and oiled. You always keep it this immaculate, Miss Taylor? Certainly. When some character gets too much tequila under the belt, you don't know what's going to happen. And the suitcase on the bed. Are you getting ready to go somewhere? Wait. If you're trying to make out that I knocked off his center, you're just whistling Dixie in four flats. Look, a telegram. If you'll take the time and the courtesy to read it, you'll find that my sister in Los Angeles is a very sick girl. I was going down to spend a week or so with her. What is this, a convention hall? Come in. Buenas noches, senorita. Miguel, beat it. I'm busy. I am sorry. I, I am sorry. I have a message for Senorita Matson and for you, senor. Father Paulino sent me. A message? What is it, Miguel? The sheriff in Hollister just called on the telephone. He said to tell Senor Mallard that the bullet that killed Vicente was from a thirty-two caliber gun. <laughs> From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Well, now, a 32 slug had killed Vicente, and Miss Taylor owned a 32 gun. It looked practically tailor made. However, I've seen coincidences like this before that have gone up in thin smoke. Mallard plucked the rose and asked her to return to the mission. And right there, I got me a king-sized idea. I excused myself, went to the little bar, and from the owner, I found out where the local banker lived. Five minutes later, I was in his living room talking to him, a gentleman named Banta. Yes, it's terrible. I only heard about it a half hour ago. Vicente was a splendid lad. That's what I've heard. Well, the reason I'm here, Mr. Banta, is to inquire about his financial status. Did he do any banking at all? Oh, yes. Up to about five or six weeks ago. Uh-oh. Can you tell me more? 
Well, he had a savings account of approximately $2,800. Suddenly, he began making withdrawals. 200, 300 at a time. Yesterday, he made another withdrawal. He left a total of $400 in his account. Well, what do you know about that? Well, he said he was having trouble with his crops this year. The rain and all that. Mm Mm-hmm. What about Miguel Torres? Now, that's a very strange thing. He had an account of $900. That's practically gone, too. I assumed he was helping his friend Vicente. I smell a very well-shaped rodent. Name of Taylor. Thanks, Mr. Banta. You've been a great help. Things seem to be taking shape. It looked like the old story of a no-good playing both ends against the middle. Both ends being Vicente and Miguel. The no-good? Rose Taylor. Scattered pieces of the puzzle were beginning to fall in place. Father Paulino. At first I couldn't believe it. And I wondered what his reaction would be. Next step, the bartender at the village pub. I walked in and caught him at a good time. The place was empty. Good evening. What can I do for you? A package of cigarettes, please. Sure. How are these? No, no, the the others, if you will. All right. There you you are. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm Mm-hmm. Information. What do you want to know? Miguel Torres and a kid named Vicente. Did they come in here often? Who are you? Private investigator. Here, my merit badge. Yeah, that's a new one, the lady cop. The world is ever-changing, Buster. Uh, Now the answer. Yeah, they used to come in about once a week, usually on Saturday nights. Drink much? Nah, good kids, both of them. When were they in here last? Well, let's see. Yeah, night before last. Any arguments? Ah, uh, they're so soft-spoken, those kind of guys, it's hard to tell. But now that you mention it, I think there was a bit of a rhubarb going on. Who was taking the lead? Tories. I gather he was sort of griped about something. Not too loud, not much fire. Mm, that's when it gets dangerous. And they weren't drunk? Nope. And I can spot a lush at 40 paces. They each had a beer and left. Thanks, mister. Here, buy yourself a cup of Christmas cheer. Well, thank you. Click. Another piece of the puzzle in place. And all roads led right back to the mission. With the exception of the late Vicente, we had the full cast of characters front stage center. And a neat little bit of intrigue it was, too. As I drew near, the warm lights of the mission were streaking through the windows, contrasting greatly to the thoughts that were going around in my head. I walked in. Father Paulino was sitting over his desk, his head buried on his arms. Mallard was leaning back in a chair, watching Rose Taylor, who in turn was smoking a cigarette and pacing the room. Rembrandt was reading a copy of the National Geographic. All heads snapped to me as I entered. Why a cupcake? Have fun? Of sorts. What's new here? Oh, waiting for the sheriff from Hollister. He's going to book the Taylor lady on suspicion of murder. That way he can hold her. I think I have somebody else for him to hold. Father Paulino? Yes, Miss Matson. I think you know what I'm about to say. Yes. Yes, I think I do. Where is he? In the next room. I'll call him. Miguel, my son. See, si, Father. Come in here, please. See, si. Miss Matson wants to talk to you. You're here in the mission now, Miguel. You're standing right under the cross. You can't lie. You killed Vicente, didn't you? Yes. Why? I love her. I give her everything I have. My love, my heart, my money, everything. She tell me that she is mine, all mine. That we will be married right here in the mission by the good Father Paulino. Then last week, I find she is also making the pretend love to Vicente. I almost went crazy. You told Vicente to stay away. See, that is right. But last night, I stand across the street from Senorita Rose's house. Vicente was there. And as they say goodnight on the front porch, she kissed him and pat his cheek. Just as she did to me. And so you shot him this afternoon. With a thirty-eight. And when the sheriff called, you told us it was a thirty-two, Knowing that Rose also had a thirty-two. See, that is right. But you would never get me for it. Mallard, father, come on, don't let him get away. 
There he goes, up on that wall. Miguel, stop. You can't run away for the rest of your life. I have no life, Father. Miguel, watch out. You're going to... Oh! Oh! He's done for. Broken back. Is... Is the pain bad, my son? Uh, no, Father. Am, am I dying? Yes, Miguel. You see, I told you I had no life left. The bells, you hear them, Padre? Yes. They're ringing, Miguel. Time for the company. You will pray for me, Father Paulino? Of course. Merciful Jesus, all-knowing, all-seeing, look down upon us this night so close upon thine own natal day. This boy I'm holding in my arms, Miguel Torres, uh-huh. he has trespassed upon thy commandments. In thine infinite mercy, I seek his forgiveness. Thank you, Father. Thank you. He's gone, Father Polino. Yes. Requiescat in pace. May his soul rest in peace. Amen. Where is she, the tailor woman? I'm right here, Father. Look upon this boy I'm holding here. The second death in a matter of hours. And all because of you. I know. In the eyes of the law, you are guiltless. You pulled no trigger to cause the death of Ascenti. Miguel fell off a wall to his death. But it was because of you. I... I, I realize that now. Do you? Really? Yes, Father. And perhaps in this hour of dark tragedy, something has been salvaged after all. This is the Yuletide, the anniversary of the birth of Christ. In his infinite wisdom, the Almighty is charitable. Rose Taylor, seek his forgiveness. Leave San Juan Bautista. I'm sure Miguel and Vicente would want it that way. Start anew. Lead a penitent life. It is not too late. Tell me, child, do you recall Mary Magdalene? I do, Father. Need I say more? No. Someone help me with Miguel. We will... Carry him back to the chapel and finish the compliment there. I will, Father. Thank you. Yes. There's a remarkable man, Candy. More than you know, Mellor, dear. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men and woman. In these troublesome times, there is a brilliant, shining example of what we have to hold on to. Well, I wish there was a Father Paulino in every country of the world. We'd have more time for raising kids than for killing them. My point exactly. Come on, Mellor, dear. Let's get back to San Francisco. I have a special star to put on my Christmas tree tonight. For all the Father Polinos that ever lived.
Listen again next week at this same time. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. And a very Merry Christmas to you all. Featured in the story were Hal Burdick as Father Polino, Lou Tobin as Miguel Torres, and Jane Bennett Carnell as Rose Taylor. Henry Leff is Lieutenant Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas plays Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy, and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell, and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Clarence Stevens. The characters in the story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC. The National Broadcasting Company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> Yeah, Candy, this is a madder dash than the one made by Paul Revere. Look out for that man. I see him, Rembrandt. I know it, you know it, but does he? What's the reason for this wild scramble, girl? I started to explain, Ducky. Look at that car up ahead about a block. Yes, it's a police car. That's right, and do you know who's driving? Lieutenant Ray Mallard, that's who. A uh, whom? So Mallard's driving. There's no reason to get yourself for such a snit. I imagine the lad's driven before. I'm not worried about the mechanical aspects of placing a car in motion and guiding it to a predetermined terminal. It's the reason behind it that bothers me. Who said reason being what? I don't know what the reason is, and that's the rub. For days, Mallory's been avoiding me like the plague. I call him on the phone, all I get are muffled sentences. Nothing makes sense. Last night, I waited in front of the Hall of Justice and followed him when he left. And where did he lead you, dear? Into a pool room or some such thing? No. Pool room, I wouldn't have minded. I shoot a pretty good stick of snooker, you know. That's beside the point, Candy. Come now, concentrate. Where did Mallard lead you? To a small hotel on Ellis Street. He met a man in the lobby who was wearing dark glasses. They huddled in a corner and talked for a while. Then Mallard left. I didn't duck back fast enough, and Mallard saw me. Oh, brother, what a bawling out I got. How strange. With that, he got in his car and drove away like frantic. That certainly doesn't sound like Mallard. I called to apologize this morning. He wouldn't even talk to me. And now of this. He never drives a squad car unless it's absolutely necessary. Now you've got me curious. Something must be up. You're darn tootin' and I want in on it. Yes. Who does Mallard think he is keeping things from us like this? Oh, he's stopping. i better hold it up right here. He's getting out, Candy. So I see. Look, he, he's waving up at the middle flat. Do you see anyone in the window up there, Ducky? Yes, a man. I can't quite make out his features, though. Yes, yes, he's waving back. Well, what's Mallard doing now? Going up the stairs and in. How do you like that? Rather delicious, isn't it? Oh, I squirm with intrigue. Well, I squirm, too. Come on, Rembrandt, squirm out of the car. This is one time I don't mind doing a shadow job strictly for free. <laughs> From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company presents another yarn in the adventures of that attractive private eye, Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. (laughs) 
I knew there was something wrong three days before. Whenever I walk into Mallard's office in the Hall of Justice where he lieutenants for the San Francisco homicide, and all I get out of the big guy is an ugh, something's foul in Dixie. You can play that in any key you like. And the uggs kept up, mentally and verbally. Add that situation with Mallard's mysterious friend in the dark glasses and you've got something. Especially when Lieutenant Boy stops off at an old flat, waves to a gent, the gent waves back, and Mallard goes inside. <sighs> now we're all tidy and up to date. We waited for about 20 minutes outside by my car. Two or three other people came and went. Finally, Mallard came out carrying a very small box in his hands. He put it inside his coat pocket. The bulge wouldn't show any more than usual. That's where he keeps his police gun. Then he got in his car and drove off. Rembrandt and I immediately went to work. Object? A social call on our unknown friend in the second floor window. I must say, Candy, this is most mystifying. That it is, Ducky. In all the years I've known Mallard, I've never seen him act like this before. What are we up to now, Dov? We're going to take a look at the guy Mallard went to see. Find out what he looks like. What sort of a racket he's in. Well, supposing Mallard hears about it, won't you be even further into the doghouse? Indubitably, faithful old friend. But that's the chance I'll have to take. <sighs> Here we are. Little flat. This must be one of those babies built before the fire in the quake. Yes, all 1906 conveniences, including a door knocker. Well, give it a blast, Ducky. As you say... Place gives me a galloping case of depression. Yeah, I know what you mean. All the ghosts of the past half century. Try it again, remember. Any harder, and the building will slide off its foundation. What is this? You could have heard that last knock out of the Farallones. Maybe he didn't hear you. Anyone in the neighborhood would have heard that knock. I'm going to try the door. Ah, voila. Except that it. Only moves about two inches. Shove on it, dear. My thoughts exactly. It gives a little. Help me, Rembrandt. Very well. Yeah. Hey. hey, look. Under the door. That's blood. I wouldn't call it ketchup. Come on. Once again, and harder. <laughs> oh, my word. That's the polite term. This guy's as dead as they come. And look. What, dear? This is the Joe Mallard was talking to in the hotel lobby. Even to the dark glasses. I wonder what Mallard will say about this. I was wondering the same thing. Come on, Rembrandt. I don't think I feel very well. That was an understatement. I felt worse than that. But I had to follow through now. Our next step took us down to the Hall of Justice for a little visit with Mallard. He was in. Just beat us back by about ten minutes. He was still wearing the same scowl he had on the last time I'd spoken to him. You still mad at me, Mallard? No, I'm mad at myself. Did you stub your toe somewhere along the line, Minion? Is that it? No, but I'm about to. What do you mean by that, Footflat? You'll find out. And it's all your fault, too. You mean about last night, my following you? No, that was a dirty trick, but I forgive you. It isn't that. Then what is it? Yes, for goodness sake, stop sounding like a thruppany thrill book. I'll say what I have to say in my own good time, and nobody can force me to do otherwise. I've got news for you, Junior. The police can make you talk. The police? What kind of triple talk is this? We followed you out to that flat just now. We saw everything. What? Oh, the underhanded... So you know. Yes, but why did you do it, Mallard? Because I'm a fool. Just a plain fool, and I ought to have my head examined. And also, the poor fellow you left out there. He needs his head examined, too. He sure does. It's got a hole in it about the size a forty-five slug would make. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? Don't you know... I thought I did. Now I don't think so. Now, come on, quick. What's this hole in the head routine? He's serious, Candy. I really think he is. Darn right I'm serious. Come on, spill. Okay, okay. I'll tell it to you like you don't know. We followed you out there. You wave up to the second story. Man looks out the window and waves back. Check. You go inside. We wait. Twenty minutes further away, you come out with a small object in your hands. You put said object in the inside coat pocket. Good report. Most efficient. You drive off. We go up to pay a visit. The host wasn't willing. He'd been shot to death. What? Oh, brother. And you thought I'd done it? Well? <laughs> well, really, Mallard, I don't see anything to laugh about. <laughs> That's because you're not sitting where I am. Oh, Sister Susie, did you get your clues all fouled up? Let's get out of here. We got work to do. My mental reflexes climbed on a merry-go-round and whirled gaily for several moments. I was really confused. 
I didn't have time to do much about it because Mallard whisked this back to the flat. An hour later, the joint had been carefully gone over, photographed, and the body of the poor guy removed to the coroner's office for an autopsy report. It didn't take long to find out that I was right. It had been a forty-five that did the dirty work. Rembrandt had to leave, so I went back with Mallard to his office. Still think I had something to do with this thing, Cupcake? Oh, in, in my heart of hearts, no, but of course not. But jeepers, look at the facts, Mallard. You come out, we go up. The guy's stiff as a starch shirt. What would you think? The same thing you thought. Time element is what gets me. Not more than three minutes had elapsed between the time you left and the time we got up there. No, no. I can account for that, I think. But I'm not going to. As a matter of fact, there are several things I could account for, but I'm not going to. Now who's doing the triple talk? I am, deliberately. I'm going to tell you something, Candy. Listen carefully. You're a cute little old snoop. You've snooped your way into the middle of this thing, and I'm going to toss it right into your lap and let you snoop your way out. And when you come up with the right answers, you're going to get the shock of your life. I am he. I think so. At least it was quite a shock to me. You mean you've got the solution to this deal already? Part of it. You're a much smarter foot flat than I thought you were. I don't know who killed the guy, if that's what you mean. I take it back, then. And now you, you've really got me all topsy-turvy. <laughs> oh, this is working out even better than I thought it would. Okay, Tootsie, you've got the ball. It's all yours. Take it from here. You mean you actually want me to help you on this deal? Sure. Who knows? You might come up with something. I'll beat it, will you? i got to find me a killer. I was so puzzled by then that I wanted to wrap the guy over his head. I fought off the impulse and left. If he gave me carte blanche on the killing, I was going to take advantage of it, if for no other reason than to prove I was right and Mallard wasn't the joker who did it. There's only one place to start, back at the flat where the guy had been done in. The cops had gone, so I did some question work. The landlady lived in the flat below. No, she didn't know the man. A gal named Jennifer Shirley had leased the middle flat for the past five years. I uh, swung a deal with the landlady, got the key to same, <laughs> not the landlady, the flat, and moved in. I had a good night's sleep and waited all the next day. Nothing. The odd thing about the deal was the fact that the cops hadn't been back. They usually return for a double check. So the next night I hit the sack again. About midnight, my dreams of a vine-covered cottage in the country with Mallard were rudely shattered by a sound. The sound of a key in the lock of the door. <gasps> oh, sorry, I frightened you, Jennifer. Take it easy, everything will be okay. Who... Oh. Who are you? Oh, oh, I'm coming to that. Oh, excuse me. And you are Jennifer Shirley, aren't you? That's right. Excuse my night here. If I'd have known you was coming, I'd have gone formal. Just what is all this? And what are you doing in my flat? Where have you been, Jennifer? Seattle? Why? Didn't you read the papers up that away? I was too busy. You know a man named Everett Stone? Of course I do. He's a very good friend of mine. He was up from Los Angeles on business, and I let him use my flat. And now you're here. I don't understand this at all. Look over there at your front door. Everett Stone was shot to death right on that spot. <gasps> Everett? Dead? <sighs> I can't believe it. I'm sorry. It's true. You can prove you were in Seattle, Jennifer. Yes. Here. My plane ticket receipt and the stubs on my luggage. I just got in at the airport less than an hour ago. Just for the record, where did you stay in Seattle? At the Olympic Hotel. We can prove that, too, can we? Of course. Now, wait just a moment. The shock of all this slowed me down for a second or two. Just who are you, and what are you doing here? Simmer down, Jennifer. My name's Matson, Candy Matson. I'm a private investigator. Oh, yes, I've heard of you. I'm trying to find out who knocked off your friend's stone. You got any ideas? Several. So have I. One being this, does everyone around here wear dark glasses? You've got a pair on, too. Same kind Everett Stone was wearing. Here, have a cigarette. Thanks. Got something you want to tell, Jennifer? Yes, I do. The dark glasses are standard equipment for the type of work we're in. And what would that be? We're gem dealers, precious stones. Whenever we have a valuable piece of property in our possession, we're required by bond to wear these dark glasses. A disguise, so to speak? That's right. Whenever it arrived from Los Angeles, he had with him the Cape Hatteras Diamond. You've heard of it? Who hasn't? Worth about a half a million. That's right. 
He was on his way to Seattle to show it to a prospective buyer. The first night here, Everett appeared on a television show to display the diamond. And as he left, he knew he was being followed. He called me and asked me if we could make a switch. Wanted to know if I'd take the diamond on up to Seattle and try to make the sale. And he'd stay here, is that right? Right. Well, it was a good switch, except that Everett got himself knocked off for his trouble. Have you got the diamond with you? Right here, in my purse. Look. What a little beauty. And not so little as that. No. Oh, the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. And you just carry it around in your purse like that? Certainly. Who'd think to look in a woman's purse? <laughs> You've got a point. Lipstick, mascara, streetcar tokens, loose change, but not a half a million dollar rock. Did Everett say what the man looked like, Jennifer, the one who was following him? Yes. He wrote a complete description for me. Have you got it? Also in my purse. Here. Yikes. Miss Matson, you're white as a sheet. What's wrong? Plenty's wrong. This describes a certain Lieutenant Ray Mallard to a T. <laughs> From San Francisco, you are listening to a National Broadcasting Company presentation, Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. I slipped out of my nighty, slipped into my street clothes, slipped Jennifer a wet fish handshake, slipped out the door, slipped into my car, and slipped home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, and from there I kept right on slipping. That description was Mallard's beyond all doubt. What made it worse was the fact that Rembrandt and I had seen Mallard coming out of the flat with a small package that could have been a jewel box. I didn't sleep much that night, and that's for sure. In the morning, I put myself together as best I could and once again made the dismal journey down to the Hall of Justice and into Mallard's office. How you doing, Cupcake? Not too well. I have some rather unpleasant news. Such as like what? Mallard Everett Stone was a gem broker. Good for you. You've got clue number one. You knew that? Don't be ridiculous, Candy. That came out of McGuffey's reader. Number two. He had the Cape Hatteras diamond with him when he arrived from Los Angeles. Atta girl, you're getting warm. He switched the rock to a gal named Jennifer Shirley. She took the diamond on up to Seattle because Everett thought he was being tailed. Hey, you're getting better and better. What's next? You mean none of this is news to you? Uh-uh. Old hat so far. Well, maybe this won't be old hat. Everett wrote a description of the guy he thought was following him. He gave it to Jennifer. It's you right on the nose, Mallard boy. What? It's you. Including the little mole you have behind your right ear. You don't look so good, Mallard dear. Don't you think you ought to tell me what it's all about? Maybe I'd better. I can't for the life of me figure out it. Wait a minute. Sure. Of course. <laughs> you had me worried there for a minute, Cupcake. <laughs> Doggone, what is this, Mallard? I'm getting mad. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> oh, I'll find out. But when will I find out? Ooh, we saved by the bell. Excuse me a minute, Detective Matson. Oh, sure. <laughs> Lieutenant Mallard, homicide. Lieutenant, this is Sergeant O'Flaherty down on radio. We just got a report from Prowl Car 36. Yeah, O'Flaherty. There's been a dame killed out in that same flat, name of Jennifer Shirley. <laughs> It was then I knew that Mallard was really in the clear. The phone dropped out of his hands and he looked as if he'd been slugged with a belaying pin. Mallard had work to do, so I left. Only this time I didn't go back to the flat. I have, um, tenderloin connections. So putting two and two together, I started making the rounds down around Turk Street. Turk, Ellis, Eddie, the whole section where the Easy Street boys hang out. I came up with nothing. Nothing until I stumbled into a little bar near Eddy Street on Leavenworth. I came face to face with an old acquaintance of mine. Name of, uh, Montgomery the Mole. Well, for crying in my beer and making it salty. 
Look what the high tide just washed in. Hiya, Candy. <laughs> Hiya, Montgomery. I ain't seen you since the night you caught up with me former pal, Willie Clark. Oh, I, I'm sorry I had to do that, Montgomery. Oh, I ain't. I ain't gonna be too good for that crump bum. A oh, little second story work ain't too far out of line. I can even swell a, a well-executed stick-up. But when it comes to kidnapping and murder, uh-uh. Asana's characters draw the line. That's why I'm here, Montgomery. Yeah? There have been two killings in the last four days. Mm, the grapevine must be slipping. I don't hear nothing about no rub outs. They've been kept quiet for a reason. Just what the reason is, I don't know. Have you heard about any of uh, out-of-town ice men dropping in the last few days? No, uh, no, uh, not a one. Now, look, uh... Here's a, a 20, Montgomery. Mm. That's all I've got. I'll send you 20 more first thing in the morning. Is your memory improving? Ooh, 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 just like I never lost it. Well, is there a jewel boy in town? Look right ahead of you up at the bar. Yeah? That's him. If he ain't a hot ice juggler, my name ain't Montgomery. Got in just about the four days ago. Calls herself Finch. Oh, Montgomery, I loves you. <laughs> I'm moving over there. Do me a favor. Tip the bartender off. Tell him to keep my drinks well watered. It didn't take long. A guy from out of town gets lonesome. I was sitting at the bar no more than three minutes, and we were old friends. He kept the drinks coming, and by closing time, he really had a snootful. He offered to drive me home, and oh, naturally, I accepted we got out on the sidewalk, and suddenly he darted back into the tavern. When he returned, he was carrying something in a paper bag. We found his car and climbed in. Don't you think you ought to let me drive, Mr. Finch? You ah, no, no, no. Quite a few. <laughs> ah, I can handle this little old car. Uh, uh, I'm sort of stranger here, you have to tell me which way to go. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, you go straight up Leavenworth here, and, and then you turn right on Bush. I'll direct you after that. Okay, doc. Oh, you sing real pretty. Uh, when did you say you got into town, Mr. Finch? Oh, about four days ago. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, what sort of business are you in? Business? <laughs> I'm in no business. Retired, sort of. Oh. <laughs> Got lots of money. Get lots more, too. Mm. Hey, look out for that bag. Oh. oh, oh, I'm sorry. How clumsy of me. Yeah, but why, it's a purse. Why, Mr. Finch? <laughs> Put it back. I, it's a present for my sister in Riverside. Oh, how thoughtful. Oh, it, turn left on Kearney Street, will you? Sure. Then when you get to Washington, turn right one block to Montgomery Street. It's right on the corner. Uh, would you care to come up for a night, Cap, Mr. Finn? Hey, now, that sounds like a very good idea. Sure. <laughs> night, Cap. <Yeah. laughs> the corner of Washington and Montgomery is just half a block from Mallard's office in the Hall of Justice. With any luck, I could do a bloodless turnover to Lieutenant Boy. I reached down by my side, got my thirty-two out of my purse, and held it under my coat. We arrived at our destination, and Finch helped me get out of the car. There was only one pale light to illuminate the street, which was just what I wanted. Ah, there you are. You go ahead a little way, Mr. Finch. There seems to be something wrong with one of my heels. Oh, sure. Oh. Don't turn around, Mr. Finch. Not if you value your life. This is a gun I've got stuck in your back, and believe me, I know how to use it. Say, what goes on here? I'm almost broke, if that's what you're This after. isn't a stick-up. See that door up the street in that big building? Mm -hmm. Just keep walking right on into that door. He started walking, and I hung back a few paces. I didn't want to lose this baby. He was too good. Because that purse he had in the paper bag was the one owned by Jennifer Shirley. I'd never be able to get, forget that purse. It contained the Cape Hatteras diamond. I marched him into Mallard's office and Mallard was in. I gave him the full scoop and in less than half an hour we had one sad finch behind locked bars with the promise of a full written confession of two killings and one diamond theft. 
I had never seen anything fall into place so easily. A few minutes after we returned to Mellard's office from putting Finch into his ungilded cage, there was a knock on Mellard's door. Come in. Is I gum shoe? What on earth did you call me for at this hour of the night or morning? Yeah, come on in, Rembrandt. This ought to be fun. Darling, you too. Yeah. Why aren't you home getting your beauty rest? Oh, we just wound up a couple of killings, dear. Those of Everett Stones and Jennifer Shirley's. Well, bully for you. And I had nothing to do with it. Candy did it all. I left her strictly alone and she came through like a trooper. There's only one little thing she's overlooked. When she comes up with that, she'll have solved her best and last case. Last case? What are you talking about, Mallard? Captain Mallard, this is Riley on the top deck. Captain Mallard? What is this? Yeah, Riley. We got this uh, Finch Joker all booked and fingerprinted. He's in the Lysol dip now, then we'll tuck him into Betty by for the night. Good. We're changing shifts now. Anything else you want from me? No, Riley. You can knock off. Fine, Captain. Oh, and all the boys up here send down congratulations. Oh, uh, thanks, Riley. See you tomorrow. You? You? A Captain Mallard? That's right. Well, by Jove, I think that's splendid. Congratulations, Minion. Uh, Thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, I'm getting dizzy again. He's a Captain. And and what's this stuff about my best and last case? Give out here, Mellard boy. Doggone it, you're missing the most important clue in this whole case. Now, let's review it. Go ahead, girl. I'm bursting me buttons. Okay. I, I first get suspicious when you turn grumpy on me, Mellard. That's when I was wrestling with myself over, over a decision. That's right. Th- then you meet this stone guy in a small hotel on Ellis Street. Well, we had business. That's where he wanted to meet me. Then you go out to those flats. You wave, he waves, you go in. When you come out, you're carrying something. We go up, stone is dead. Later, I meet Jennifer Shirley. She shows me the Cape Hatteras diamond. But she also shows me something else. A description written by Stone, a description fitting you exactly. (laughs) Here, look what was in Jennifer's purse, along with the diamond. What? Another description. One that fits Finch. Everett Stone accidentally gave Jennifer the wrong slip of paper, the one that described me. Oh, for Pete's sake. That sure had me worried, Mellor, dear. Isn't there something else that worries you, Cupcake? Yes, there is, darn it, but I can't put my finger on... Wait a minute. That's it. The package. The one you carried down the stairs from that flat. At last. At last you finally did it, Candy. Here it is, right here. Open it, see for yourself. Uh, Okay. Well, it's beautiful... What a lovely ring. Did you steal this from Everett Stone? (laughs) Sure did. The price he gave me made it a first-class deal. Uh, Why why don't you try it on? Ooh, (laughs) I'd love to. Oh, I I, I don't think you're putting it on the right finger, Candy. Which, Which finger do you mean, Miller? Third finger, left hand. Oh, you... You don't mean that... Mallard, tell me. I want you to be my wife, Candy, dear. Oh, say it again, will you, Mallard, dear? This is only another one of those fool dreams of mine, I'm sure. Ah, it's not a dream, Cupcake. I mean it. More than I've ever meant anything in my life. Will you marry me, Candy? You big idiot. You don't need the answer to that. I wasn't asking you. Oh, yes, I'll marry you. Captain, dear. Forever and ever. Do you see now what I meant about this being your best and last case? <laughs> yes, but you're wrong. <laughs> I have another and a bigger case coming up. Uh, what's that, you little monkey? Just trying to be an awfully good wife to you. My word, I was wondering. Hmm? Uh, what, Rembrandt? When you're married, 
How shall I address you? Oh, that's easy. Just Mrs. Captain Mallard. Well, I won't even have to change my initials. For excitement and adventure and romance, just dial... Candy, Matt. I mean, Mallard. Uh, Mrs. Captain Ray. You kind two-way tool. Oh, that won't be my phone number. I... Oh, gee, I'm so confused, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Heard on the program were Jerry Walter as Montgomery the Mole, John Grover as Finch, and Helen Klebe as Jennifer Shirley. Jack Thomas is Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is Captain Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Phil Ryder. The characters in the story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people or names is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco, and this is Bud Heidi speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello, Yukon 38309. Yes, this is Candy Madsen. Yes, yes, this is Candy Madsen. Oh, Miss Madsen, I've been trying to get in touch with you the past two days. Well, I've been out of town. Just who is this speaking? Mrs. Allison Gray. You may have heard of my husband. The famous industrialist? Who hasn't heard of him? You've got to help me, Miss Matson. I'm, I'm desperate. Well, you sound it. What seems to be wrong, Mrs. Gray? I understand you do work of a confidential nature. You understand correctly. Can you drop out to see me, Miss Matson? Right away. Well, you'll have to give me some idea of what it's all about, Mrs. Gray. There are certain types of cases I refuse to accept. Do, do I have to tell you on the phone? If we're going to do business, yes. Well, it's my husband. For the past month, I've felt that he's been gradually losing his mind. What? It's horrible. But yesterday, he disappeared completely. You don't have to say another word, Mrs. Gray. I'll be right out. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Madsen, Yukon 38309. That's the way it usually goes. I live in a penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Inside, there's a phone. It's listed, and it rings. Sometimes I wish it wasn't and didn't. But the phone is listed thusly, Candy Matson, private investigator. And that's how I make my living. Do you remember that old gag about what's black and white and red all over? <laughs> yeah, a newspaper. Well, because of that telephone call from Mrs. Allison Gray, I had a switch. I had my palm red and got black and blue all over. And for good measure, I uncovered two very dead corpses along the way. I got the address of the Allison Grays out on Broadway in the Valley of Wealth, and that's where I went. As I pulled up at the front door, I looked for the bell, but there was none. Nothing but a huge knocker looking like it weighed about ten tons. I whacked it a couple of times and thought the house would fall off its foundations. Oui, mademoiselle? Oh, uh, oui. Je suis ici pour un rendezvous avec Madame Gray. Oh, parlez-vous français, mademoiselle? Uh, oui. Lower high school style. Entrez, s'il vous plaît, mademoiselle. Uh, oui. C'est un bonjour, n'est-ce pas? Oh, oui. Uh, <laughs> I'll bet you run out before I do. You can say that again. Oh, you speak English? Yes, yeah, San Francisco style. <laughs> uh, you Miss Matson? Uh, that's right. Miss Gray's expecting you. You'll uh, find her in the <clears throat> library. Don't overdo it, Clyde. Uh, say, what kind of a place is this, anyway? You'll find out. Right uh, on in, please. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, Miss Matson? Uh, yes, Mrs. Gray. Oh, do come in. 
My, how attractive you are. I expected a, a severe type of woman. Sit down, won't you, please? Oh, thank you. You've got to help me, Miss Matson. My whole life has been turned into a phantasmagoria. Mm, that's a good word. Uh, tell me more about the phantasmagoria. Well, my husband and I have been married 30 years. All that time he's been kind, considerate, generous. And with money yet. That makes him quite a man. But in business, he's just the opposite. He's ruthless. And I'm afraid he's made a good many enemies. Well, I guess you have to be like that in business if you want to be successful, Mrs. Gray. I know of at least a half dozen men who have been led into financial ruin because of my husband's operations. And this all leads to... Just this. I believe that his business tactics finally began to prey on his mind. For the past month, he's looked as though he were suffering from shock or concussion. Well, maybe that's it. Uh, No, Miss Madsen. I I was a nurse before I married Mr. Gray. I know the symptoms. My husband, I'm sure, is on the edge of a complete mental collapse. If it hasn't happened already. Well, and just how do I fit into the picture? Find him, please. Then perhaps we can get to the root of all the trouble. I'd I'd die if anything happened to him. You should know his habits. Can't you find him, Mrs. Gray? Can an amateur pianist do the work of a Rubenstein? No, Miss Matson. You're a professional sleuth. That's why I called you. Okay. You've got yourself a girl. As of now, I'm on the payroll. What is your fee, Miss Matson? Two hundred in advance, fifty dollars a day in expenses. That's reasonable. I'll make out a check for you right away. Fine. Oh, hello, Auntie. I just... oh. Excuse me. Didn't know you had company. Perfectly all right, Robert. May I present my nephew, Robert Warnicky? This is Miss Candy Matson. How do you do? It's the largest now, you. Matson, huh? Eh? That name is familiar. Yes, yes, you're a lady reporter or something of the sort, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, I'm afraid not, Mr. Warnicky. Let the girl alone, Robert. She's here on business. Here you are, Miss Matson. Thank you, Mrs. Gray. Well, I'd better be getting along. You'll hear from me soon. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Warnicky. I'll be seeing you. Yes. Yes, I have a hunch you most certainly will. I left the house, got in my car, and as I drove along, I did some thinking. It was a strange thing. Here was a, a family with all the loot in the world, but unhappy. It didn't make sense. Suddenly I realized I wasn't far from the studios of an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson, a darn good photographer, now that he's given up the grape, the kind that comes in bottles. As luck would have it, he was in and gave me a greeting worthy of the prodigal son. Candy, you minx. Where on earth have you been, Dove? Minx and Dove? You you make me feel as if I should be molting. What do you mean, where have I been? Just what the question implies, dear. Where have you been? Up in Eureka on a case. Oh, and how did you find Eureka? With radar. You've never seen such fog. Oh. Well, why this deep concern about me whereabouts? I've been trying to get in touch with you. Uh, I've some business for you, dear. No, thanks, Rembrandt. I already have some. Oh, she's an old customer of mine. I've photographed her so often, I know every little wrinkle. <laughs> I've even given them names. No, I told you, Ducky, I couldn't possibly Her take... neck has more lines than a California road map. Uh, Rembrandt, for the last time, her I... Her name is Gray. What? what did you say her name was? Gray, sweet little old fluff, lives out on Broadway. Mrs. Allison Gray? Yes, that's the one. Well, Rembrandt, I just now left her house not more than ten minutes ago. Oh, splendid. She got in touch with you. She dropped in my studio several days ago, and I recommended you. Get yourself a fine, fat fee, Dove. She can afford it. Well, do you know anything about the deal? Only that she's worried about her husband. That's nothing. I'm worried about mine. Oh, girl, you're not married. That's why I'm worried. You mean you still can't get Lieutenant Mallard to see the light? Right. Every time we even get near the subject of matrimony, Mallard ducks. Ah, Mallard Ducks. Okay, I'll leave. I would if I were you, Mallard Ducks. <laughs> really? Well, did you accept the case? I'm afraid I did, Rembrandt. Then you might be interested in this. <laughs> Here. What's this? A card. You can read. Yeah. Madame Natasha, palmistry, telepathy, sittings by appointment only. W- what's this all about? May not have any connection in the least, but it fell out of Mrs. Gray's purse as she left the other afternoon. Palmistry yet? This gal goes in for wrinkles all over. Rembrandt may sound as though he has bird gravel for brains, but he's been around me long enough to know a lead when he sees one. So I took the card and left. I cut over to Union and down to Kearney Street and then to the Hall of Justice on the corner of Washington. That's where my boy Mallard hangs his hat. Lieutenant Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A wonderful guy if he'd only swap stars... The one pinned on the inside of his coat for the ones up in the sky. 
<laughs> well, bust my rank and call me patrolman if it isn't candy. Hi, you beautiful thing, you. Oh, what have you been doing? Sniffing too much sulfur and molasses? Oh, well, merely stating the truth. Gee, you look swell, Candy. Well, in that case, no comment. <laughs> I'd better quit while I'm ahead. Well, Foot Flat, what's new? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm liable to lose my job. In the last 24 hours, there's been only one crime reported. Some kid had his bike stolen. Oh, you can talk to me, Mallard. Was it an inside job? I don't know. We haven't got anything to go on. But give us another two days and we'll bust this bike heist wide open. Good for you, laddie boy. Now shift your cigar and listen to me. Okay. Got something? Well, not yet. It could be... Ever hear of a lady swami known as Madame Natasha? Crystal gazing done cheap? Uh, what does she make like, Conan Doyle? Out on Buchanan near Jackson. You know her real name? Nope. Well, I can't help you then. As long as they keep the crystal gazing down to a soft stare and a low murmur, we don't bother them. Mm, just thought I'd ask. Know anything about an Allison Gray? Allison Gray, sure. Charming character. Whole department knows about him. There's nothing we can do about it. So? Yeah, so. The biggest crook this side of Jesse James. Jesse did it with a gun. This joker does it with pen and ink. Oh, all very neat and orderly. Can't get a thing on him. A happy chappy, eh? Very happy. He's got more guys who hate his... Uh, he's very popular. Yeah. Nobody likes him. Well, his wife does. She loves him. Well, that's what wives are for. That's what I keep telling you. Now, how did I walk into that one? Mallard picked up a sheaf of papers and threw it at me. It seems I had scored a point. I ducked out, got in my car, and drove up the hill to my place. I had some phoning to do, and I wanted to do it fast. Three, eight, six. The stars in their firmaments are all masterful. Good afternoon. Madame Natasha speaking. Good afternoon, madame. I, uh, I'm calling for an appointment. Oh? You were recommended to Madame Natasha? Uh, yes, yes. I'm from New York. A friend of mine was here last summer. She said you were excellent. Oh, how nice of her. And what was your friend's name? I, uh, uh, Wallace. Uh, Mrs. Jennifer Wallace. I do not seem to recall the name of Wallace. Oh, well. And you are? Uh, Betsy Ross. Ross. Very well. I can give you a sitting at nine o'clock this evening, Miss Ross. Oh, and, and I'd like to bring a friend along, if I might. A uh, Mr. Turner. That's a bit out of the ordinary, Miss Ross, but uh, the stars decree. Very well. I will see you both. That was number one call out of the way. Number two call was to Rembrandt. He was going to be my Mr. Turner. He's very sharp where photography is concerned, and I wanted him along in case of tricks. He said yes, he'd always wanted his palm bread. So I told him I'd pick him up about 8.30. Then I showered, fixed dinner, and got into an outfit that made me look as mousy as possible. With no lipstick or makeup, and with a pulled-down hat and a dumpy old gown, I achieved the desired effect. And I got into the car and went over to Rembrandt's place. I beg your... No, no, no subscriptions, thank you. I'm not sending any more boys through... Co oh, you're, you're a woman, I think. I'm not only a woman, Rembrandt. I'm candy. Him preserve us. Did someone throw acid on you or something? <laughs> this is my costume. Halloween isn't until next month, Candy. I know, but the spooks are here. We're going to see them this evening. Oh, perhaps so, but the way you look, it's just a matter of who scares whom. Candy, you look hideous. Well, good. That's just the way I want it. What's the idea, Dove? I don't get it. Some of these so-called fortune tellers are real smart cookies, Rembrandt. For obvious reasons, I don't want this gal we're going to visit to know who I am. Rest assured, she won't. Not the way you look. Am I that convincing, Ducky? My dear, if I didn't know better, I, I, I'd swear you just stepped off a pickle boat. Fine. That's what I wanted to hear. Come on, Rembrandt. It's time for us to peek into our futures. We got in the car and drove out to Madame Natasha's place on Buchanan Street. It was one of those old three-story gingerbread houses that still stand in San Francisco. Cornices, gables, carved pillars, ornate handrails leading up the front steps, etc., and etc. I rang the doorbell on the darkened porch and expected to be greeted by Peter Lorre. I wasn't far wrong. Oh. Good evening. Madame Natasha bids you enter the Temple of the Zodiac. Uh, yes, yes. And you are... Miss Ross, and, and this is Mr. Turner. Ah, yes. 
Madame is expecting you. Good. Just follow me if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, here we are. This room here. You may be seated, please. Thank you. A few brief words of instruction. Madame will be here shortly. At first, do not speak to her. She has been in touch with the outer world in preparation for your visit. She is on a highly sensitive mental plane. The least little noise will cause her great harm. You will remain where you are. Madame will sit at that table over there. She will address you. Once having done so, you may talk to her. In low tones, please. Is this clear? Uh, yes. yes. Very well. I shall leave you alone. Remember, let Madame Natasha speak first. Smells like a mortuary. Part of the act, Rembrandt. The aroma of flowers all ties in with the supernatural. I can't understand why we're here, Candy. Well, I've got to start somewhere, Rembrandt. This was the only thing I had to go on. Look, dear. There's a light beginning to fade up on the door. Where does it come from? Oh, I don't know. It's a cute trick, you know that? Oh, better be quiet. I think this is the madame's entrance cue. Yeah, yeah, here she comes. You are gathered on the threshold of three powerful forces. The past, the present, the future. Prepare to travel with me through these three elements. The lady's name is Ross. The gentleman's Turner. That is right, is it not? You may speak. That is correct. Yes. We shall commence. Detach yourselves. Think of nothing but the past. Your childhood... Your school days, vacations, your misfortunes, your happy hours, your parents. Think, think, yes, our thought planes are beginning to meet. Music, stars and music, they guide our lives. Yes, we are meeting. Look up there, Candy, on the wall, the face of a man. Someone is about to visit us. Do you feel the presence? Yes. Yes, I do. I seem to feel it's a relative of yours. Your father, perhaps. No. No, it's my Uncle Bart. He used to take me boating. Yes. Yes, Uncle Bart. Now I know. My word, this is better than old movies. <laughs> Fool. What? What did you say? What? Why, your friend here, he is a scoffer. I cannot go on. I am in terrible mental pain. Please, you must leave now. Immediately. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Madsen, Yukon 3... 8309. It wasn't Rembrandt who had broken the spell. It was that scream and the anguished cry from the other room that did the trick. I would have given my eye teeth to do some snooping, but the lad who showed us in did a very firm reverse and made sure we took a straight line for the front door and out. I heard the lock click behind us, and that was it. We went across the street, got in the car, and took off. The fog was so thick you couldn't see 20 feet in any direction. Why are you biting your lower lip, Dove? Are you put out with me for being a scoffer? No, no, not at you, Rembrandt, but I am put out. That babe's as phony as a three-dollar bill. Yes, you and your Uncle Bart, who used to take you boating. Huh, indeed. That scream and the voice, that's what did it. Very good, I thought. Sounded almost real. Oh, it was real, Ducky. Didn't you notice how excited the madame was? Jove, 
I thought she came out of a trance awfully fast. And what about the vision of dear old Uncle Bart? Oh, that was rearview projection, girl. Uh, shot through some very fine cheesecloth to give it a slight distortion. Uh -huh. Well, okay, I'm making another appointment with the madame for tomorrow night. I want to see what's going on behind the scenes. Oh, where are you going now, Candy? Home and to bed. I'm tired. Then let me out on Van Ness Avenue, will you? I'm dickering with a man for a used car. Oh, well, I'll take you there. What's the place? Diogenes Anderson, the swapping Swede. Rembrandt got out at the used car lot and I went home and had a good night's sleep. I wanted to have all my buttons because there were a lot of angles that needed angling. I awoke in the morning feeling quite fresh and ready for come what may. First thing to come what may was another drive out to the Valley of Wealth to check in with Mrs. Allison Gray. The door opened, but it wasn't Mrs. Gray. It was her nephew, Robert Warnicky. Oh, Miss Madsen. Come in, won't you? I'm so sorry, but it's the butler's day off. Oh, what a shame having to strain yourself on that heavy door. Thank you. Yeah. I imagine you want to see my aunt, hmm? Yes, you imagine correctly. Is she in? Uh, no. No, she left about half an hour ago. Said something about having to see about her hair. Oh, where'd she leave it? Oh, <laughs> very clever, Miss Madsen. <laughs> what about your uncle, Mr. Gray? Is he here? Oh, aren't you the one who's supposed to know where my uncle is? What do you mean by that? To repeat, you're very clever, Miss Madsen. I have an apology to make to you. Oh, Yes, yes, you're not a reporter at all. My aunt corrected my mistake. You're a private detective person. So who's denying it? <laughs> you know, you're very attractive, Miss Madison. I think I should kiss you. You what? I've never kissed a detective. Oh. <laughs> Why, you clown. Tell your aunt that'll cost her another hundred. I was so mad, I boiled over and out the door. I think I drove all the way home and low at 40 miles an hour. I dashed up the stairs in my penthouse and scrubbed my face three times. And then I got to thinking how the character looked after he'd kissed me. <laughs> Lipstick all over his mouth, and I started to laugh. <laughs> and I stopped laughing. It may have been the most nauseating kiss that man ever bestowed on maid, but... Certainly stopped me cold. I went over to the phone and called Madame Natasha's Temple of the Zodiac. Come on, answer. The stars in the firmament are all masterful. Good afternoon. Is Madame Natasha there? No. Madame is resting. Oh. Well, would it be possible to make an appointment for this evening? This evening? Have you been recommended by someone? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Miss Ruth Burdett. Burdett? Burdett? Yes. Madame Natasha doesn't seem to have a Burdett in the fire. Oh, oh, she must. Miss Burdett was there only a few weeks ago. Well, uh, very well. Madame Natasha will see you at ten o'clock. That's perfect. And your name, please? Um... Taylor. Geary Ann Taylor. Things were beginning to roll now, and I think I saw the light. And if I was proven to be right, the light wasn't very pleasant. This time I didn't go as the mousy little character. I went as myself. I got in the car and drove out to the Temple of the Zodiac. If it had been dark the night before, it was even darker now, and I couldn't help shivering a bit. I checked my purse. There it was, my little thirty-two, and I felt better. Then I walked up the steps. Rang was shown in by the same gent. He didn't bat an eye, so I knew I wasn't recognized. I went through the same briefing instructions about not talking to the madame until she spoke first and so forth, and the man left. After a moment or two, so did I. Down the hall. Then I found the staircase and rambled up in the semi-darkness. There were three rooms on the second floor, none of them disclosing a thing. Besides, the agonized voice that had cried out, No, no, please don't, seemed to have come from further off. So, on up another flight to the third floor. I opened the first door. Nothing. Then kitty corner and another door. Still nothing. But on the third door... I could see them in the darkness. Two bodies piled side by side. I went over and lit a match. 
And there they were. The bodies of Mrs. Allison Gray and that of what obviously must have been her husband, Mr. Gray. Very cold and very dead. You seem to have found something, Miss Taylor. Yeah. They look quite natural, don't they? Madame Natasha is here. She is highly displeased with you. Yeah, I'll bet. Hiya, madame. Miss Taylor seems to be the curious type. You're out of character, Mr. Warnicky. You'd look better without that wig. I said you were clever, Miss Madsen. Too clever. Quick, Walter, get Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Mister, you fool, shoot again. <laughs> Candy. Oh, for Pete's sake, Rembrandt. Are you all right? I'm okay. Bullet in the arm, that's all. Where on earth did you come from? We were in the room across the hall downstairs when we saw you pussyfooting by, so we followed. We? Yes, we. Diogenes Anderson and I. The, the swapping Swede? What were you two doing out Candy here? Candy girl, how naive you are at times. You told me you were coming back here tonight. You didn't include me in your plan, so that meant you were coming alone. Knowing your propensity for getting into trouble, I felt it incumbent upon me to enlist the aid of my friend Diogenes and come to your assistance. Well, bully for you, Rembrandt. I'm glad you did. What did you fellows do to these rats? <laughs> As we followed you up the stairs, we implemented ourselves with two sturdy chairs. <laughs> then it happened. They fired, you dashed past us. When those two beggars came abreast of us, we merely lowered the boom. Diogenes on one side, I on the other. <laughs> oh, my word, we really tagged them, I fear. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. They've been working overtime. They can use a little deep sleep. <laughs> Look, Candy, two bodies. Tell me about it. Well, it's very simple, Mallard, dear. This nephew of Mrs. Gray's at one time had been a ham, a, a female impersonator in vaudeville. So last year he decided to try to convince his uncle, Mr. Allison Gray, that his days were shortening, that he should atone for his wicked life. Now how do you go about that? By telling his uncle he should visit a fortune teller. And by a very strange coincidence, the fortune teller is a nephew, Robert Warney. That's right, the impersonator. The same telling his uncle, and I quote, that he should give all his money away to charities before he died. And the uncle went for the gag? Sure. Did you ever know a man like that who didn't want to repent before passing out? It was a cinch. But all the charities were phonies, and all the checks came right back to Robert Warnicky. Well, I don't see why Warnicky had to go so far as to bump off his uncle and aunt. Did the catch wise to this racket? Well, that's it exactly, Miller. He was in so deep that he might just as well go all the way and eliminate. I see. You see, the uncle, in the first blush of being a grade A philanthropist, never questioned the charities which Warnicky suggested. Yeah, that makes sense. About a month ago, he started wondering and snooping, and he found out there were no charities. He was like a wild man. That's what made Mrs. Gray think her husband was losing his mind. Well, if I unloaded that much money through a swindle, I'd have acted crazy, too. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Well, the uncle started following Warnicky's movements. Just as he discovered that Warnicky was also Madame Natasha, Warnicky caught wise that his uncle had caught wise. He forced him into the old house on Buchanan. Mm -hmm. Now he was frightened. He didn't know how much his aunt knew. So he went back to the Gray's place, told his aunt that he had a tip as to where his uncle was. Naturally, she went along with him. She was still up in the room with her dead husband the first night Rembrandt and I went out there. It was her voice I heard crying, No, no, please don't. She'd heard our voices downstairs and tried to make a break. Warnicky's goon boy grabbed her just in time, and after we left, they did away with her, too. Hmm. A very unpretty mess. Yeah. How did you first tip to Warnicky, Candy? When he kissed me. When he kissed... When he what? <laughs> sure he kissed me. I appealed to some men. When I got home, I remembered the way he looked with my lipstick on his mouth. All I had to do was mentally put a wig on the Joker and voila, Madame Natasha. I'll be darned. Yeah. Aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? What? And turn into a fortune teller? Why, you cad. <laughs> Come here, cupcake. Mm -hmm. What's the <laughs> matter with you? <laughs> Good night, Madame Mallard. Hmm? <laughs> well, take a look in the mirror and then get yourself a crystal ball and you're in business. <laughs> What? 
heard tonight were Helen Cleave as Mrs. Gray, Kurt Martell as the butler, and Earl Lee as Madame Natasha's assistant. Tony Barrett played the dual role of Warnicky and Madame Natasha. Tudor Owen was Rembrandt Watson, and Whitfield Connor was heard as Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is directed by Monty Masters. The characters in tonight's story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental.